meeting. Good morning, everyone. So before we start, I have a very special guest with me. This is Emily Sutton. I'm super excited because she is a champion child for Children's Miracle Network here at Renown. And we, we were able to meet um, a couple months ago, and you got on this beautiful superhero costume. But she is an advocate for children and cancer and very, very tough diseases. And so we are incredibly proud of you. And you go to Spanish Springs High School, correct? And you're 16 years old, and you're ready to take my job. Are you ready to start with emails? <laughs> One bit of advice, stay off social media, OK? <laughs> but um, so why don't you tell the folks before we begin a little bit about you and why you're here. And I told you, you can use the gavel all you want, okay? It's all yours today. And you can also speed in the city of Reno today. You can do anything you want. <laughs> Just kidding. City attorney over there wouldn't anyway. like it. No. You wouldn't do it because you're too good. I love that. Okay, go ahead. Mom and dad are here too. Mom and dad, raise your hands. Hi. Okay, tell, tell the audience a little bit about what we were doing a couple months ago. Okay. So I am Emily Sutton, and uh, what we were doing a couple of months ago was, was called My Dream Ride, and it was for a TV show, um, a premiere, um, and it was about celebrating me and going on. I was in a Batmobile, in the Batmobile, mm -hmm. with Bill Farmer, who's the voice of Goofy, and... Pluto, he's the voice of Pluto as well. And um, we were riding around town and it was a complete surprise. And afterwards, uh, we had a little party and um, I got- What did we surprise you with? Four thousand dollars, I think. No, but what was that for? That was for Disneyland. She gets to go to Disneyland. It Emily's had Disneyland. a long, tough road and you have been a complete advocate and a champion for all children's uh, that are suffering from diseases, yes. correct? Yes. Yes. So we were really happy to celebrate you, and were you excited? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Yeah. I go next week to <gasps> Disneyland, oh. and I love Disneyland. Everyone loves Disneyland. Right? Right? Happiest place on earth. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, so we're going to begin the meeting, and we're going to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to have you lead us in the pledge. We're okay. super excited that you're here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll and make sure Mayor Sutton is included. Thank you so much. Councilmember Breckis? Here. Doer? Here. Martinez? Here. Ebert, absent at this time. Taylor? Here. Reese? Here. Sutton? Here. Mayor Sheevy? Here. Madam Mayors, you do have Mayors. a quorum of the Reno City Council. All right, fantastic. So I'm going to have you. The meeting begins. The meeting begins. Oh, good. Good job. All right, we are going to go into public comment. We have a very, very special public comment. Willie, are you here? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. This is a very, very special public comment. I know Mylon was um, close and near and dear to so many people in our community. I remember when I was first elected, I was lucky enough to sit with her and have coffee and get lots of advice. And she was a champion in our community um, for everything. And she was very, very well loved. So we're grateful that you are here today. And we want to give you the floor in honor of Mylon. Madam Mayor, before my time begins, I just want to uh, introduce you to uh, Mylan's son, Ariel Roloff, who uh, is here for, for memorial me. activities and for um, today. And I want to also say thank you to you, the rest of the city council, and particularly my friend, uh, Councilwoman Ebert, and the staff for uh, putting this together. And um, we really appreciate it. So do you want to say anything, Ari? I really just want to thank you, Mayor and Council, for this day in honor of my mother and our family. Thank you. 
Your mother, your mother was wonderful. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So I'm going to begin my uh, public comment um, by reading the proclamation that you gave. Um, my name is William Poocher, and I am a Ward 5 resident of Reno. And uh, I'm going to try and get through this. Office of the Mayor, Reno City Council, Nevada Proclamation. Whereas in the 1980s, Milan led the work on the Equal Rights Amendment statewide. The initial referendum for the ERA failed, but finally passed the Nevada legislature in 2017. An updated version of this amendment that prohibits the denial or abridgment of rights passed the Nevada legislature in 2019 and was on the November 20, 2022 ballot. And whereas absent a national ERA, Milan and her team realized the dangers ahead of for reproductive freedom so they drafted and passed the question seven ballot initiative, which passed with the 63% of the vote and protects women's reproductive rights in Nevada to this day. And whereas while her late, while in her late seventies, Milan launched the women's March in Reno and later helped to found the Northern Nevada marches forward an inclusive volunteer led organization with a mission to support spotlight and uplift the voices and power of diverse people and communities to create this transformative social change. Whereas until her mid eighties, Mylan remained undaunted. She continued to mentor and educate thousands of Nevadans and advise many of Nevada's most successful and promising female leaders. And whereas the city of Reno thanks Milan for all that she contributed to the advancement of women's rights in Nevada. Now, therefore, I, Hillary L. Sheevey, mayor of the city of Reno, do hereby declare Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023, Milan Hawkins Day. Wow. And I would just like to say um, this Saturday, um, she will be honored as part of um, the Women's uh, March activities in the Believe Plaza and throughout. Um, there, um, you'll see it in social media, and I'm sure it'll be out in the news. And Mylan was like a second mother to me and um, inspired me politically. So, you know, it's because of her you have me with my big voice. <laughs> we love so. that. We love that. And, and she, she always, always said... we're in good hands with you, Willie. Get your rear end out in the street. That was edited. Yeah. I so thank that. you very, very much. I appreciate it, and happy belated St. Well, Patrick's and Day. And behalf, oh. uh, on behalf of all women of Reno, she has made us incredibly proud and paved the way for all of us women. Yeah. And now more than ever, this is the time that we need to stand up with women, and she did that for all of us. So no, her legacy lives on forever in this city. We're very, very grateful. Very grateful. Madam and Willie, I know how much you loved her. Okay. Say something too. So, okay. Go ahead. Count yeah, time real on real quick. Um, I just wanted to say um, that Mylan had a very inspirational role in my life as well. Um, politically, yes, going back to 2014, but it, it went much further than that. Back in the flood project days, um, she was very active on behalf of her community in Hidden Valley. But going back before that, um, I was lucky enough to serve on her board with the Nevada Diabetes Association for many years, and even before I served on the board for many years to support their work before I even became a board member. So, um, and then even before that, because that we're back into the 1990s, um, you know, I've known Mylan all the way back then um, for the work that she did as an activist, as you mentioned, with um, women's rights, but also environmental issues um, and so on. So thank you for sponsoring this and Megan. Thanks for bringing it to us today. Thank you so much for everything and for you uh, already being here too. Thank you. And I know she appreciated both you and uh, um, Councilwoman Ebert's friendship and she was a mentor to uh, Councilwoman Ebert. In fact, um, one of her last um, acts before she passed away was to help Councilwoman Ebert. So thank you I, very, very much. I even threw a retirement party thank at my you. house. Yes. <laughs> that was a privilege, so thank you. Bless thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you all. All right, Madam Clerk, we're going to head into public comment, and out of um, our newly elected mayor, I want to ask you, would you like to speak in public comment first? Anything you'd like to say? 
Um, thank you guys for having me, and um, I'm so honored to be here. Well, we are honored to have you. Honored to have you. All right, Madam Clerk, sending it back to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Our first item today is public comment. It should be noted for those in the audience that comments are to be addressed to the mayor and council as a whole. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the council's agenda. Please note that council may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you're called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you state your name and you will be afforded three minutes. If you're an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Lastly, while in this room, please be respectful. Warnings will be issued by the presiding officer if there's disruptive behavior, and you will be asked to leave chambers if the behavior continues. Our first public commenter today is Terry Brooks, followed by Sharon Chamberlain, followed by Kelly Duncan. Good morning, it's me, Terry Brooks again. And today I came here to face the act of discrimination when it comes to education and race. When I was a child in the Midwest, there were several elementary schools in town. For four years, I happened to attend the only integrated elementary school in town. There were several elementary schools where only the majority could attend. And there was one elementary school where only a particular minority could attend. Most of the school districts there were racially segregated. I happened to live in a district that was not segregated. So kids in a segregated district wound up attending a segregated school, while kids in an integrated district attended our integrated school. Then we wound up moving to a segregated district and I went to a segregated school. All of the kids there were of a majority race who attended that elementary school. I felt like something was missing, but then I went to junior high school it was integrated with a variety of kids, and then so was my high school. I heard that some minority kids could ride a school bus, but had to sit in a designated seat. And they could go to an integrated school, but in the school cafeteria, they were not allowed to eat. Some minority parents worry about their kids going to schools. Their minority kids may have to follow different kinds of rules. And if the majority kids at the school act as if they are superior, then the minority kids at that school may feel like they're treated as inferior. Some people of the majority say people of the majority do better on IQ tests, but they do not mention that it's the majority who made the IQ tests. If there was a report card on public education, it would be a report card on our entire nation. When kids go to school, the best way for them to learn is to get to know each other, and then they'll learn how to learn. I would like to thank you all for listening to me today, and I look forward to coming back when I've learned what else I should say. Oh, and this is chapter three, and just so you know, I've only got 43 more chapters to go. <laughs> We've been publishing his, a lot of his poems, so we're excited to put them into a book so that we can like that. distribute them. Good job. Sharon Chamberlain, followed by Kelly Duncan, followed by Doug Brewer. Good morning, Madam Mayors and <laughs> City Council members. Um, I am Sharon Chamberlain, the CEO for Northern Nevada Hopes. I am here today to provide clarity related to Hope Springs, Northern Nevada Hope's bridge housing community. But more importantly, I am here as a voice for the 253 Hope's and Hope Springs staff who are dedicating their lives and service to this community. During the March 8th City Council meeting, our board of directors and I became aware of the continued misunderstanding of operations at Hope Springs, specifically related to capacity that our program wasn't full. This is incorrect. Hope Springs is the region's only bridge housing program and the only one to our knowledge in the country run by a federally qualified health center. Hope's envisioned and took this project on when no other partner was equipped to do so, raising over two and a half million dollars during the COVID-19 pandemic to open on time in March of 2021. 
Over the last two years, we have fully funded the operations of Hope Springs and have continually evaluated our programming. In fact, in August of 2022, we sent the City Council a full report on the status of the program, describing our relentless efforts to retool the program to include intensive behavioral health programming, which we have successfully done. In that same report, we estimated that our program would be at full capacity by the end of August 2022, which it was and has been since. We are incredibly proud of our dedicated staff and many graduates who have gone through our program or are currently residents at Hope Springs. As previously offered to all city council members, we invite you to tour Hope Springs and learn about our progress and achievements. We thank council member Ebert for attending a tour this past week and for her recommendation for a portion of the council's discretionary funds to be given to Hope's. We are committed to partnering the council, with the council to ensure you have accurate information on which to base your decisions including decisions about supporting our new East 4th Street Clinic. As you know, the East 4th Street Clinic will be similar to our 5th Street Clinic in that it will focus on providing desperately needed medical care, behavioral health care, and substance use treatment, among other services, to over 12,000 Northern Nevadans. Due to the efforts of our dedicated staff who day in and day out care for the most marginalized members of our community, HOPES is the only FQHC in Washoe County that has been recognized with five community health quality recognition badges by HRSA. We are also the only FQHC in Washoe County with a Guide Star Gold Seal level of transparency. HOPES is not only a fiscally sound organization, but we are a community of, we are one of the community's most trusted partners. Hopes was born to meet the needs of those with HIV and AIDS in 1997, and our evolution has been nothing short of amazing in the 25 years since. With the support of the city, we will continue to meet patients from pediatrics to seniors where they are and keep working to build a healthier community. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you so much, and I, I also want to thank Councilwoman Taylor. Um, she's come to us a lot with advocating for what you guys are putting together, and we want to be a partner in that. So. We're going to come and tour with you and make sure that that happens because you do a lot of great work for mental health. I love what you do. Thank you. And we worked together years ago on housing vouchers and things like that. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry for the misunderstanding or confusion. Kelly Duncan, followed by Doug Brewer, followed by Cliff Scheffel. Good morning, Madam Mayors and Council Members. My name is Kelly Duncan, and I'm the Chief Operations Officer at Northern Nevada Hopes. Our department oversees Hope Springs, Hope Springs program. Today, I want to provide an overview of the current program, the history, and the intentional progression and milestones we've achieved in the last two years. In fact, it was exactly two years ago yesterday that we opened our doors to our first residents. Since August 2022, Hope Springs has been at capacity. Our operational standards include 28 residents maximum as capacity as we use two of the tiny homes for transitional housing as needed for bed bugs, other health concerns, etc. Our occupancy did not start at this rate and we never intended it to. As the only project like this in the country and a pilot for our community and others, we are deliberate from the beginning with our intention to make this project sustainable and to best care for the residents we serve which meant admitting residents to the program at responsible levels so that we could learn and adapt to improve efficiencies and programming and at the appropriate time achieve capacity. While we strive to serve as many individuals as possible, this program and its success relies on addressing the root causes of homelessness, like substance use disorder, mental health, and other trauma. We know treatment at the individual level will improve health at the community level. In 2022, we had 15 graduates, 55% of our residents were employed. They received 244 intensive outpatient program visits and 1,663 psychiatric visits. This year, 2023, we've had an additional four graduates. Today, our operations are guided by four pillars of a strategic plan of Hope Springs, which include access and capacity, maintaining a target capacity by streamlining operational processes, program completion success, emphasis on exit planning upon program acceptance, providing education and resources such as workforce development, life skills, and healthy money habits. Long-term outcomes, we're developing a post-program completion plan that targets three, six, nine, and 12-month follow-ups with former residents, keeping them connected with our case management services through HOPES. And finally, financial sustainability, to increase our billable services through behavioral health groups and therapy, 
peer support billing, as well as enhance our donations and grant support. Additionally, I'm happy to share today that we've just hired a director for Hope Springs, a position that wasn't included in the initial structure or, bu or budget, but that our agen agency will be fully funding to continue trajectory of success. This person is scheduled to start in early April. In closing, Hope Springs not only offers our residents a safe place to live and heal, but also a place to thrive, to find purpose, join the Hope's community, and serve others. Lisa, a current resident, recently said about Hope Springs, this place has shown me that I'm worth saving and being taken care of, and it's my job to do that. And in doing that in time, I will be able to help others. I believe that is what life is about. We're all supposed to help each other, and that's what this program is about. Thank you. Doug Brewer, followed by Cliff Scheffel, followed by Teresa Navarro. Madam Mayors uh, and Council Members, my name is Doug Brewer, and I'm a proud member of the Nevada Hopes Board of Directors and its current board president. I'm here today to urge this, the Reno City Council to fully fund Hopes' $2.5 million request for a new 4th Street, East 4th Street Clinic. This clinic will provide medical, mental health, substance abuse treatment, and more services to over 12,000 Northern Nevadans. We're grateful for the financial report, financial support that we've already received from the city of Sparks, Washoe County, and Congressman Amade for our East 4th Street Clinic. We're also grateful for the Governor Lombardo's willingness to meet with us to learn more about our new clinic and consider financial support. We're also encouraged by the city of Reno giving us the opportunity to provide you with additional information about our project and that will provide significant benefits to Reno residents. Annually, HOPES currently operates a large clinic where we provide integrated health care to more than 12,000 patients. Over 60% of our patients live at or below the 200% of the federal poverty level. For many of our clients, assessing affordable health care is difficult. However, accessing services that improve their quality of life is nearly an insurmountable task. Approximately 25% of HOPE's clients experience homelessness, and over 40% are on Medicaid, and over 30% are uninsured. 57% of our patients are 65 and older. By reaching this population and helping them address health care issues early, HOPES is removing barriers to care, reducing patient visits to emergency rooms, and lowering their medical cost and reducing their, the financial burden on area hospitals that comes from serving Reno's uninsured population. Taxpayer dollars are also saved by providing integrated case management and behavioral health services, reducing homelessness, incarceration rates, and reliance on public benefits. In our more than two decade history, Hopes has been a trusted partner in our community. Our innovative, innovative approach to healthcare has allowed us to break down barriers and deliver life-saving, life-changing services to those who need us. This has, oops. 10 seconds, you can finish it. Okay, I know you thank can you. Do it. <laughs> thank you. This has uniquely positioned hopes to undertake project of this magnitude and open a new state-of-the-art healthcare, healthcare clinic that will address growing individual and family needs in Northern Nevada. We need your help with this challenge. Thank you. You, you did it. Good job, Doug. Thank you so much.
Cliff Shuffle, followed by Teresa Navarro, followed by Stanley Allen. Good morning. My name is Cliff Shuffle, and I'd like to start by really thanking all of you, Mayor, and all the council members for the tremendous work that you put in. I mean, I can only imagine the hours, not to mention the speeches that you have to go through. So thank you. Uh, I'm relatively new to the Reno community. My wife and I moved here eight years ago. Uh, we sought to get involved in this as our new community, and we both gotten involved in various community partnerships. Part of my involvement is a now board member at Hopes, where I have been for the past uh, year and a half. Um, both my wife and I have worked, ran a consulting firm, uh, primarily financially oriented, specifically executive search, uh, in our prior careers, and I'm here to tell you, and we've worked with hundreds of organizations, both for-profit and not-for-profit, and my message here today is that I have observed closely over the past year and a half the HOPES organization and the management and find it to be one of the best I've ever seen. I want to show you what a board report looks like, and I'm happy with Sharon's approval to give one to any board, any of you. This is the most detailed report for a board report done monthly I've ever seen. This is an incredibly well-run organization that is capable of expanding, which is what we're intending to do. We have already started a clinic earlier this year uh, that's totally focused on behavioral health where we are already hiring and training the people that will eventually move into the 4th Street facility, which is where we need your support. So I think that's really all I have to say other than that, um, you know, we really hope that you will support this project. But if there's any concern about this organization's ability to expand or their current operations, I'm here to tell you it's, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you're not new anymore. Eight years, that's a long time. Reno White. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Teresa Navarro, followed by Stanley Allen. Greetings to both mayors. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> and city council members, thank you for letting me come before the board. Um, I've done this several times. I know several of you on the board. Um, nice to see you. <laughs> I know. Way. Nice to see you. So nice to see you. It's been a long time. Long time. Major champion in the community right here. <laughs> Teresa. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. 48 years as a community activist in this community, so I have seen a lot of changes <laughs> yes, and things are going on. Uh, in the last six years, I have been on the board for HOPES, and I've been very involved with HOPES because of what it has been doing, especially in the mental health area, especially in communities, uh, diverse communities, which is very important. Um, I want you to know that right now at HOPES, 51% of the patients are Latino, which is very important because we have a very large Latino community. We're 37% in the Washoe County School District. Um, and as when I first moved here, probably being one of the few families, Latinos in the early 70s, it's been a great accomplishment to do this and have it change. But the thing about hopes, what I really want to talk about with hopes is that what it has given, especially in our community, I'm an activist, so I'm out there all the time. I'm talking to people all the time. A lot of them, a lot of their issues are mental health. I have um, parents, families that call me from schools, come and talk to their children. Turns out the children need some mental health services, and they're lacking that. And I know that HOPES has been doing so much. Our new clinic will have almost half a wing on mental, clinic, on mental health, and it's very, very important. The other thing I want to talk about is our most of our... The clinic, the clinic that we have on Fifth Street has done so much. It has progressed so fast. I came onto the board board just as they were building it. So I was really excited to be in the first phase of that. And now working on the second phase here with our clinic on 4th Street. It is so important. The dollars that the city of Reno can give to us would make so many people in our community 
know that we're out there to help them and be supportive for all of our people in the community, especially the youth and parents. I try to work a lot with them. I work part-time for the International Center with, Cuban with the refugees, so we're working a lot with refugees that need a lot of those services too. And I know HOPES has been one of the great uh, um, providers for the refugees that we have coming into, the con coming into this country to work with us. We've been working a lot, especially with Ukrainian families that have come in that we're gonna be able to uh, work with. But HOPES to me is my heart, and I think that it's so important that this council really look at the funding that would help so much for all of our community and everything. I want you to know, I, 1997, when HOPES first started, I was a volunteer, and that was the only organization that was helping HIV and AIDS patients at that time. And of course, it was a time when it was an, it was an issue that you know, people didn't know that you get it from kissing somebody or whatever. It wasn't that. And it was just that very important that we really look at it. Hope's been here and it's done great jobs and I'm very proud to be part of the board. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Stanley Allen, followed by Ricky Nahorniak, followed by Philip Moore via Zoom and Rodney Smith via Zoom. Hello. So uh, I'm a current resident uh, resident of uh, Hope Springs. And um, I'm just here to tell you the opportunities that were given to me there. Uh, wow, I'm gonna get emotional. Anyways, uh, suffered from, you know, drug addiction, homeless in my vehicle, uh, didn't have a license, no insurance, which I do now, I'm legal. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I bounced in and out of different residential programs and always ended up in an inevitable relapse. Uh, what I've been a, the opportunity that was afforded to me was like um, therapy mixed with, you know, uh, like I have two great therapists that I'm able to have on call. You know, one of them moved to a different facility, but with, still with hopes, but being able to get substance abuse, uh, 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 man, I am drawing a blank, uh, counseling mixed with therapy, which got to the root of my drug problem and made me aware of the, the, uh, the issues that I had, the root. Um, now I'm able to, to build a foundation that is solid. So, you know, and I have plans on moving into my own apartment independently for the first time out of there. I've been there for like three and a half months now. And um, my life is better than it's ever been in my entire life. I'm 38 years old. And, um, you know, this is the brightest my future's ever looked. And it's all because of the opportunity that I got from Hope Springs. And, um, you know, yeah, it's great. All the staff, everything. Yeah, it's great. I'm super <laughs> nervous right now. But thank you. Thanks. I love that. And you came to speak. Is this your first time at City Council? Absolutely. Now you're an advocate. Yeah. Love awesome. it. See, Sweet. your life has never been better. <laughs> That's right. We haven't scared you off. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very, very powerful. Thank That's you. That's what it's all about. That's right. Those are the stories that are, are going to make a difference. The best one's coming up right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, that's a little bit of pressure. <laughs> Ricky Nahorniak, followed by Philip Moore via Zoom and Rodney Smith via Zoom. Hello, uh, my name is Ricky Nahorniak, and like Stan, I'm a resident of Hope Springs. Um, first, I'd like to thank the city council and the mayor for affording me the opportunity to speak here today and for creating this forum for its citizens to participate in. Um, this is my first time addressing this group, so it's a real privilege. Um, on the drive down here, um, I pass Smith Ridge Drive. Um, it's a street I know very well. Um, I'm familiar with the street because approximately six months ago, my car served as my home and Smith, was, Smith Ridge Drive as my address unofficially. But because of Hope Springs, I no longer live <clears throat> in hopelessness. Hope Springs offers just that hope, a hope to begin anew. How does it offer this hope? First and most importantly, Hope Springs offers each and every resident a reprieve. A reprieve from chronic exhaustion, the constant worrying 
over having the means to acquire permanent housing and the nightly dilemma of where am I going to sleep tonight, if only for a few hours. Hope Spring utilizes a multi-pronged approach built for individual success while participating within a community of one's peers. There is individual therapy, classes in a group setting, and peer support each in, to keep it each individual on the correct path. Hope Springs allows residents to live rent-free and save money that will lead to permanent housing. Few other programs in our area, if any, offer individuals such an opportunity. In short, what Hope Springs offers is safe, clean, and, and an encouraging atmosphere to help each and every participant the opportunity to write the next chapter of their life. We need more of what Hope Spring offers in our community, not less. An individual can have all the will in the world to change, but without the necessary means, such change is difficult to accomplish. Uh, thank you for your time today. Fantastic. Thanks. Future Senator. I'm sorry? Future Senator. Oh, OK. Can you vote for me? <laughs> yeah, of course. All right. All right. Thank you. Philip Moore via Zoom, Rodney Smith, and Dora Martinez. Good morning. I assume you can hear me. Good morning. Please state your name for the record and we'll begin the timer. My name is Philip Moore and I'm here as a private citizen of, and a proud citizen of Ward 2. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. I'm coming down with something and I didn't want to share that with you all. So I'll do it on Zoom today. I want to start as always by thanking the city council and the mayor for all the work you do for our community. I really appreciate it. I am back to um, remind you all that we're still off track with our greenhouse gas emission goals. And I'm looking forward to a response as to how we're going to get back on track. If we needed any sense of urgency on the importance of that work, look no further than this week's synthesis report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which documents that the world is off track with our goal to keep warming down below 1.5 degrees increase over pre-industrial levels. And what does that mean in real terms? That means we're setting ourselves up for climate disasters that will become so extreme that people cannot adapt. And heat waves and famines and infectious disease will claim millions of lives. The report does not ask us to give up. The report asks us to have a sense of urgency and agency around this issue. I would also note that the state of Nevada is off track with their greenhouse gas emission goals. In their 2022 report, the Nevada Department of Environmental Protection discusses how, while we've done great job in increasing the amount of renewable energy, those reductions in emissions have been overwhelmed by increasing emissions from transportation and um, residential energy usage. We must <clears throat> make the right land choices to minimize our transportation emissions. I'm going to refer briefly to the 2019 Truckee Meadows Regional Plan. I'm sure many of you are much more familiar with that plan than I am, but in it we chose the infill scenario. And that infill scenario emphasizes growth in already developed areas, maximizes use of small lots, and promotes mixed-use development. I celebrate the work that's been done to bring forward the Reno Experience District, the Reno Public Market, and the MOD as others that are bringing new housing and businesses into the midtown and downtown areas. It's really exciting. However, the reality is that between 2015 and 2021, 60% of new units built in Reno were built in the tier three areas, tier two areas, excuse me, which were supposed to be the third priority after mixed use core and tier one areas. I wanna highlight a particular amendment that's coming up for your attention. It is called the Canyons PUD Amendment. And if there's anything we should not do is amend, is annex this property into the city of Reno. There is no public transportation access, there are no available services, and it's not a walkable community. It fails to meet many of the goals that we've outlined in the infill scenario for the Truckee Meadows Regional Plan. I ask that when it comes up that you deny that annexation. And I look forward to the future when we can reverse those trends so the majority of houses are being built in the mixed use core area and the tier one areas. And before I finish, I wanna say that Northern Nevada Hopes has been a really important resource for my family. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Good, good message. Our next commenter is Rodney Smith, followed by Dora Martinez. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Rodney Smith, Jr. I just first want to say thank you again for donating to our organization, Raising Men and Raising Women's Long Care Service. For those who don't know, I'm the founder of Raising Men and Women's Long Care Service. We're a nonprofit organization and we mow free loan for the elderly, disabled, single parents, and veterans. We also have kids ages 7 to 17 across this country that go out in their community and, and mow free loans, as, as well as rake leaves, snow shovel, and even pick up trash. Our organization is set up like the karate system. So once a kid signs up, they make a sign saying, I accept the 50 yard challenge. In return, we send them a white Raising Men or Raising Women's uh, t shirt along with safety glasses and air protection. Every 10 lawns they move, they got a different color t-shirt. Orange earns a, 10 lawns earns an orange shirt, 20 earns a green, 30 a blue, 40 a red, and 50 lawns earns a black. And then once kids mow 50 free lawns or snow shovel or rake 50 yards, I personally deliver them a brand new mower, weed eater, and blower for completing this 50 yard challenge. Recently, it was three young ladies in Reno that completed this 50 yard challenge. And I came all the way from Huntsville, Alabama, to, to the beautiful, beautiful city of Reno and presented these young ladies their brand new mowers, weed eaters, and blowers for completing this 50 yard challenge. My goal is to have even more kids this summer in Reno taking part and making a difference in their community because it's so many people that need this help. Um, I found that so many people who are fixed incomes and uh, even the elderly and the, and the veterans, they, they struggle sometimes to pay for loan care. So when we can come mow free loan for them, that now frees them up and they can use their funds for things they really need like food and medication. So if anyone is watching this and has a young person at home, please consider signing them up for the 50 yard challenge and help us make a difference one loan at a time. Thank you. Rodney, can you tell the audience where they can go and do that, where they can sign up? Yes, ma'am. So we have a, a website at weareraisingmen.com or weareraisingmenandwomen.com and they can scroll down on our website to the 50 yard challenge tab and they can read up more information and sign their kids up that way. That is so impressive. Did you hear? So these kids go out there and they mow and they also snow plow because I think we yeah. had a lot of kids very busy over the last couple months here um, doing it for free for people that can't afford it or disabled or especially our senior population and the disabled. It is phenomenal what you've done. I can't wait to invite you to the United States Conference of Mayors and, yes, um, and sponsor you. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. Thank you thank so you. much, Rodney. I want to thank um, Councilman Ebert for doing this. Yep. Thank, thank you. you so much again. I mean, we greatly appreciate it. It's going to help us get more mowers and T-shirts for the kids that take part in our organization. It means so much. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Keep doing good work. Yes, ma'am. And our final public commenter is Dora Martinez. Okay. Good morning. Could you all hear me? Hi, Dora. Good morning. We can hear you. This is Councilmember Reese. Oh, hi. Good morning. Um, so this is Dora Martinez. I represent the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition. I really wanted to be there in person, but I'm in Carson um, testifying. Mayor Shibi and the City Council, you guys are fabulous. I love our city, uh, biggest little city in the world, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility for all. And, uh, you know, there's still some room for improvement, but kudos and thank you so much. I just want to let you know um, that uh, there's a, a sidewalk by Doughboys here on Mc man and McCarran, it's completely off. Uh, so we were walking with my friend who is a wheelchair user and we had to kind of jump off the curb to get on the street and then curb it back on because it's completely off. Um, I, I, the only thing I can tell you, it's on the exit of Doughboys. Um, also, um, I, I was wondering if maybe uh, my friend who is visually impaired Tagalog, uh, 
um, naturalized citizen. She is from Philippines. Her husband recently lost her job and they are, um, if they don't get some assistance for rent, they could lose their home and we are all here for prevention, preventing that um, um, situation. So I was wondering maybe I can connect her with somebody to help her uh, get the rental assistant. And I appreciate all that you do. And thank you, Devin Reese, for everything that you do too at the um, RTC. I appreciate that every time I kind of CC you and the mayor, uh, my voice gets heard and, and things get gets done. I, I, I wish sometimes I didn't have to do that because I know you all are busy, but somehow when I CC you all on the email, it gets done. So I appreciate your, your um, influence and I thank you so much and thank you madam clerk you are the best Ms. Martinez will you have your friend reach out to my liaison or to me directly and we'll have okay. them get in touch with uh, your uh, friends about our rental assistance programs through the city thank you have a good one take bye care bye. and be well you too madam clerk Vice Mayor Reese, we have no additional public comment. I would like to note for the record that we did receive nine comments which were general in nature or not directly associated with an agenda item prior to 4 p.m. yesterday, March 21st. These comments were written correspondence received via our reno.gov online public comment form or by email to our office. Copies of these have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are, a part, or, and are available on the reno.gov meeting portal. Three letters in favor, two in opposition, and four letters of concern. Additionally, we did receive one voicemail. However, due to vulgarity, um, that transcript has been distributed, but we will not be playing it today. And we are done with our opening public comment. All right. Madam Clerk, before we move on, I'm going to send it to our assistant city manager, J.W. Hodge, is to the right of me. It looks a little different than Manager Thorne Lee. So we're happy to have you. This is your second time, <clears throat> I think, on the dais. I don't count anymore. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I think you've got a couple of notes. Just one note this morning. We're going to remove item D1. Uh, that issue has been resolved and is no longer needed. Okay, thank you. So please scratch that from your agenda. D1? D. D is in David? Okay. That was resolved. Uh, I have not received a report of how that was be Sorry, Council Member. Yeah, thank you. Mr. City Attorney, will you be providing? Because it was on the agenda twice and canceled. And, you know, for the body to we do our preparation, to, are you going to be letting us know how it was resolved? We were able to reach an agreement and acquire the property needed for the easement, the sewer easement. Okay. It goes okay. across that property. I wasn't asking now, just I, I don't want to lose strand that we've all given preparation for to just go into the ether. Thank you. All right, I am going to start with consent items. Oh, Madam Mayor, I need an approval oh, on sorry. item A4. All right, may I get a motion? I have second. a motion, I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Unanimously. Okay. So, Madam Clerk, I'm actually going to go into consent agenda, and then once uh, we pull those items off, I want to put them on pause. I have someone in the audience for item D3 that I need to get back to work and on a plane. So we're going to move that up. But first, I want to take uh, the items of consent, because if there are some others that aren't pulled, then they can get back to regular business. OK, and just to note for you, we do have um, one member in the audience who would like to make comment, public comment on the consent agenda as well. Perfect. OK, sending it back to you. Sorry, you tricked me. <laughs> All right. Um, our public commenter today for consent is Donald Griffin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I'd like to say Donald Griffin, co-founder, director of Black Wall Street. We'd like to say thank you for the funds that you helped us with. Uh, with those funds, we have five locations of Narcon boxes that we uh, put place at the Diamonds Casino, Life Changes, and we just donated one to Ridge House. With that, we distribute over a thousand nasal sprays to prevent overdosing. We also take those classes into the uh, junior highs, elementaries, and middle schools to show them how to uh, assert that to prevent the overdose. 
We also uh, started a mentorship program where we're taking, uh, uh, what is it, innovational high school students uh, to the middle schools. We also have UNR students that come in there and do their internship that we take into the high schools. Right now, we have one of the intern students running Black Wall Street while we're here saying thank you. Thank you. Um, and just another initiative that we're super proud of, like you said, is our outreach team. Um, we distribute 5,000 after school lunches at three sites throughout the community. Uh, I encourage the kids to take full advantage of the educational opportunity. It's hard to do homework when you're hungry. Uh, once again, we want to thank Councilman Martinez for meeting with us and strategizing how we can give back and support some youth initiatives. Um, and we just thank you for the community support. All right, thank, thank you. So much. All right, Madam Mayor, and for the record, we did receive five letters of support um, on various consent agenda items. Again, those have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are a part of the permanent record, and we have no additional public comment. Okay, thank you so much. At this time, I'm going to start to the left of me, Councilwoman Ebert. Anything off consent? No. Councilwoman Dewar. Yeah, uh, thank you. B2 and B4. Vice Mayor. Councilwoman Taylor. Nothing, Madam Mayor. Councilman Martinez. Nothing for me. Councilwoman no. Breckus. B6, please. All right. May I get a motion to approve all other consent agenda items, please? So moved. I have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, before we hear items B2, B4, and B6, I am going to jump to item D3. Madam Clerk, if you have any public comment on item D3, uh, we should do so at this time. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And just to clarify, D is in David 3. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have um, correspondence, but I don't show that we have anybody registered to speak at this time. So I'll just state for the record that we received 17 letters of support. For this item, those have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are a part of the permanent record. And we do have two voicemails that we will transition to now. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, my name is Jenny Grana and I'm calling in to support the DRP and the Reno Ambassador team. I am a commercial property manager of three downtown office buildings and occupy an office within the BID since July of 2021. I want to share that all of my experiences with the Reno ambassadors have been positive and helpful. Every time we've called out the ambassadors, they show up promptly. They are extremely respectful, kind, and patient to all that they encounter. They always stay on site and they ensure that every mess is cleaned up and they provide information on all the services that are available to them. It's a great service and it's helped us out tremendously. Thank you. This message is being left on Monday, March 20th at 1348. Mayor, council members, and city manager, my name is Jim Galloway, and I have lived downtown in the Palladio for 16 years. I cannot picture living here without the Business Improvement District. The Downtown Reno Partnership has been successful in providing us with increased security and safety, but their job is not done. Please support their continuing efforts. Thank you. All right, Madam Mayor, no additional public or no additional voicemails, but we do have one public commenter in the audience, um, Partols. Good morning. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you? Good. How are you? Madam Mayor, good to see you and council friends. Nice to see all of you. I'm here this morning as the past chair for the Downtown Reno Partnership. I'm just really proud of what we've created and the uh, I'll, I'll speak as the past chair and I'll speak as a property owner and a developer but as the past chair I feel like we were the first domino along with hopes to really kind of push this ecosystem of safety for uh, the unhoused we have uh, hopes and we had the DRP then we had um, Sage Street 
We had Hope's Tiny Homes. Um, we had the Cares Campus. We have our place. I mean, it's just, I think like no other city on the West, I think we have something that's budding that's really, really special. And I'm proud to be a citizen this morning, just hearing every everybody speak. So, and uh, I'm finding the DRP to be a really big part of that. You'll hear all the statistics later from Tony, our vice chair, but uh, you know, 50% calls, misdemeanor uh, calls to the police. We have a van now where we can take people to the CARES camp and the campus. We have this kind of, uh, I think, appropriate push to get people off out of uh, unsafe areas and, and going towards help. And it's working. I drove a, a client downtown to a lot of streets I hadn't been on a long time, and he was from the Bay Area. This is just a couple of months ago, and he said, what are you guys doing? He goes, I was here two years ago, and it looks drastically different than it has. And I think it's uh, everybody working together, but the DRP has been a really big part of that. And I can say from my standpoint, we're building, I think, one of the first buildings built in a long time on uh, University and uh, in Maple Street, or South Virginia Maple Street. Um, it's almost fully leased with three restaurants. We have one more space. And I think a lot of that is because the DRP has helped create a canvas where folks like me and tenants feel like they can safely occupy and be part of this kind of northern bookend that's starting to redevelop and move downtown. So I encourage you to support uh, what you'll hear later on today. And I'm uh, proud that you guys have supported it to date. So thank you for listening to me. Thanks for being here. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for all your hard work. All right. I believe at this time, are we going into presentation? Um, we are, and I believe we have a disclosure on this item. So if you'd like to start there, we can do that and Sounds then move into presentations. Sounds good. I'm going to send it to Councilwoman Taylor. Go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor, um, fellow city council members, and Madam Clerk, in the interest of full transparency, transparency on item D3, I am disclosing that I serve on the board of directors of the DRP Improvement District, a nonprofit organization designated by city council to implement a clean and safe program of safety ambassadors and maintenance workers throughout downtown Reno. Item D3 approves the DRP operating plan and budget for FY 2024. On this matter, I have sought guidance from the city attorney's office. Here, city council appointed me to the DRP board of directors. As a director, I have a per se commitment in a private capacity to the interests of the DRP pursuant to NRS 281A.0656. The DRP provides clean and safe services that would otherwise fall to the city to provide. Because the DRP's interest goals and operations closely align with the city's interest goals and operations, my commitment in a private capacity to the interests of the DRP would not clearly and materially affect the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position to warrant abstention under NRS 281A.423. Madam Clerk, please accept this disclosure and lodge it on the record for this meeting and subsequent meetings pertaining to this agenda item. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just to note for the body, the recording is having a really difficult time picking up voices today. So if you could make sure that you are speaking into the microphone as closely as you can. In the room, we can hear you great, but on the recording, they're having um, a different experience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, at this time, so we're going to have a presentation. Do we have any staff presentation at all on this? We do. Okay. All right, Mr. Eidelstein, nice to see you. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Mayor. Good morning, Madam Mayor, members of Council. Um, today here to Eric Edelstein, Assistant City Manager for the record, here to introduce uh, item D3, the presentation of the Downtown Reno Partnership Operating Plan and Budget. Uh, for background, um, the Downtown Reno Partnership, also known as the Business Improvement District, is completing its fifth year of operations. Their main objective is helping Downtown Reno be a better place for business, vendor, visitors, and residents. Uh, significant reductions in nuisance calls to Reno Police Department, encampments are quickly addressed, and trash is picked up all day, every day as core functions of this organization. Um, the DRP uh, leadership in their presentation will walk you through the history, impacts, and future of this organization. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite up uh, Board Vice Chair Tony Marini um, to present this item. All right. Welcome, Mr. Marini. Good morning, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name is Tony Marini, and I'm the Vice President of Casino Operations and Community Relations at The Row and Vice Chair of the Downtown Reno Partnership. 
On behalf of our 17 member board of directors who represent a diverse group of small, medium, and large businesses, government and residential property owners, we would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere appreciation and incredible job being done by the ambassadors and all the employees at the Downtown Reno Partnership. Their tireless efforts and dedication have greatly contributed to the safety and cleanliness of Downtown Reno and being committed to the revitalization and growth. Their work in promoting Downtown Reno as a vibrant, welcoming destination for locals and visitors alike have not gone un unnoticed. The partnership is instrumental in the creation of numerous legacy events to attract locals to a cleaner, safer, and more vibrant downtown based on suggestions through feedback from our community. Additionally, the partnership has worked diligently to improve physical appearances of downtown Reno, which has resulted in cleaner and more attractive downtown. And since the partnership was formed, there has been a significant decrease in nuisance-related calls to our emergency services. We are proud to support the Downtown Reno Partnership and their efforts to make our city a better place to live, work, and visit. Their impact on the community is immeasurable, and we look forward to seeing the continued growth and success of Downtown Reno under this leadership. To better service our community, we encourage anyone who sees something in downtown Reno area and needs attention to please call our hotline at 775-313-4080 by reporting any issues, concerns, or offering suggestions. You can help the team identify and address problems in a timely and effective manner. Now I'd like to turn it over to Brian Bosna, our marketing manager for the DRP. Good morning, Brian. Thank you so much, Mayor Sheeby and Council. Um, so this is a quick cookie cutter version of more of like an hour and a half presentation that we gave to downtown residents last week. Um, the Downtown Reno Partnership um, was formed at the request of property owners and with the direction of the Progressive Urban Management Associates in 2018. Our business improvement district is one of 1,500 across the nation and is a private sector led managed neighborhood improvement district under NRS 271. The DRP is a 501c6 funded by property assessments which pay for operations street maintenance, extra downtown police officers, and ambassadors. Um, before the bid was created, there was major cleanliness issues in downtown Reno. Police were inundated with nuisance-related calls, developers were hesitant to come to downtown, and homeless individuals were not strongly tended to for help or given referrals for services. After the bid was created, there became an on-call service for nuisance-related issues in downtown Reno. This meant trash was being picked up in real time, Graffiti was documented and quickly removed. Human and hazardous toxic waste was removed from our sidewalks and storefronts, and our outreach team began working with individuals looking for resources and help. All of this has led to a 50% reduction in nuisance-related calls to services. Unsheltered homeless has been reduced by 42%, and property values have risen. Rain, snow, wind, smoke, or 100-degree days, the ambassadors are out there making a difference in downtown Reno. Here is the 110 block boundary that encompassed the business improvement district and a breakdown of services per standard premium and premium plus services. One of the impactful collaborative initiatives we've been involved with is our morning walks with the city of Reno, Reno Police, Fire, and Remsa Health. These morning walks at 8 a.m. have allowed these different agencies an opportunity to have a block by block approach and pick up trash, assist individuals looking for services, and evaluate infrastructure that needs repair. What was taking weeks and months to be addressed is being addressed in real time. Our Clean and Safe Ambassador Program encompasses 25 ambassadors, a power washing truck, two social outreach coordinators, a social outreach van, Segways, and MARV, our mobile ambassador rapid response vehicle equipped with lights and sirens, sharps container, defibrillators, trash receptacle, and Narcan. Here are our statistics from the last year. These statistics and our monthly statistics can be found on our website. A couple of statistics we want to point out is the over 28 calls to our hotline number, the over 14,000 pounds of trash removed, the 3,900 referrals to services, and the 1,200 safety walks, and over 650 van rides for DMV, social security, shelter, and medical appointments. Our outreach team was also able to assist 98 individuals find long-term housing and treatment. Um, here are some exciting next steps that our ambassadors have planned. One of the most overwhelming asks for the Downtown Reno Partnership is an overnight ambassador service. During the summer, our ambassadors patrol from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Having an overnight ambassador service will help deter crime and literally shine a light in the dark corners of downtown. We'll be, uh, begin deploying Scrubs, our street sweeper, sweeper on loan from the city of Reno. Scrubs will not only clean and sweep the streets, but will disinfect. Adding Scrubs to our list of equipment is an exciting new way to keep our city's clean. 
Continuing training is very important for our ambassadors. Not only does the ambassador training take about six weeks, but our ambassadors have had additional CPR, Narcan, de-escalation, and diversion training. We have had Reno police collaborate with the ambassadors to increase effectiveness, and we have recently completed training with Karma Box. These trainings have helped increase our collaboration with these agencies and have given our ambassadors more resources to be more effective. Um, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Nathan Naganji, who will be talking about our economic marketing and development. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good morning, honorable Madam Mayors and Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Nathan Naganji. I'm the Economic Development Manager at the Downtown Reno Partnership. So I'm here to give you just a brief, um, very condensed overview of economic development in downtown. Um, so we're following all the construction projects in downtown. Here's just a brief sample. Uh, top left, we have uh, RMP 11 over on Park Street, which is 12 units um, to be completed later this year. Top right is Eden Tower, uh, 36 units, and the, that's open um, and leasing. The ribbon cutting is tomorrow at 2 p.m. We're going to that. The um, ballpark apartments on the lower left, that's uh, 369 units. And then they also have a parking garage attached to that for 496 spaces. And then the bottom right is Mod 2 over on uh, 2nd Street, which is 69 units uh, to be completed later this year. Um, here is our downtown development map that gives the, the full picture of the over 40 developments that we are tracking, which includes over 1,300 residential units currently under construction, um, and then 650 plus units proposed in the pipeline. And uh, you can see this on our website in the economic development section. And this is interactive, so you can um, click on these and get more information about those uh, too. Um, here's a, another development. This is University Crossing, the one that um, Par was actually just talking about. So that's where Jimmy John's is going. And it's really going to bring student foot traffic across the freeway uh, into downtown. Um, here is the UNR Gateway Parking Complex that we were there for the ribbon cutting on that, and that is um, 814 parking spaces. It's a really impressive structure right there. Um, and then, of course, Reno City Center, the nation's largest adaptive reuse project. They're converting over 1,000 hotel rooms into 530 apartments, and then there's going to be also um, ground floor restaurants and retail and office space as well. We toured this a couple weeks ago, and the ground floor uh, gray shell restaurant space was ready to be turned over to tenants for their improvements. The second floor office space was finished and ready to be turned over, and then the third floor was getting close as well as top floors of residential are done. And um, we're looking, hoping that they're going to be moving residents in soon. I'm sure they're just um, waiting for their um, occupants, occupancy permit on that. And this is 24 stories that uh, over downtown, so very cool project. Um, so moving into um, some data that we're tracking. So we have access to a platform called placer.ai, uh, which gives us um, completely anonymized foot traffic and allows us to measure and track trends and patterns in downtown for both resident, non-resident population, um, giving visitor demographics and other information as well. Uh, gives us events and business counts and then a, a lots of stuff available. Here's just a brief snap snapshot of the last year of visitors within the bid. Um, we're still down about 20% from pre-pandemic levels, but we're expecting um, that that is continuing to increase and we're really looking at uh, the summer um, to see how that unfolds. Here is the last six years of foot traffic on Virginia Street between 6th and 2nd Streets where they closed down that portion for events a lot of time and you can see it annotated uh, for um, those different events. Um, and you can see on the far right of the graph, um, we're still trying to trend above that baseline um, and we're gonna be watching that very closely this summer. Uh, economic marketing is the big collaborative issue or initiative that we're working on uh, right now. Uh, we're going to be producing resources and collateral to help sell downtown. We're going to start with some basic one sheets of info for small re small businesses, residents, developers, investors, and commercial brokers. This will be a great complement to a new, new website that's being developed to go along with a downtown Reno hype video, and we'll still continue to become go-to in downtown for economic development data and vibrancy. Um, so next steps um, in our Economic development continue to build out our Nevada Main Street program, um, work towards national accreditation and further grant funding. Uh, we want to build support for um, improvements of the Truckee River path, um, ne necessary maintenance to uh, make that more usable. And then, of course, we have uh, a focus on properties that are ripe for beautification and blight reduction. 
um, and we want to complete some improvements on some vacant storefronts to go along um, with some of the recommendations coming from the Gale study. And so we have just a few examples of what that could look like. If you've been down Virginia Street, you've seen this property. I uh, recently talked to the owner. They're doing some improvements inside to get it ready to either sell the space or bring in a new tenant. Um, in the meantime, we want to make it you know, something like this to have some maybe art installations in there to kind of just showcase that space, make it a little more active. Right next to it, there's a similar space. We're working with this building owner, and we like to get something like maybe um, a mural painted on that. So uh, that is just the, the brief overview of what we're uh, doing in economic development downtown, and I'll turn it back over to marketing extraordinaire, um, Mr. Brian Bosma. Yeah, and I want to say too, Milwaukee did the same improvement, and they had buildings that were uh, vacant for over 50 years, and they were able to fill those vacancies within 12 months. Um, so like I said, our team is very excited with some marketing. Um, the big thing that I wanted to push was really telling the stories of the ambassadors and telling the stories of downtown Reno events and businesses. On the left here, you'll see an award that was given to Ambassador Roscoe from Remza Health. Um, he performed life-saving measures at RTC, and um, this is just one of many stories that, you'll, that we'd love to hear about how ambassadors are literally saving lives. Um, a big push that we're working on as well is branded content. We want to be able to tell the stories of businesses. We want to be able to tell the stories of the people who are doing things right in downtown Reno. Um, one of the articles that we have up, we have about seven up right now, is with Cromer Investments and how they're going above and beyond to revitalize downtown Reno. Um, a big push that we've been having as well is um, strengthening our relationships with media outlets and strengthening our relationships with our partnerships in the university. On the bottom, we did um, with the university in partnership with Bird, the RSCVA, and the Reno Aces. We um, did the Nevada Fit orientation where we gave out hats, helmets with a simple ask of just please put the ambassador hotline in your phone. This is really helping shorten the gap between the university and downtown Reno. Here's a little picture of some slides over the last uh, year or so. We were heavily involved with the Veterans Day Parade and we were a co-collaborator for Let It Glow Reno, which was really shining a light after two years of darkness from COVID. It was a great way to get 100 businesses involved and we were able to award prize money. We were also able to assist the city of Reno with the Christmas tree lighting ceremony, where we had um, the Rose Christmas Wonderland perform, uh, Kalia Cage and Cat Hart and Connie Ray emceed it. Um, we also were um, very instrumental in working with the city of Reno and Bird regarding safe practices. Um, safe practice is a big thing. We want to make sure people aren't running over people on the streets, but also uh, promote safety while wearing helmets. By uploading a picture of you wearing a helmet on a scooter, you actually get free riding credits. Um, a big push that we're working on right now, too, is a downtown Reno coloring book contest to attract families of downtown Reno. You'll see one of the pictures on there to the, the left. Um, on the right, you'll see, too, we worked with the RSCVA and the USBC to create uh, the Reno Discovery Guide, which is has about 100 businesses that try to get in there. We have about 50 in there right now, and this will be distributed out to the 50,000 or so visitors that are coming here between now and uh, July 24th. This will then roll over to a local downtown coupon book as well for residents. Um, a big thing that we always say is, you know, downtown Reno has no parking. We are in the final stages of building our interactive parking map. It'll show you every open parking spot in downtown Reno, including a business map legend that'll show you where all, you know, the cool bars, entertainment, museums are located in downtown Reno. And we really believe this will be instrumental in creating that vibrant downtown. Um, activating is a big thing that was talked about in the Gale study. This is the Locomotion Plaza. So uh, one of the things that we are proud to announce is rolling in Reno. This will be on June 9th. We're going to have um, skating, food trucks, and art and a great way to kind of activate that downtown space. This is also just the tip of the iceberg as well for other events that we have planned on Locomotion Plaza. Um, part of that big economic marketing push is the blue carpet treatment. This will be um, in partnership with EDON, the city of Reno, and the Office of Small Business. Um, the Lieutenant Governor's Office, and this is a community event to showcase and highlight the new businesses coming to downtown Reno. Um, this is also a great event for downtown residents to create community with one another and a structured event, so we look forward to announcing those here um, in the next few weeks. The Partnership Plaza is almost done with its facelift. We'll be, um, we're proud to announce, too, we're going to have Downtown Tuesdays there starting on May 9th, and this will be um, music curated by Loud as Folk. And uh, we'll be having music, art trucks. This is the original location of Food Truck Fridays. And we're really looking forward to be able to activate this space in one of the most beautiful um, overhead shade structures in Reno. This is um, a quick, our critical mention report. We've been able to reach an audience of about 80 million with the publicity value of about 9.8 million in the last eight months. 
Um, the feedback form has really been able to help us um, dial in our services and create more of effective uh, nature with our ambassadors. So if you see something in downtown or if you have some suggestions on what we can be doing to improve, we ask you to fill that out. We've been very responsive with that and it's really helped make us more be, be a more effective organization. With that being said, I'm gonna turn it over back to Mr. Marini who will be going over our assessment budget. Madam Mayor, Council, Tony Marini again. While we're happy to answer any questions today, we want to emphasize that the DRP is very happy with the work being done in downtown Reno. The Reno Partnership, we are creating jobs and movement for a clean, safe, and vibrant downtown and look forward to the continued efforts. On the screen now, you see our annual report. As you can see, our estimated budget is about $3.675 million, with ambassador services about $1.674 million, police services $810,000, with operating expense at $980,000, supplemental revenue of $100,000, Supplemental maintenance of 400,000 and daily services, beautification improvements of 100,000 with a contingency of about $613,000. Now we'll open it up for any questions. All right. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Fantastic. And love all the marketing and economic development that you guys are doing. Uh, this is a huge accomplishment. I don't know if you've noticed, but lately in the press, uh, you're seeing businesses are starting to say, we believe in our downtown. It's the first time in a very, very long time, to be, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it was one of the reasons why Midtown had so much success, because uh, they were doing it right, and they were understanding sort of the landscape of what needed to happen in that part of town, and now you're just starting to see the momentum in downtown. And I really believe it's um, all the hard work that the DRP has put in, and want to say congratulations to your director, uh, well, councilwoman, she'll always be a councilwoman to me, but uh, Jarden, I know she cares deeply. But you guys are on top of it with every single business. And I frequent a lot of the businesses along the river, and they are so grateful. So you need to know that. Listen, it's not easy. You're tackling some tough, tough challenges and times, and um, you're always going to have critics. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're not getting it right and doing good work for others. So keep that out of your, your, your mind, because I know we get sensitive about that. But uh, I'm really, really proud. And um, I hope you are too, Mr. Marini, and your board. Thank so you. thank you. I'm going to open it up to the body for any questions or comments um, at this time. Go ahead, Councilman Breckis. Yeah, my questions are for our staff. Thank you for the presentation, gentlemen. Mr. Edelstein, um, questions for you. Um, first of all, are you currently a downtown partnership board member? Uh, Eric Edelstein, for the record, no, I'm not. Were you recently, though? Did you leave that board? I, I was an active member, and I resigned prior to accepting the role okay. of the city of Reno. So fairly recently, you were step, you were a board member. Question, what's the next step? Because this is an annual process, and what's the next step for us? I'm not sure I understand the question. Don't, like, assessments go out, and we have to read an assessment role? I, I didn't, I know... I'm sorry, you're asking operationally, what are, what are the yeah, next steps? Yeah, for this body, the decision-making junctures. We have three new members, and I'm, I'm a little behind on my Matt recollection. Sure, I, I, I'd be happy to read off this timeline here for you. So uh, today we have, the, we have the presentation. On March 29th, uh, the city engineer signs off on the assessment roll. On March 31st, filing of the assessment roll with the clerk's office. On April 12th, a uh, resolution fixing the date, time, and place. City clerk signs notice at hearing at city council. April 19th, bid notices are mailed. Uh, also April 19th, posted in three public places. Uh, Monday, April 24th, RGJ publication. Monday, May 1st, second RGJ publication. Monday, May 8th, third RGJ publication. And May 10th, public hearing and objections of the assessment role first running, first reading of the ordinance, find last year's meeting, um, and then May 24th, second reading of the resolution and final role at council meeting. Okay, so the council will be working on this until May 24th. Questions I have, and um, you know, I was a big champion of this. I kind of consider it like a, you know, a baby of mine because I was in 2012, the advocate for doing the downtown 
plan, and this came out of the downtown plan. I was also the liaison to both the pre predecessor assessment districts. So deep knowledge, deep involvement, even though I haven't said as the council liaison, but there was always, and it's in the downtown plan, it's also referenced in the statute, gonna be a five-year look back. We're at that five-year period in time. Mr. Satensky and I had calendared early last year a, a fall meet and greet, summer meet and greet, to start talking about that. Um, I'm troubled um, that we don't have the five year to re-up you know, the plan of their work. And, and that gives me a, a little bit of trouble. Um, Mr. McArdle presented this to the FAB and said, well, last week, and I was listening, said the FAB, you know, that date for the five years come and gone and we're gonna push it off till the fall because of Ms. Jardin's ethics issues, her cool off period. And I'm, I'm troubled with that. You know, I don't think her issues are the driver of, you know, the work we do, the, the fees we assess upon property owners. It's this body's desire to get information in front of us. And also the people are paying. Right. Thank you, Councilwoman Brown. Madam Mayor, my question is, can in the next, then in, between now and May 24th, can we get the five-year update done? All right, Councilwoman Breckis. I'm gonna have you hold off. Any other questions from council members? And the reason I ask this, it's important for them to also get their questions and comments on the record without um, sort of being monopolized. So that's why we do that. I wanna make everyone clear so that's a fair process. Go ahead, yeah. Councilman Dewar. Mine is not a question, but more of a comment. I think that, that as we, I was here through the whole Puma process uh, where we had consultants come in and they really helped us move through the process. And I just think it was a brilliant outcome to have a group focused on downtown, doing the very things that we need, which is focusing on helping people, reaching out, whether they're tourists, whether they're uh, unsheltered population, or anyone in between, um, and providing those kind of services in a way that our business community and our residents that live in downtown stepped up and agreed. You know, they had to vote more than 50%, but I think it was actually a higher percentage uh, to establish the district. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for all of them stepping up for ourselves, being willing to be part of it because we pay too. No one was exempt. That was a big issue was, well, is a nonprofit exempt? Is a you know religious institution exempt? It's just like any other service. You gotta pay for what you get. And uh, no one was exempt, including us. And I just, I think it was just exactly what we needed to do. I'm so pleased that we did it. And obviously it's coming into its own and it's really proving its worth. So thanks for the presentation today, everyone that participated. All right, thanks. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think my comments will be brief, but I may have a question. Um, the first thing I think is important is for us to appreciate and think about where we've come from. That historical uh, look back is important. I think each year as the Downtown Rio Business Partnership has checked in, we have seen growth in the effort, right? Some changes, some tweaks. I believe that's because um, the members and the board continue to solicit that kind of feedback. They are out there actively engaged with the community. Uh, we must have gotten 50, 100, I don't know, letters of support uh, for this particular agenda item, and that is uncommon. And I think that uncommonness tells you that what we have done um, historically um, in setting this up and then allowing it to grow and flourish has been the right option. So we are, I think only now though, beginning to see all that it can do. It's like this engine that if we allow it to do what it can do, and if we give it the support from our side of the aisle that we can, it can be even greater than, it, um, than we believed it would be, right? So I think it's very difficult to um, it's, I, I don't like the sort of double speak, the blowing hot and cold at the same time. I, it, that to me is um, discouraging because from my perspective, what I see is great work being done. All of these gentlemen who have come and made the presentation today are people who are absolutely every day in their personal and professional lives rooting for Reno. And I think that's a key part of it. Um, I think too, some of what I did not hear in the presentation today because there was a lot of information um, I'm really excited about. For example, I know we're getting ready to um, see a rollout of 24 hour overnight service. That's really cool. 
that's huge. I mean, that is the next step in the effort that will be undertaken by this group. And so for our community, what they want to do is be able to enjoy uh, downtown. Uh, maybe they're coming from Damani Ranch and that they haven't spent a lot of downtown, uh, time downtown. But now as rolling on the river or the uh, wing festival or the Italian festival draws them into it, they're going to be able to see some of the dramatic changes. I think some of the changes they'll see also relate to um, you know, some of our businesses who have not been good partners, who have not been um, doing what's right, I think, by our citizens. And so I think as we continue to grow and evolve, that's where I'm interested in. Um, the financial piece of it, which we'll be evaluating over the next couple of months, is certainly always a part that we have to pay close attention to because assessments um, and voted on assessments are something that's important to their entirety. But I think from our perspective and based on the presentation today, I just want to say kudos. Thank you to all the hard work that goes into it. Um, I know uh, that Mr. Bosma uh, sort of eats, breathes, and sleeps, you know, the love for this city. Uh, Mr. Marini, uh, always, Nathan, always a joy to spend time with you because when I spend time in the presence of people who are positive, that positivity is infectious, right? And then that permeates into other areas. When I spend time with people who are always naysaying and always negative, I think that has the opposite effect. All right, thank, wow, right on time. Fantastic, okay, go ahead, Councilwoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. More of a comment too, fantastic, impressive. So excited and thank you for everything that you do. Um, three things that I learned about from my presentation was um, the overnight ambassadors. I think that's going to be a huge improvement, huge effort. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, we want to be a partner and support those efforts. Um, second thing is the building improvement. Um, I think that is going to change downtown. And like you said, uh, those buildings can possibly be occupied within 12 to 18 months. Very exciting. And then the third thing was the special events. Um, activating the area just amazing work and I want to say the ambassadors have a grueling job and I am I'm so thankful for everything that they do and they are appreciated very much so thank you everyone for being here all right any other council members councilman Bretkus yeah I'm gonna run off my questions because I, I see I often under these rules that I did not vote for get cut off and don't be able to give due um, consideration to my concerns and questions. So can we rush a five-year update between now and May to have you know compliance with my interpretation of the statute and also black and white in the plan too? In lieu of that, there was an audit pre presented at the FAB. Um, a memo since come out and more or less said the audit was wrong. The audit was um, internally done by the manager's office like started back last February or, or March. And maybe, you know, why, what, why did we decide to audit, you know, the function, the relationship? There were findings on it. Um, you know, can we get answers to each of those? I didn't see those. You know, one is, for example, is the board, the board composition. And that's always been a problem of mine. If you look, the number of properties assessed are residential, but the board only gets two residents um, property owners, and they only get one-year turns. And I'll tell you, the downtown plan says the success of your downtown is getting more residents. So why do we have and sign off on a plan that gives residents less voice on all these monies they're taxed for? Never understood that. So two, if we're not going to do the five-year update, can we dis have discussions in this process about the findings of our audit? And maybe because the lag time in the audit, and I never knew about the audit until I saw it on the FAB agenda, you know, maybe some work has been done. I thought audits were going to come to us when they happen. Um, the other issue is um, the, the funds. I think they have a $600,000 reserve, which is more or less what the increased assessment is. I asked during my agenda review last week, haven't seen it, how is that $600,000 assessment being distributed. Are the commercial properties valuation gone up or is it the residents? Because in the past years, I've heard the residents express concern that their nuts going up more than say a commercial property who's valued differently. I'd like to see that information. Maybe it'll come further. I would like to suggest, 
suggest to the council with the big questions, an executive director under ethics violations, an audit of questions, maybe we hold down the $600,000 increase until we truly do the five-year uh, look and say we're going to give people a break this year, make that decision now. Last point, I'm very troubled by, I, I, I'm, I'm going to really want to see, I saw a lot about the revenues going to the downtown partnership in the bid, but I didn't see a lot about the expenditures. When we set up the bid, the police assessment district was bringing $1.6 million. Right now, I understand 1.65 is being spent for safe public safety. When we set up the bid, 725,000 was maintenance. 810,000 now is for maintenance. So the growth is going to a lot of the good things that were discussed, but only $100,000 being raised privately. And I'm not so sure that these economic development functions that are really important are serving the needs of the right, residents you. who are carrying the right, tax thank you, burden. Councilman Breckis, thank you. So I'll look for right. his answering those thank questions. You, thank you. Breckis. All right, any other questions from council? Are you gonna give staff a time to answer my questions? Hold on. Okay. You're, calm down just a little bit. Okay, we'll get there. All right, go ahead, Councilman Dewar. Yeah, I just, um, I didn't include in my comments, but I did wanna include this overnight ambassador thing I think is huge because it's, uh, it's dark, and that's a scary time for a lot of people. And to be able to expand out there I, I, in, the, in the dark, in the night, it's tough for the ambassadors, and I assume they're going to go two by two at least, not one by one. But, I mean, having their presence is going to make a big, big difference. We, stopping at 10, um, you know, a lot of the bars downtown are open far longer than that, 12, 2 in the morning. And um, having their presence when the bars let out or when events are concluding, I think will be really significant. So I'm so pleased to see that you're going in that direction. Um, I also was pleased, I remember when you started with 10, 10 employees, and I remember thinking, how can 10 employees cover this whole area? And so I was really pleased to see the expansion um, to the 24. And I think that alone, just being able to double the number plus, you know, has a big impact. So I'm excited about what the future holds for the um, downtown um, and this partnership. And, um, you know, amendments, if they have to be made, if, if there's something to be done, maybe it's been successful in part, because when we did have the SAD and others, it was primarily a city, city run thing. And um, I don't think there was particularly a lot of partnership with businesses and so on downtown. And by engaging them, whether or not the monies have changed, Engaging them and making them responsible, co-responsible for the outcomes, I think is a complete game changer. That puts your relationship with the city instead of asking, when are you going to do X? It's when are we going to fix Y? And um, it, it, it's a complete change of perspective, and I think it really speaks to the ultimate outcomes. Is where you sit depends on where you stand, or where you stand depends on where you sit. And if you're sitting in the doing role, we're responsible, then you take more ownership and you're going to be more effective. So thank you. All right. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wanted to also sort of connect the dots to something, which is that although the Downtown Reno Business Partnership has an independent function as a nonprofit organization, there is a lot of synergy with, I think, what we are doing at the City of Reno. And certainly, Mr. Edelstein, this is part of the reason why you and our team are expanding here at the City of Reno. As we chart the course for the next number of years that we're looking at ahead of us, I think that you and Mr. McCardle, um, Ms. Turney, all of the team are working in a space that is quite frankly, it's very exciting. Um, I appreciate your um, willingness to join this team and um, really help us to think about the way in which downtowns provide a vibrancy that is different for towns that do not necessarily have that component. If you look at every, well, let's say every great American city, there is a, a thriving downtown component to it. I will share for my colleagues' benefit that when we were in Columbus, Ohio this fall, 
we saw um, a number of different similar um, things with the downtown Reno business partnership model being laid upon their park system, being related to their um, economic development, their events planning. And as you start to just um, sort of pull some of the threads at it, you start to see how much more it will be, right? And so the efforts that the, um, the presentation and the good work that they have um, identified as being done are not in a vacuum. They're, they're not siloed. They are also part of a broader effort to make sure that downtown has more people living in it. That's the example that a lot of the economic development have uh, posited with new construction, whether it's the city center or the Edel Town. I can't remember what's Eden. The Eden. Um, uh, th these are examples of more people moving into an area because all of that continues to grow and thrive. I, I look at some of the comments that were made by other people who wrote in along the 4th Street corridor and how important they have seen the change in the way in which uh, their customer base has been able to change, their um, the feeling or just the vibrancy. Those are not necessarily things that you can put a, a finger on. But I also want to say that there are I think, as the mayor said at the beginning of this, there are always going to be critics. And there are also going to be people who, for their own ill intentions, try to heap dirt on you. Just continue to maintain the high road, right? Don't uh, fall into the habit of thinking about the conspiracy theories, the disconnected dots. All of those things are distraction, right, mm -hmm. for the good work that you are doing, right? Some of the comments that have been made, I think, really are about personal vendettas. They're, they're not really related to the work that the that either you or the downtown Reno business improvement folks are doing, that the partnership is a good one. Um, our colleague, Councilmember Jarden, um, spent you know 10 years in service to this city and the efforts that she is undertaking at that particular juncture over there are also ones that I think for our community, and that's all of us, the, the 300,000 people that call the city of Reno home are going to pay off. So stay the course, um, keep doing what you're doing. Councilman Martinez. Yeah, thank you so much, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to say that I appreciate you all coming here and sharing those updates with us. Um, a lot of the information that you provided, I just wasn't aware of what was going on. Obviously, driving through downtown, I see the effects. And just um, when I was in graduate school, talking to people about where I was from in Reno, and a lot of people have that um, image of Reno that you talked about earlier, but those efforts are paying off. So I did want to applaud you all for the work that you are doing. Um, and then just to talk to the city staff in particular, um, I think I would like to focus on something that uh, Council Member Reese brought up and how the residents here in Reno may be feeling some of the effects that are going on downtown. So if there are any ways from an equity standpoint to provide any of these services to other areas of our town or our city that are experiencing these things, I'd really be in support of anything like that moving forward. So I appreciate you being here and providing that info for us. All right. Any other questions? Oh, one more small thing. Um, just really quick, I... Um, this week, we or in the last week, we celebrated the opening of the second Portland Loop, which is a bathroom. And um, you know, might think why? What people have even said, why are you having a, like a ribbon cutting on a bathroom? But this bathroom is not any bathroom. It's it's taken us eight years, the council working together, to overcome, I guess, uh, prejudice or pres a presumption that bathrooms are bad and would somehow not do a good thing for our downtown. But in fact. Um, they've actually collected data about the usage of the bathrooms, um, which is the second, first one being in Broadhead Park, second one being in John Champion Park, third one coming right here to City Plaza, so very much downtown. Um, they have showed something like a 75% reduction in waste along the river, something right along those numbers. Uh, incredible usage of the bathrooms. It's a great place um, for families. Most kids I know usually need to use a bathroom. Uh, you know, every hour or two. I mean, and that means you either leave your recreation site, you're, you're, maybe you're visiting an event downtown, maybe you're on the bike path, you have to leave because someone has to go to the bathroom, and that is what we want to avoid. So myself and Councilmember Martinez were out there um, cutting the ribbon. Our partners, Tomwa, who have co-funded our major partner, One Truckee River, which has taken the lead from the city. It started right here. You know, and I got to give a shout out, I guess, at this moment to Robert Chisel, our former CFO, whose whose vision it was. Frankly, he's the one who connected me with the Portland Loop. He's the one who had the words. He knew about it, and then we began advocating for it. And eventually, here we are. But I've got to believe that that too helps the um, ambassadors do their job 
uh, better. And so I, I think the city's provided some good leadership, some funding, council funds, for example, to get that started. Um, so I hope that that is what I believe is true, but I'd uh, eventually like to hear more from the part, the ambassadors as well. So thanks. All right, Councilman Weaver. Nothing? Okay. Uh, just a couple things. I know someone mentioned audit, and I can't remember uh, who mentioned that, but that has been something that I, I know we've asked for a long time, and I'm glad to see that we finally did that. And re the reason we do it is for transparency. It's how we get better, and it's a good thing that we have them. So mm -hmm. I want to say thank you for that. Um, I know there might have been some confusion there when you do these audits because uh, everyone's sort of looking for different things, but I want everyone to know that's why you do them because it's a great way to be transparent. We'll continue to do that. The other thing is I want to say thank you, thank you so much uh, to your ambassadors. I have had great interactions with them, I have to tell you. Uh, inspiring stories because many of your ambassadors um, have had just incredible hardships and they know what it's like to be on, on the streets. They know what it's like to struggle. And so in a lot of ways you're giving them hope, but they can also have a lot of hope for others on our streets and not just our visitors, but uh, the people who live here. So I need to give them a huge shout out. I hope they're watching. They're probably not because I know they're busy doing their jobs, but they're pretty remarkable people. So I want to say thank you in providing jobs. That's another thing, the economic development capacity of what you do. I see Mike Kazmierski here. Thank you for being a massive champion for revitalizing downtown. You guys, it's finally starting to happen. So you should feel very incredibly, incredibly proud. Um, that being said, I, um, is there anything you would like to add, uh, Mr. Edelstein? And then I'm going to hand it to the ward representative. No, thank you. Nothing? Okay. He thank won't you. answer the questions right. I... Councilman Breckis, you're out of time. The questions yeah. I've asked will go unanswered then? I, if, I'm sorry, you, you're out of time. Go ahead, Councilwoman. Cut off uh, again. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move to approve staff recommendation. All right, thank you so much. I have a motion. I have a second. Madam Mayor. Go ahead. One yeah. minute. Councilwoman yeah. Breckis. You know, I, I don't know how many of you have read the management plan, but... I, um, we're not being compliant. We said we would do the five years, and I wish the body was saying, do the five year before we sew this up on the 25th. We've been sued on the validity of this. And I know the comments where we received a lot of favorable input on this item, but there's three new members who haven't been through the process, and the next steps are all the homeowners getting their bills. And some years we've received a lot of concern. And let's put our best foot forward. Let's address the audit. Let's do the five year. And we need to look at their balance sheets too because the growth appears to be going not towards the public safety, not towards the maintenance, toward the other things, which are good. And maybe they should be budgeted in a different way. But it's going to be hard in April if people are getting big numbers because their properties have increased and they're taking the hit of the $600,000 to um, to not say that we've done all our homework. And the audit brought up that a lot of this wasn't being watched carefully by the city. For these reasons, I vote no. If there had been any inclination to say we're going to hold the 600000 right. we're going to give a break, I would have been there today because I do Council believe in Brett. the issue, but I vote no. Thank okay. you. And thank I was you. cut off. And my questions went in answer. Council, thank you. Councilwoman Breckus, thank you. Appreciate it. And I think you absolutely have some validity in some of your comments. Uh, however, I do want to apologize for probably the personal vendetta uh, that council member might have against your director and just don't let that um, sort of steer you in a different direction. Just keep focusing on the positive. I think that's important. But I also do want to recognize that, um, you know, I think Councilwoman Breckis, she's smart, she, she gets it. And so I think, um, you know, we'll continue to follow oversight like we should, that's our job. So thank you very much, appreciate you guys. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Opposed. Can I, Motion carries. Can I just make a comment? Go ahead. I, I'm not going to vote because I, I, I agree with Jenny. I don't, I don't know enough about the process. Um, so I'm just, I'm going to abstain. I just wanted to say that I, I'm not familiar with what we should be doing. If we don't have audit findings, things like that, I think that we should be better informed before we vote on things like this. Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, um, would you like to weigh in? That's my believer. It's required to vote. Yeah. Then opposed. All right. Motion carries. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you.
Madam Mayor, you made personal comments about me and my my views on another individual. Council I'd like woman, to say those are unsubstantiated and against our Council rules. Ruckus, thank you. We're not going to do that. We're going to give everyone respect in this room. So thank you. Okay. All right, Madam Mayor, would Moving you like on. to go back to our consent agenda? We're going to go ahead and open item B2. B2. Which was pulled by Council Member Doerr, and it's a presentation from Hans Meyer. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor, um, Madam Clerk. Thank you for the team coming up. Uh, the reason I pulled this item is um, for the benefit of the rest of the Council members. Uh, the consent agenda is generally, in my view, de minimis pro uh, projects generally under a million dollars. Uh, the two items I pulled, one is 3.2 million and one is 11.5 million. You'll often see capital projects of this size. But I think it's important for our residents to understand how we're spending their money and what we're doing and the good things that we're doing. And the two items I pulled, I think, are very good items um, where the city's getting out front of um, maintenance issues and we're also rehabbing projects. So if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Council Member Dewar. Uh, for the record, Hans Meyer, Senior Civil Engineer in the Public Works Department, here to present on the 2023 Preventative Maintenance Project. Uh, this presentation originally had two items related to it. We have the Construction Contract Award to Sierra Nevada Construction and the Inspection Services Award to Loomis & Associates. Um, this project is an annual project, and it is tied closely to our Neighborhood Street Program. Uh, one of the key elements of this neighborhood street program on the left-hand side is to uh, separate out the city into three different triads where we will focus our efforts on an annual basis rotating in a clockwise direction. Um, last year, for example, we were in the northeast-southeast area, uh, in the in other areas, the southwest area, and then the northwest Verdi stead area. Uh, this year, primarily the focus of this preventative maintenance project is going to be in the southwest area of town. Um, on the right-hand side is the primary uh, construction effort for this uh, project. It's going to be a slurry seal. And when I want you to think about a slurry seal, uh, much like the vehicles that we drive on our roadways, uh, they are best operating with a maintenance schedule. Um, a slurry seal can essentially be known as an oil change of our roadways, much like an oil change to our vehicles. Um, some key elements of this program are uh, this year we are looking at 32 miles of roadway improvement. Um, its primary focus is to maintain our roads in good condition and meet the schedule of that maintenance for our roadways. Um, here is kind of a before and after of what uh, generally occurs and how a roadway improvement happens. Um, with that, on the brief presentation here, we have a recommendation for a uh, move to award the contract for uh, Sierra Nevada construction an amount not to exceed $3.2 million. Well, I'm pleased to make that motion. I think we've already approved item B3, so it's just B2. But before I do, I just wanted to say, I think it's incredibly important, especially given the winter that we've just had, the amount of, um, uh, I guess, damage, uh, impacts that our roads have experienced, that we're... These are some of our older roads. This is the older part of town. And um, I think it's just really good to highlight it because we've gotten a lot of public comment about this, the condition of our roads uh, prior to the storm, after the storm, both. And um, it's good for the public to know we're on it. And so, you know, spending $3.2 million of their dollars on roads that they interact with every day, maybe in front of their own house. So... Um, so with that, it's my privilege to uh, recommend approval of item B2. All right. Thank I'll you. second, and then I have discussion. I Mayor. have a motion from Councilwoman Dewar, a second by Vice Mayor Reese. Madam Mayor, I just wanted to um, say thank you to Councilmember Dewar for highlighting the important program. Thank you, of course, for your presentation. Um, it's always important, I think, that the public understands exactly what we're doing with the dollars that we have that we need to spend. One of the things I think is important, too, to consider, and Madam Mayor and I uh, serve on the RTC, the Regional Transportation Commission, and during our board retreat last week, these are the kinds of things that are being discussed in a, in a very important forum. Ms. Koski was there as well, and it's more uh, a discussion point to, to identify that 
this need and the, the clockwork uh, map that you showed, which shows us rotating these dollars around the community, really is important for our community to understand because as we go about advocating for more um, or different ways to fund road maintenance, I think that's something that we're struggling with. There is a backlog of road maintenance issues, and there probably always will be. I mean, I don't know that any city could go out there and reasonably say that they've done everything they can to address every roadway need, but I will tell you, your team is doing a phenomenal job of identifying the priorities and bringing them to this council, so thank you for that. Thank you. All right, any other comments? Seeing there are none, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. okay. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Moving on to item B4, hold by Council Member Doerr. Okay. Um, again, I'd like a little presentation. This one's almost uh, three to four times the size of the last one, and it's about both street and sewer. Uh, we did a similar project or are still doing a similar project in the area around Virginia Lake where we're going in completely replacing, not doing a slurry seal, but completely replacing the road, completely putting in a new curb and gutter, and also potentially sidewalk where it, does, it doesn't exist. So will you just tell us about this one because it's in a new part of town? Great. Thank you, Councilmember Dewar. Um, I have a brief presentation. Good morning, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Katie Harrison, Engineering Manager with Public Works, for the record. And as Hans mentioned, a brief reminder, the city's divided into three pavement management areas, and we rotate through these areas on a three-year cycle for our pavement inspection, preventative maintenance, and street reconstruction. In 2023, we are in the Northwest Verdice Stead area of town for reconstruction projects. Um, as a reminder, council confirmed these streets for reconstruction back in 2020, and we bring the recommended candidates for council for confirmation several years in advance of the actual construction to allow property owners and other utility companies time for any necessary work in advance of these projects. The last thing we want to do is dig up a brand new road after it's paved. Um, and also, this um, project was included in the fiscal year 23 CIP budget. So the right side of the screen shows the general vicinity of this project. It's located in Ward 4, and it's northwest of the North Virginia, North McCarran intersection. The majority of the neighborhood is included in this project, and it's shown in more detail on the map on the left side of the screen. It's bound by Talis Way to the north and Moraine Way to the south. And I did want to note that there's a few streets that are um, light gray in this map that aren't in that solid blue, and those streets were not included in the project because the pavement condition was in better condition and didn't war warrant a full reconstruction. However, um, we will be sealing the pavement in the um, process that Hans just spoke about so that at the end of this project, the entire neighborhood will be complete. And uh, the project will be an over $11 million investment in the community. And here's an overview of the scope of the project. It includes $3 million or over $3 million in utility improvements, including a half mile of sewer main replacement and much needed drainage improvements. We will also be, also be completing over $3 million of concrete improvements, including 3.8 miles of sidewalk and driveway replacements, um, pedestrian connectivity, um, installing sidewalk where there is none today, and replacing uh, 47 pedestrian ramps. And that will bring um, this neighborhood into ADA compliance. Then we will also be completing over $4 million of roadway improvements, including nearly two miles of roadway replacement, along with um, necessary signage and striping. So here's the schedule for our project. Notifications were mailed out to the neighborhood last October um, to alert the neighborhood of the upcoming work and allow an time needed for necessary um, any of their necessary work in advance of the project. We presented to the ward for NAB and had a neighborhood public meeting to address any questions or concerns that the neighborhood had regarding the project. We opened bids on February 16th, and Spanish Springs was the lowest responsive bidder and they have successfully completed this type of work for the city in the past. If council awards this contract today, construction will be begin in the spring and wrap up in the fall. And I did want to note that during construction, the contractor is um, responsible for hand delivering notifications to residents in the area, and city staff does follow up to ensure that that is occurring. And so I know only um, item before was uh, pulled, but both of the recommendations are here. 
and we um, recommend awarding to Spanish Springs Construction. And I'm available for questions. Ms. Harris, you knocked it out of the park. I know. Thank you. Fantastic. Loved it. Thank you. You're not nervous, are you? Only a little. <laughs> you, could not, you could not tell it out. I thought you did amazing. Thank so you. congratulations. Uh, just really quickly, this is in Councilwoman Ebert's ward. I would like to ask Councilwoman Ebert, uh, what is sort of your idea of this uh, neighborhood? Like, give me kind of your background on this neighborhood. Well, I'm just happy to have road improvements out there. This is really well received at the, the NAB, so just really happy about it. Uh, it's been great to get to know Carrie and uh, hear about these improvements. And um, I know not all the areas need to be repaved, but to, to be resealing and and all of that, just very excited to have this happen. So thank you. thank you. And I think it's been pretty problematic on Talos. There's been some issues over there, some pretty dramatic issues. So I'm really happy to see this. So great job. Awesome. Thank okay. You. Councilwoman Durr. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I got to compliment you too. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, so with that, if there's no more comments, I'll just move to approve item B4. Any comments? All right, I have a motion. From Councilwoman Dewar? Second. Second from Councilwoman Ebert. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Good job. Okay, next item. I think it's B6. Councilwoman Breckus, I think. Yeah. So this is a procurement, and it's rather interesting in a couple facts because it was made, it's already been made. You've already made the procurement? That is correct. And, um, you know, I've been noting the council, and I did not support this, authorized the city manager to make purchases over 250000 And I've noticed a lot lately, particularly workman's comp and other types of settlements. But this is under 250000 So why wasn't it just made administratively then? My actual understanding was that he cannot sign above 100000 at the time. That's correct. And also, I think there was an emergency declaration. Is that correct? Well, the emergency declaration was actually declared at a state level, oh. not here at the city. So um, I can give you some quick background on this if you'd like, um, just for everybody's yeah, understanding. Yeah, I, I mean, going those on. weren't my primary questions. <clears throat> I'm going to mm -hmm. backtrack that that procurement standard. I just didn't know if we were in a different procurement standard. But I would like to know. Um, my my fundamental question is, what are we buying, and why are we tapping the sewer fund for this? Because I don't see it as a sewer project. Great questions. This is exactly what I'm way. here to talk about. So um, if, if I can get you guys to quickly take a look on the screen there, this is what we're purchasing, This is, or have purchased. Um, you're probably familiar with these being known as HESCO barriers. They're, um, that was a company name, and my understanding is HESCO has since been purchased, and now these are just going under the generic name of uh, Gabion Wire Baskets. So um, these, these baskets, uh, I guess really... To, to kind of back up a bit, um, the, these baskets were mainly developed for use in erosion control and any kind of a um, flood control that's necessary. That's their predominant reason for existing. The, um, some, some quick background is we purchased these mainly for Silver Lake, Silver Lake use. The Silver Lake Towers, Lemon, is managed by uh, Washoe County. So in December of this last year, we started working very closely with um, Trina Magoon's team in uh, utility services, the engineers, and uh, the maintenance and ops folks, my department, uh, we started looking at planning. We started trying to make sure that we were ahead of any problems that could potentially develop should we hit a 2017 or 2019 lake level conditions. And since then, uh, my team has installed HESCOs in this area. We've installed um, gate valves to stop water from backflowing from the lake into problem area of, of Amoya and Lear intersection. Um, we've, where I'm going with this is we've started already placing everything that's necessary to bring us to those 2017, 2019 lake uh, level conditions should we get there. There's been a very unpredictable weather, uh, winter as you guys are all aware. Um, the National Weather Service has made it clear they don't know what's on the horizon. And um, so we're trying to prepare to make sure that we can actually exceed the 2017 and 2019 conditions should we get there. Uh, what drove this to be an emergency purchase was a couple points, but um, one was that we, we became aware that there may be supply shortages. 
and we don't want to be put in that position. Uh, there's, we were hearing everything, lead times exceeding 45 days, and that was if they can get the material. So when in talking with the regional supplier, we identified that um, the, the material, if we were able to get an order in very quickly, he could put us at the front of the queue and actually have a truck loaded and delivered to us this last week. So that was the main reason why we uh, made this purchase as quickly as we did. We don't want to be caught short. We want to make sure we're prepared should we exceed what we've already prepared for. Um, so today I'm here per NRS to, um, NRS requires that we make this emergency purchase as we did, uh, that we have to report back to council immediately in the next session and that's what we're here for. All right, thank you very much. Madam, great job, Madam Mayor. All right, go ahead, Councilwoman Brackus, three minutes. So you can make an emergency purchase even though we don't have an emergency declaration in place. That is correct. Okay. And, you know, I've been up in the North Valleys on the weekends checking in. I know the situation up there. Um, and the, the issue I have is this is for Silver Lake. What's Silver Lake's relationship to sewer? So it's the, the purchases. We've always made purchases. It's sewer and storm is, is really what that fund is for. And so this is a storm-related event. Okay. Um, again, just kind of backing up a little bit, it's it's important that we're prepared for this. And um, this this purchase, what I'm I'm just here to say, hey, we need this. This material is important. This is what we're what we're uh, why we made the purchase. And I just wanted everybody to understand what's going on. Yeah, you know, we are making an effort, mm -hmm. but I am very troubled by how it's being led, frankly, because um, I'm getting a lot of feedback. The media is reporting on it on standing up a stormwater utility. And I would highlight this as an example of what we would do for a stormwater utility if we had one. But we don't have one. I'm not seeing a lot of advocacy for it. I'm out taking the opportunity to meet with a lot of people. I was on someone's property yesterday who's flooded and talked to them about what we need. But I am also have a long view on the sewer fund. And this new thing, Partnership Plaza, I just heard about, um, I used to know as the RTC bus station, it's something that a former city council bought using the sewer fund with. And then the state of Nevada said, you cannot use your enterprise fund to make those sort of purchases. And I'm nervous about this one. I'm nervous about continuing to buy stormwater related functions out of the sewer utility. I think that um, it should have been a general fund purchase, frankly. And so that's, that's troubling for me. It's also troubling to me that we're, again, putting Band-Aids up there. That's why I voted against the Aspire, which was going to increase more flood runoff in that hydro basin, and the Peavine Employment Center, which is going to cut off a flank of Peavine. And every one of those basins up North Virginia are completely full. At least they were a week ago when I drove up North Virginia. So I'm not doubting that we don't have a stormwater problem there, and these are emergency. But I have a problem with using this fund. And also what I'm seeing is not making the steps in the case for a stormwater utility by a lot of people who should be. So I don't know, Madam Mayor, I'm, I'm having a hard time tapping the sewer fund for non-sewer functions. If this was on Swan Lake, where we send our effluent, and you know that's what was my question, I might have been okay. All right, thank you so much. Okay, Councilwoman Doerr, yeah. weigh in, because oftentimes I refer to you as I'm gonna the weigh in. expert. So I want to hear. Go okay, ahead. I'm going to weigh in. First of all, very needed purchase. Thanks for getting out ahead of the shortages that you're expecting. It's very good planning. You have a process in place to make an emergency process and come back and get it ratified by council, and you're doing that. Secondly, my understanding the entire eight years I've been on this council, going on nine now, is that it is a sewer and stormwater fund. It's always been described to me like that. And in fact, whether we do it or not, I've told people when we stand up the, steward, the stormwater utility, when, if, that um, the portion of funds that are going into this fund would cease and they would go into the stormwater fund. Maybe either you or Trina could address that because that's what the question's about. I'll probably need to turn that part over to Trina. Thank you, Trina Magoon, Director of Utility Services. Um, I'm not sure if it's morning. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, yes, the Sewer Enterprise Fund 
is used currently both for sewer and stormwater. It has been for many, many years. That's how we accomplish all of our MS4 compliance, our maintenance and operations uh, with regard to stormwater currently. Uh, when and if we are able to set up a stormwater utility, we will move those functions into the stormwater utility. And obviously one of the pieces that Council Member Dewar brought up, um, we spend about $3.50 per equivalent residential unit on uh, storm drain systems within the sewer fund. That one option is to move that 350 into the stormwater utility and take it out of the sewer fund. So those two funds are completely separated and functioning only for um, those items. Keep sewer for sewer, and if we have a stormwater utility for stormwater functions. Yeah. But I mean, that's how the fund was stood up. Those are legitimate purchases in my mind. We've been doing all kind of stormwater work for years and um, paying for it out of this. So that I just wanted to make sure I'm correct and that we're clarifying this on the record. Yes, correct. Thank you. Madam Mayor. All right. Hold on a second. Council on, uh, or Councilman Reese, sorry. Thank Vice you, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Truhill, maybe first. Um, first of all, I think um, it's important to just pause for a moment and reflect on the maintenance and ops team. Um, you all have been doing just an incredible lift the last several months. The weather, the road condition, dealing with storm-related issues. I, I don't know any other uh, division in this country that can have undertaken the level of work that the men and women in our department have taken. So that's the first thing. Um, this, of course, is also, I think, a testament to um, some forethought and oversight on your part and your team's part uh, to understand that if there's going to be flooding in any of the basins in the north, we're going to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. Obviously, Swan Lake is the county's responsibility, um, and so some of the comments that have been made that have been directed at that really aren't the way that we approach um, water in that hydrologic basin. But I think it is important to understand that um, when this emergency arose and, and given the issues that we saw with um, I, I don't know, bomb cyclones, uh, torrential rains, they, they have a new name for every weather event coming across the Sierras. And so what I want to do is just say um, thank you for the city manager's office and for you and your team for working to say, hey, these flood baskets may be needed, they may not be, but we have this emergency need for it. I understand and I think we've clarified some of the misinformation or disinformation uh, being spread by the Ward 1 member about the purchasing power, about the nature of the sewer fund and how it's, uh, those funds are spent. But I also think um, it's important maybe, and maybe this is something that Mr. Hodge can weigh in on, our purchasing policy, I think it's section, or I mean it's policy 303, has some limitations on what the city manager's office can spend. But I'll also say that um, as with any emergency event, we've got to move fast, we've got to move nimbly, and um, people who grandstand on like some minutia in a policy that they are misinterpreting and spreading disinformation also does a disservice to the fact that our residents deserve better. The folks who live in the North Valleys are perpetually having to think about what the next storm will bring, and we are making every effort, um, both from a transportation infrastructure standpoint, from a sewer capacity standpoint, from a stormwater utility to address that. I mean, all of the effort that we've taken to dewater uh, Swan Lake and, and start the uh, AWP project is another example of that. And so when we start to think about, look, water, whether it comes from the sky, whether it's the sewer, uh, whether it is related to the, the um, you know, the storm shed or the watershed that happens, it, it's not just Tumwa, a sewer, a stormwater, it's all water. And we've got to deal with the impacts that it has. So I appreciate that. And, and I will just go to my question for uh, Mr. Hodge, maybe help us understand uh, the disinformation about the purchasing power. Uh, thank you, Councilman Reese. Uh, policy 303, which is our current purchasing policy, outlines under the Section I what the limits of purchasing are. Uh, Mr. Truehill is correct. The city manager can sign up to $100,000. Items in H1 and H2 also specifically outline when the city manager can purchase above that and come back for ratification based on the current Nevada Revised Statute. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor. All right. Any questions? Uh, not ahead, a question. Captain I just wanted to Eva. say, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'm just really grateful for all the support we've had in the North Valleys. Um, I've had a lot of um, phone calls and concerns, people reaching out to me. Um, before anything happened, just worried. I think people honestly have some PTSD from flooding sure. up, up in the North Valleys, and I'm just really grateful that um, 
we took some preventative me measures and, and I, I do know that this is for Silver Lake, not Swan Lake, but, um, you know, having the flood action plan and being able to um, assure people in Ward 4 that we are taking measures that we're not going to be um, reacting after the fact. I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. I would like to say um, Mr. Bird's team back here has been doing an amazing job. They're, his team has been working um, through the evenings. They're, we, every time we know that there's rains coming, we're double checking again that the ditches are clear, that the basins are in good condition, that they're functioning like they should be. And um, I'm incredibly proud of their team. They've been doing amazing work. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, um, you know, considering that nobody thought something like 2017 would happen again, and, and here we are, you know, having something like that not too far out. So um, it's really great to see that, you know, we're, we're kind of staying on top of things, and um, it's good to know that um, hopefully we won't have another flooding event like that. And um, to Jenny's point, I hope that we can um, be smart about development out there and um, make sure that we um, are mindful of a potential runoff going, uh, you know, with development Absolutely. in the future. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Councilwoman Dewar, your hand is up on my screen. Oh, that was from before. So okay. let me lower it. All right. Councilwoman Breckis. Yeah. Ms. McGroon, so you said the... Sewer fund is used for stormwater, but that doesn't mean that the rates were established for stormwater. And, um, I you know, you haven't been here that long, and the rates, the last rate reset was right before I came on. But my understanding was always the authorization, because you have to go under your rate study, you know, your rate analysis, which you're going to use, you know, your fund analysis, was that. Uh, the sewer fund was going to be used in association with um, helping the permit compliance of the plant, and I meant the Tumworth plant. So we were going to use it for stormwater to help mitigate what we might not be able to do in treating the sewer treatment plant. Have you gone back far enough to look into that and, and understand the nexus of why we use stormwater? Because up in the North Valleys, and I never heard this, in the North Valleys, you know, at, Swan Lake is our problem because we have a release permit into Swan Lake. I think that maybe, you know, needs to be acknowledged. But there are two interconnected basins. So I thought perhaps you had some basis, but I haven't heard it today, for using storm, sewer money up in this hydro basin because it helps out with the effluent permit to Swan Lake. Is that part of your concept, or do you just feel we have another basis for using the sewer fund for stormwater? And I'm unsure of, of that particular nexus, if that's where this originally started. The enterprise fund, uh, using the, the sewer enterprise fund for stormwater is an allowable use, um, so that's where I'm basing it from. And you're basing that under what? RMC? Or just what the finance department has told you? So I'm struggling, you know, to vote yes because you know we should do a general fund, or sure. no, we should do a sewer fund. For the record, John Flansburg, Regional Infrastructure Administrator, uh, in RMC, it specifically calls out that stormwater is a use uh, of the sewer fund. Um, even on the bills that are printed that go out okay. to the residents, it talks about stormwater as one of those uses. Uh, when we do um, and go through and do our rate analysis and a sufficiency analysis for the user rate, we include those um, stormwater uh, expenses that we have had, uh, not only for the maintenance and operations, um, for the uh, capital projects that are built, and we had a set aside that we were using for that, but we also look at uh, these emergencies and how those fold in to the overall cost. And so those are done on a about an every two-year basis. Okay. Even though rates have been CPI'd for 15 years or 13 years? Uh, those are two separate issues, as we mentioned previously um, at this council. Uh, the CPI, again, is just keeping up with the purchasing power of the, uh, of the rate. Um, the sufficiency analysis is one that looks at our costs uh, going forward and any rate impacts and whether we'd actually have to have a rate increase outside of inflation or that CPI increase. And we have been sufficient uh, to date, okay. which says something for how long that's been. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I am going to, um, oh, did you want to? I wait? have one more comment, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Ms. Magoon, if you would, please. Um, 
Remind us of your professional background and your experience in this area. I know you have been with the city for about three years, maybe a little more than that. I, sometimes days run into years, into months. Um, but tell us a little bit about your professional background. Sure. I've been with the city uh, just under two and a half years, but thank you. Um, I have been working in northern Nevada, uh, graduated from the University of Nevada, Reno with a civil engineering degree with environmental emphasis. Um, and then since then, I've been working in the drainage and flood control, linear infrastructure, sanitary sewer arena for my entire career. So most of that, I think I personally knew, but I wanted the public to understand that you are an expert. And I mean, not just an expert, but like an expert. Uh, when you and I spent time uh, with Councilmember Dewar in Monterey a couple of weeks ago learning about some of the uh, advanced water purification, I really came to understand the depths of your knowledge. So I just wanted to make sure you understood from this dais that we appreciate your expertise and your judgment. And so I want to make sure that you don't leave the room understanding or misunderstanding anything that's been said here today about that, because it is true that our staff and our employees are our most valuable resource. And I think sometimes what happens is people come into the room like armed for battle as though they thought that there was us and you. We are not that way. We, we are a, a, a community that works together. Um, Mr. Bird has been literally at the ready for weeks and weeks and weeks as I've watched storm events roll in and been out on um, some of our snow plow equipment. But it's it's all of us working together. And so I just wanted to highlight sort of for the public who might be watching at home, your depth of knowledge is, it blows my mind, quite frankly. So thank you for that. Yeah. And thank Madam you. Mayor, I'm prepared to make a motion. All right. Thank you so much. Give me a motion. Uh, move to approve staff recommendation. Second. I have a motion. I have a second from Councilwoman Weaver. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Great job, by the way. Um, love the presentations today. You guys are just like on your game. But I do, I just want to mention, because I think Devin was sort of going in this direction. Sometimes we might disagree up here, but we still have to be rooting for the team that we're all on, and that's Team Reno. And so, um, you know, I, I always want to apologize if it feels like it's us and them it should never ever be that way ever and please reach out and check us keep us in check i mean there are even times i'm like mickey three minutes on me three minutes on me because i hand on everyone else i need to be kept to the same standard so same thing but i want to say fantastic job you guys did thanks travis good job yeah, thank you. all right okay I want to, Madam Clerk, um, I want to sort of take an inventory of items that everyone is here for. I do see Mr. Kazmierski. I can't wait for your presentation. So I'm going to have you come up. We're going to skip around the agenda. Uh, we're going to go to item D2, Madam Clerk. And then I believe most people are here from items for item C2. I know Mike's got to get to another appointment, so I got to get him up here and out. And then uh, we're going to go to item C2, and then are there other items? And then we have got to go into an attorney client. So we're going to have to take a break for lunch and go into an attorney client. Yeah. So I'd like to hear those items before, and that's sort of, I think, where we're going on, on the agenda. Does that sound sufficient, Madam That sounds Clark? great, and I'll have um, my deputy clerk go out and just verify if there's other items that there's a lot of individuals here for. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just trying so to be respectful of everyone's which, time. Which item D2 we're going to do? And yes, we're going to do item D2 right now. Yeah, and then take a break. No. Is that what you said? We are going to do oh. item C2 right now because oh. I want to be respectful of everyone's time that's here, that's been waiting, and I appreciate your patience. So, But I want to make sure that your item gets heard before we go into this uh, attorney-client meeting and into lunch because then that means you're here another hour waiting on this. Okay, so we're opening that. item D2, and then close once that item is closed, we're going to go to C2. We'll take an inventory in the interim to see if there's other items that have heavy attendance, and then we'll go into break. Perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. So item D2. All right, Madam Clerk, do you have any public comment on item D2? Thank you, Madam Mayor. We do not have any correspondence. Additionally, I do not show that we have any speakers in the audience for item D2. Okay, so we do have uh, Eric Eidelstein. You will present Mr. Kismerski from EDON. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor, Council, and Eric Edelstein, Assistant City Manager for the record. Uh, here today uh, to introduce Mike Kazmierski for his annual presentation uh, with EDON. Um, as many of you know, the city has a longstanding investment of $100,000 a year um, to support EDON 
Um, EDON's recruitment efforts provide value to the city in searching and vetting potential new investments. Uh, and uh, our new re-energized focus in economic development um, is going to create an even stronger partnership um, as we go forward with EDON. Um, also would like to uh, thank Mike as he has announced his retirement um, and uh, uh, be the first uh, here and hopefully more um, to thank him for his many years of dedicated service um, to Northern Nevada and wish him well uh, in his future endeavors. Uh, with that, I'd like to bring up Mike Kazmierski for his presentation. All right, so we have excited to um, not accept the resignation, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> I bet you didn't know that, Mr. Kazmierski. <laughs> anyway, we're excited to have you. Um, I don't know if any of you were at the EDON luncheon. Uh, what do we call it? We call it the State of State the Economy. State of the Economy, yes. The State of the Economy. Mike kicks that off with incredible data and facts and wonderful speakers, but it really speaks to what's happening in the economy, what you have done to bring high-paying jobs here in other industries, diversifying our economy. It, you should be very, very proud. I am very, very proud. And uh, it's pretty remarkable what you've had to accomplish. And like much of us up here, we, we always take a lot of heat too. But I think sometimes when you hear that kind of thing, that means you're doing something right. Because uh, if everyone's liking you, then you're probably not working hard enough. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Kazmierski. And go ahead, take it away. The floor is yours. Well, Madam Mayor, thank you. And, and council members, um, we can't do anything without the team in this community and this council's led from the front. And we appreciate that leadership. But I'll tell you, behind the scenes, the staff is amazing. And we appreciate our work with the staff. And, and that really allows us to do what we do. So I'm gonna run through this pretty quick. Many of you have seen some version of this. This is an updated and much shorter version of the state of the economy. Uh, certain data in here has been updated and I'll focus a little bit on what it means to the city of Reno. Uh, first, what is economic development? We focus on primary jobs. Economic development is such a broad brush. It covers everything from people selling hot dogs downtown to, you know, hotel owners and restaurants. Our focus is on primary, which means most of that business does is customers live somewhere else. So when Tesla sells a car and a battery, most of that is purchased outside the region, which then brings business through revenue into the region and grows our economy in a lot of different ways. So really important to focus. We have a small staff, so we focus on the primary employer piece. That's really ultimately where we are. And that's only 4%, 4% of the businesses in our community. So we're allowed to focus on 4% and let a lot of other people help the other 96. Our region out to Fernley, you've probably seen that before. This is, again, we've seen the the Reno at the bottom of the list. I want to remind people how often we're now at the top of the list. Job growth, quality of life, Gen Z workforce, things that really indicate this is just a great place. I mean, it's an amazing community, and people still, still understand that. This, by the way, is a reminder. And when we start to uh, relax too much, we look back just a dozen years and say, it was pretty bad 12 years ago. When we get articles written about being in Detroit of the West, the economy trends, this study was done by UNR, current trends show Reno following the same path as Detroit. We forget where we were just 12 years ago. Our focus and strategic plan is pretty um, simple, a diversified and resilient economy. And a lot of areas we've, we provide emphasis on. The attraction of great companies is one that most people are aware of, and we do put a lot of work into that. These are companies that landed in the city of Reno over the last year. Those average rage, wages are pretty uh, amazing. And if you look at that and go back a few years, you didn't see companies coming here paying $57 an hour or 30 or 28 or whatever. And that really shows you the kinds of companies we're bringing to the community. Of these manufacturing companies, we will announce in the next 90 days, four of them will land in the city of Reno limits. So we are bringing that kind of great company with, with the right kinds of jobs into the area. Additionally, on a prospect level, we work with about 150 companies at any given time. And that's a lot of back and forth with information and data and all the other stuff. Um, this is really at the top of the list, companies that are starting to percolate to the point where they're gonna make a decision we're in the finals or we're one of the finalists, and you see the diversity in those companies. You know, manufacturing, aerospace, aviation, data centers, technology, all the kinds of companies that will bring the jobs of the future here to this region. 
And this is probably something we should be most proud of. The average wage just a few years ago, the companies we helped bring here in the $36,000 range, now we're, we're approaching 70000 And that's pretty amazing. Now, yes, there are a lot of other things associated with, with that. And you say average wage and median wage and all the other things. The average wage is used by the state, so we use that number. But the fact is, most of the people coming here are getting paid more than a living wage with plenty of benefits. Oh, by the way, on, those, um, on these companies coming, the uh, less than 25, actually it's 22% of them get or request any kind of incentives. So oftentimes we think, okay, we keep bringing companies in with a lot of incentives. The reality is it's a very small percentage, under 25%, and almost all of them are getting an incentive, an abatement of our sales taxes. And we're one of only eight states that tax manufacturing equipment one of only eight states that tax manufacturing equipment. So the bulk of our abatements are just to bring us to a level playing field with the rest of the country. And of course, when we bring in great jobs, it forces all wages up. And you may have found that in your, in your HR department. It's harder to hire someone for the wages that you were paying them five years ago. These companies were in here eight years ago, and this list goes on and on. Technology is part of our future, and we're really excited with some of these companies as they continue to grow here. It really speaks to diversification. And this one chart says it all. We got hammered just like Vegas did with the pandemic. We shut down just like Vegas did. We had negative sales tax revenue for two months and they had it for a year. And you can see obviously that means that our manufacturers went back to work and spent money. Our technology workers went to back, back to work or worked from home and spent money. And so that kind of diversification really insulates our economy from what we expect coming up as a recession of some sort. We work hard to bring companies here. We got to keep them here. So here are just some of the programs that our retention, expansion, and workforce development team focus on. Ultimately, it's the needs of the employers. What are we doing to help employers stay here and grow here? And a lot of needs associated with that. Sometimes it's simple. Sometimes it's complex. But workforce has really risen to the top of that requirements. So what are we doing to help on the workforce side? Long term, it's STEM. Short term, it's some of the programs with the community college. How do we help these companies um, meet their needs from a workforce perspective? And then startups. You know, it's great to take a two-person company like we did with Bombora and grow them to 65 engineers getting paid $80,000 a year. That's what startups do. That's that organic growth that doesn't have nearly the impact on the community, but allows that innovation to grow here and become part of our ecosystem. The 651 million raised last year is pretty amazing. You can see the companies listed there. But I would, I would say, if you look at the first five years and compare them to the last five years, even with the pandemic, we've had 13 times as much investment in our companies. And when they get money, they hire people. That's primarily what our startups do when they get these investment dollars. And it doesn't always mean small. I mean, Redwood Materials, 2,000, as many as 2,000 people out there, and obviously many others up there that are much bigger than what we think of when we think of startups. We think of just one or two people. Yes, that's true many times, but the rise of the innovation economy means a lot more. And the clean tech piece is amazing, and we see more and more traction in that space. Community development is something we've put more and more emphasis in, into. You know, we've worked on the taxis and getting, you know, family-friendly, business-friendly um, advertising on there. But getting the kids art was really something that we were excited about. Those wraps are an amazing part of that. We work on the trails. Um, the CARES campus is something. Funding for the Washoe County School District. Uh, we try to partner with the region on the needs of the region to make the region better because ultimately it makes our job easier because it's more attractive to the companies and the talent we need. Back to the um, Resource Center, we have, we're actually leading an effort to fund um, the, um, the CARES campus component that is focused on diversion. And what can we do to divert people from getting into the campus? And that whole piece is really a part of our $9 million fundraising effort to build a facility there to help in the diversion piece. And then housing, I, I know the entire council has worked on this, has struggled with this. It is something that every community has a challenge on. We've talked about it before. Uh, but if you look back 
to the 70s now, and that's a long way, we pretty much trended our house, our building of houses with our population increase. And that is until the Great Recession when we just basically stopped building and we kept having babies. And that has caused a problem. And we'll talk about that in more detail to see the economy slides. Um, but the reality is we're still behind and that's why we see these challenges. And when anyone that says we're growing too fast, I like to first, my first question to them is, when did you move here from California? And oh, by the way, you were part of the growth problem because we're growing just as fast now on, a, on an actual population growth rate as we were in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. You see that trend line, about 75, um, 7,500 people per decade if, as it continues to trend up, which means our growth rate continues to decline. We're growing slower now than this community ever has. And then finally, land. Um, the, the need for more infill is exacerbated by the lack of land. These are the parcels that are 20 acres or more, and you can see there's not much in the metro area, so we either drive to a Ford, and unlike Kansas, where you can drive two miles to a Kansas field and build a house, here you got to drive over the mountains and pass the BLM land to Fernley or Silver Springs or somewhere else in order to build, and it just causes sprawl and, and pollution. So the infill is really the key. The city of Reno has been an amazing partner. Um, you can see we do this as a team. There's a lot of people up there that help us as a region succeed in what we've done. And I would offer, um, uh, Eric mentioned retirement. All I'm looking for is a new opportunity. I think what we have is a, a uh, community on the rise. I'm proud to be a part of that. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next opportunity. And I, I just wanna thank this council for making my 12, nearly 12 years here, a real, a real honor. It's been an honor working with you and a real pleasure uh, to watch this community grow up. And now we're something that I think we can all be proud of. Thank you. Well, thank you. Your presentations are always fantastic. That was a tremendous job, Mr. Kazmierski. Um, and I love every time you come, you have wonderful news. You've been the biggest champion in this city for higher wages. Um, and it's really paid off. I remember when you started that initiative. You really listened to the entire community and heard what they had to say. And you went out there and said, we're really going to just focus on companies that want to pay people well. And so, um, great job. And you know what's sad? Unfortunately, good news doesn't make news, is what I've learned, unfortunately. And that's why there's a saying in the news industry, if it bleeds, it leads, right? And so, uh, we oftentimes don't get to tell the best and brightest stories, and I think Edon has been one of them. And I know we haven't always been easy up here. You know, we'll give you a little bit of pushback, but you uh, handled it like a champ. I want to say thank you so much for being a champion for small business, our startups, and everyone that has um, benefited from those incredible jobs you've brought here. This is what we call diversifying our economy that we've wanted so much because we're so predominantly gaming. This is what we've been talking about. This is why we're seeing... People stay here and our, and the kids from the university stay here and avoiding the brain drain is all because of this diversity. And that's what people need to know. We're no longer predominantly gaming. Uh, we, we've been very, very fortunate with your hard work. So thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, Councilman Dura, send yeah. it to you. Thank you. Uh, so nice to see you here, Mike. Um, it's been a privilege to serve on your um, Economic Development Board on EDON. Um, and I've learned a tremendous amount. And your presentations, as the mayor said, are always very fact-filled. Um, what I appreciate equally is that you have gone to bat for um, key public issues that you have seen that are tied to growth. And an example would be the schools. You played a, an important role on the WC1, getting the infrastructure uh, sales tax passed. You understood how important education is to economic development. And you went to solve that problem. Um, I saw you recently do the same thing on affordable housing. You've taken a position, how much we need it, how everyone has to step up. On uh, trails, you know, you've helped co-sponsor that because you know how important outdoor activities are to economic development and what new employers coming to our community are looking for. You know, they're not just looking for a place to live and have a house and go to work every day. They want to enjoy the place they're living. And that is a key part of it. So because you've been like that, I think you can shoulder this question I want to ask you, which is a tough one. And that is that you have, um, you know, been intimately inv of involved in what's going out at TRIC, at the Tahoe 
Reno Industrial Center. And um, the fact that they haven't allowed housing out there, right? That all the people have to come in from somewhere, uh, mostly here, you know, Reno and Sparks, but increasingly Fernley, and that you go out there. So um, recently, Tesla was, you know, uh, endorsed for their second uh, tranche, let's say, of uh, tax abatements. And so my question is really, from, from everything you've gathered and how involved you've been in, what can we do, you know, to deal with this issue? Because I don't, the issue of having to provide housing, education, uh, supplies, everything to all of these workers, this fantastic growth center, and yet it falls to us. We don't have their property tax, et cetera. So thoughts on that? You know, so you're in a critical moment before you leave and while you know what you know. Well, that's a great question, and it's a complex question. Uh, there have been so many studies done on it. Does it cost, you know, what does it cost to build a house and maintain a family from a government services perspective? Different studies out there, depending on the size of the family, depending on average wage, and what kind of employees are are you know, we bring you to the region. I can tell you we have done a study at the state level that for every Tesla employee, mm -hmm. nearly $10,000 in tax revenue is, is provided to local governments in the state. Most of that local governments through property taxes and sales taxes. So they're paying their employees, let's say 70,000, that in some way, shape, or form, they're providing that tax revenue, not to Story County. Right. That's a separation. Well, the sales tax coming into this region where they buy goods and services. Correct. So there's some, you know, there's a pretty strong influx there. And if you look at the studies that show where housing is actually a net cost to local governments, it's, right. it's based on a much lower wage and much less benefit from those employees in the sales tax side. So there is, there are questions there. It is a tough one to answer. I mean, Story County has basically um, managed without any support from Tesla. If you look at that second tranche that we're talking about, the $300 million, mm -hmm. if it's during that same period, they pay $900 million to the state in taxes, mostly equipment taxes, property taxes, other forms of tax. But $900 million, actually it's 983 if you mm -hmm. want the exact number, and we abated 300. So okay. for, the people, good to know. for the people that say, well, we don't need to give them any money, we're just taking a little bit less away from them. And so that's part of that, you know, how do we, good news, bad news, you always see the headlines, here's what we give them, um, that's the bad news. The good news is they're giving us, after we stop taking money away from them, 683000 or $683 million. So okay. I guess sometimes those questions get really complicated. Okay, thanks. All right, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Kazmierski. What a uh, big shoes we've got to fill as a region as you uh, head into your next opportunity. Um, I've been fortunate to know you probably for most of that 12 years. And at times we haven't always seen eye to eye because you ask the hard questions. Uh, sometimes our uh, view of the world has not been the same. But you know what I have appreciated is that we have remained good friends. Um, that we have the ability to have a conversation about hard topics and not shy away from it. And you're a person who never bullshitted a person in his life. And so I appreciate that about you. And I, I take the opportunity to say thank you for your service. I think Councilmember Dewar is really um, you know, good about highlighting the concern that happens in any economic development space, right? As states race to the bottom to attract people to their area, I think they um, sometimes it leaves people behind. And I think that's the concern that I have broadly that I want to make sure that we're addressing. And I think as Councilmember Dewar uh, mentioned, you know, you've done that in many ways by focusing on things like education, housing affordability, um, you know, good paying jobs that will help people to be able to afford the things that they need in life. So I think um, it's always a balancing act. And I think the other thing that has been true about uh, your time in serving EDON and our work together is that you have recognized that, right? It's never been like a, I don't know, we'll say drink from the Kool-Aid and ignore the, the difficult parts that come with a state's success. Um, and so I, I have the privilege now, after many years, Councilmember Dewar has allowed me to go over to Edon and be on the board, and I serve there now. And what I am amazed by is when I look at the room of folks who are generally there, they are people who are building in the community. They are creating jobs. They are making opportunities available for people. I suppose ultimately the question I have for you, Mr. Kazmierski, is 
what can we be doing better as a city? Like, what is it that we can do to do better in this space? Because we've added Mr. Edelstein, Mr. McArdle, we've taken efforts to work with the downtown Reno business partnership because those are an element of economic development, right? We've also played, moved into the arts and event space because we see them as being in synergy with each other. But help us understand what you think this council can be doing better. How can we be better uh, poised to deal with the next 20 year trajectory of this community? Well, I think you're doing a lot of it already. I mean, the arts is amazing. That's part of attracting culture and, and place. What we're doing on infill, um, we're making great progress in that area. I mean, there's always going to be the enemies that show up and beat you up. And I, and I apologize for them in advance because that's what they do. But our community is different now than it was 20 years ago. So being able to tolerate that kind of, you know, very uh, um, tunnel vision view, okay, I, I, I'll lose my, you know, th those people in our neighborhood or traffic or this or lights or, I mean, all the other things that they have a, a real concern for it's a, really a big deal to them but we're asking that you continue to do your broad view what does this community need to continue on this path to greatness and i think you're doing an amazing job i'm proud to be a part of this community i'm part proud of our relationship in the past i mean having our two board trustees here representing not only what you understand from an economic development perspective but the community at large is really talks to our community board and how our community board has the four leaders in the education community, our five local governments, and, and our business leaders at the table trying to make this community better. And you do that up here. It's a, I think your job's a whole lot tougher, so I thank you for your service. The word is service. I mean, at the end of the day, you are serving our community in a way that um, people don't often appreciate. So I want to thank you for that. All right, any other questions? Go ahead, Councilwoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for being here, Mike. Huge loss for us. Good luck on your adventures. Um, I have a question. We hear a lot, or, or we have uh, development coming to us, and we have growth coming to us, and some of the comments that we get are, we don't have the infrastructure, particularly the roads. We can't handle the traffic. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the balance of that in your position. So should we build all of the roads, and then we do the growth, or how does that work in to an overall regional plan because I know there's a lot of development going on and there is a lot of infrastructure coming so I'm just wondering from your perspective if you could shine a little light on how that might work well again that's back to the difficulty of your position I've yet to see a government get out in front of a problem I mean maybe with one exception here we're trying to do some some drain drain prevention here rarely does that happen and so Usually growth pays for the roads, but without the growth, you're not going to need the roads, or are you going to have the money to pay for the roads? So it's so often growth pays for the roads and the improvements. So it's sort of the chicken before the it's, egg. It's, so you got to have the growth and then the problem as the growth starts to pay for the problem. If we, stop, if we didn't add another you know, company in this community, we'd be in trouble because a lot of the revenue comes from that that new project, that new house, that new this, that new that, because, you know, let's face it, our property taxes on a 50-year-old house are nothing. You can't afford anything. If you wanted to try to be fair about it, you, we would change that. We don't. Our state law is the problem. The way we do revenue is a big part of the problem. But every government really has, a. before you build a road, in most cases, you have congestion. Very rarely. I mean, I, I was in Colorado, and they built a loop around Denver, and there was no... They're like, what the hell are you doing? Well, somehow they got out in front of that, and now it's all full of people and everything. So you see that every now and then where you can, you got some green space and, and you have a progressive mindset, you can do that, but we don't have much land to begin with. So we have, we have our set of challenges. I think you're doing a great job. It's a balancing act, and you know what you need going forward, but you also know, okay, this impacts the people that are living here now. So you have to do the back and forth. And, I'm glad you're doing it and not me. <laughs> Thank you. And then just a comment be, be, while we have you here as the ward representative for downtown um, for the second tranche of people that are going to be out east. Um, we have city center that we would love to see you come live in city center downtown and lots of other places here. So you're welcome. <laughs> well, living at all times. Living downtown is a big deal. Um, my daughter lives downtown. I'm paying 
The downtown partnership fee, it's money well spent in my view when I have you know, a 28-year-old um, young woman walking around the downtown at night. So I see that as part of where we're going as becoming a great community. But I remember back again, look back 12 years ago when you walked through the downtown, it was scary and it continues to get better. So we're excited about the downtown. It's always been a priority of Edon. We actually, one of our metrics, our board members know is how many companies are we helping relocate into the downtown? Because that helps revitalize and that helps bring in the live the people that live there, work there and play there. And then you, then you get that vibrant downtown. Exactly. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Kazmierski? No, I'm going to send it to Vice Mayor. Give me a motion, please. Um, move to uh, accept the report. All right. I have a motion from Vice Mayor. I have a second from uh, Councilwoman Taylor. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Great job. Thank you. And again, thank you for all you do. No, thank you for all you do. All right, Mike, we'll see you soon. Okay, we're going to move on to item C2, and then we are actually going to do item E1, and then we are going to go into lunch and attorney client privilege. So that's going to be the rundown. All right, I'm going to send it back to you. Madam Clerk, item C2, do you have any public comment? for this item. Madam Mayor, would you like to open the public hearing before we go into public yes, comment? That, I, that probably would be good. Thank you. Madam Clerk, was proper notice given any correspondence received on this item? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Proper notice, proper notice was given, and we did receive correspondence on this item as six letters, um, one in favor, five in opposition. Those have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are a part of the record. Additionally, we have um, three voicemails, but we do have some public commenters in the audience if you'd like to take them first. Okay, let's do that. Okay, our first public commenter today is Todd Renwick, followed by Jim Walker. All right, Todd, come on up. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor. I also want to give a shout out to Madam Mayor Sutton for the day, but she <laughs> didn't stick around, but... Uh, and council members. My name is Todd Renwick for the record. I represent myself. Uh, I'm a resident here at 90 Irving Park Circle in Reno. Um, and I understand you're gonna hear uh, an amendment for zoning change uh, today. We, we understand what the zoning change is for, uh, but I understand that today's hearing is for the zoning change, which brings us uh, a lot of concern as residents. It kind of puts us in a pickle. We understand that they want to put uh, or open up a daycare, uh, pre-K, pre so a preschool, um, which there's already an existing school there, but they just want to add a preschool, 100% for that. Um, <clears throat> that's not here, that's not what the concern is for me here today. My concern is the rezoning of this property in our community uh, that we live in because we don't know what's going to happen afterwards, right? You rezone this, what, what comes next? Uh, what comes if this property sells? So uh, we, we want, I want to you to hear the concerns um, about that from at least me. Um, I don't want to speak for other folks in my uh, community, but uh, myself. Um, again, something we think is so simple <laughs> that should be allowed without having to go through a zoning change uh, when you look at a pre-K um, piece to this already existing uh, school that, that resides on this property. So again, um, I hope that, that this concern um, is heard. I hope that there may be some things that can be done rather than having to go through uh, the rezoning piece for this amendment. Um, but again, thanks for your time. All right, thank you so much. Our next public commenter is Jim Walker. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council. My name is Jim Walker. I also live on Irving Park Circle. and. Uh, just to kind of keep it simple, the uh, you know, it's our understanding that it's not uncommon for churches to be zoned PF. This current zoning is SF8. What's uncommon is in our neighborhood, 
Uh, it's just, you know, a small little neighborhood, and this church is tucked up in the corner at the end of a street. So there's one way in and one way out. And that's not really the issue. Um, you know, having said that, and like Todd said, uh, I 100% support the school. I met with Tamara. She seems like a wonderful person. I think her intentions are pure, and I think her uh, goal of having the school is admirable. It's just super hard for us to understand that we have to go through an entire zoning change to accommodate eight, you know, up to eight pre-K kids, where as under the current zoning, 100 feet away, you can have up to 12 kids in a single family residence. So it just doesn't make a, a ton of sense. And then I, you know, I wonder about the, the code that governs child care and does allow a caregiver to give, you know, up to 12, well, two caregivers, 12 in a single family home. And is that really the intent when there's a facility basically next door that would serve the purpose probably better than a single family home? but it's not allowed. So I just you know, wanted to kind of stress this is not a not in my backyard kind of thing for us. It's really all about the zoning. We think the SF-8 is appropriate now. Again, we would really like for Tamara to be able to do her project because the PK com, pre-K component is important for her. Uh, but we want to, you know, preserve the integrity of our neighborhood, not only for the current residents, but for future generations. Okay, Good thank comments. you. Thank you. We have Tara Webster via Zoom. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. We can please state your name for the record and begin speaking. My name is Tara Webster. I am a resident at 810 Stoker Avenue. Um, I apologize, I can't be in person. I'm actually at home taking care of my newborn, uh, so you might hear him in the background. Um, but I am uh, calling in today in support of the uh, Desert Peach Montessori uh, rezoning for uh, the preschool to have younger age children, um, especially being that I am a new mom myself. Um, I also am a board member for Desert Peach Montessori um, and am very, uh, very proud of uh, Tamara for um, her efforts in opening this school, which is much needed in our area. Um, as many of you know, preschool is uh, definitely underfunded and uh, underserviced in a lot of communities and uh, Desert Peach is something that our community needs. Um, it's going to bring equitable access to uh, pre-K um, to a different, many different families in our neighborhood. Um, it's great that it's you know a small school that will be serving a very specific age group. Um, I am for the, the rezoning uh, for this need for for this reason, um, but I do share and understand um, you know concerns from other people in the community of what the rezoning would mean for other uh, businesses coming in, it would be great if we could just open school for this age group, you know, without having to go through the process of rezoning and jumping through so many hoops. But um, if it's something that's necessary, then I am in full support of it. Um, and just really hope that you consider, uh, you know, everything that all of the hard work that Tamara has put in as a long-term educator um, and just someone who wants to give back to our community. Ms. Webster, thank you. I know you're an educator yourself, and um, I think someone who's interested in um, Reno City life, I think you applied for the Ward 5 vacancy. So it's nice to have you in chambers, even if only virtually. Yes, thank you very much. Have a great day. Madam Clerk, is that all we have for public comment today? Thank you, Vice Mayor. That is um, the close of public comment. I would like to state for the record, um, Sean Sullivan was here earlier. He did intend to speak, but wasn't able to stay. Um, and he was just voicing his opposition to this item. Thank you so much. Let's welcome our staff forward for a presentation at this time. I'm going to go ahead and I was introduce say, the can item. We have the ordinance. So this is an ordinance introduction, Bill Number 7234, Case Number LDC 23-00036, First Congressional Church Zoning Map Amendment, Request for a Zoning Map Amendment from Single Family Residential, 8 Units Per Acre, SF8 Zoning District to Public Facilities, PF Zoning District, 
The plus or minus 3.40 acre project site is located at the terminus of Sunnyside Drive, approximately 150 feet west of its intersection with Novelly Drive. Subject site has a master plan land use designation of single family neighborhood, SF mm -hmm. Ward 5. And I apologize, Vice Mayor Reese, we do have three voicemails we need to play as well. Oh, thank you so much. I apologize. Ms. Brock, we'll get you up here in just a second. Can I ask, Madam Clerk, before you play those, did we go through the notice requirements? Have, was proper notice given? Okay, great. And then were there disclosures required of any council members? Uh, Madam Mayor did not ask if there were disclosures from the body, so if there are, we take them at this time. Okay, seeing none, let's go to the uh, voicemails. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Cecilia Pierce. I live at 511 Sunnyside Drive, and I'm one of the property owners within 750 feet of the First Congregational Church, which is asking for a zoning amendment so they can start a daycare facility up in their uh, adjunct building. Many of us on Sunnyside Drive are opposed to this zoning change. It opens us up to all kinds of problems within our neighborhood. I cannot attend the council meeting on Wednesday, so I'm sending a voicemail to indicate that along with others on Sunnyside Drive and Irving Circle, that I am opposed to this zoning change. There has to be a better way for the preschool to have a facility at the church adjunct building without a public uh, zoning change, which causes all sorts of, well, it opens up a can of worms is what it does. Okay, hopefully this will get to you. It is Monday the 20th, about 1.20 in the afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye. Hi, I'm calling to comment on case LDC 23-00036. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Rod Hallecky. My wife Stacy and I have been homeowners and residents on Sunnyside Drive for the past 29 years. We live one block down the street from First Congregational Church. And uh, we're speaking to you today regarding the proposed zoning change for the church from the current SF8 to PF. Here's the statement um, I want to read to you regarding this proposed change. Now the following are not my words, although they represent our concerns. These are the actual comments of Reno Planning Commission Chairman Alex Belto when he voted against the proposed rezoning amendment at the March 1st Planning Commission meeting. Explaining his no vote, the chairman said, quote, I'm a little concerned to evaluate what the purpose is going to be as opposed to just the change. And there's some allowed uses which, while we may be able to condition them, they'd still be allowed and those allowed uses are a little concerning to me. I'm concerned with changing, changing the zoning, especially given that there's another parcel nearby. And when we change this zoning, that parcel is going to be able to point to this change in zoning and say it's now compatible because there's no longer a reliance on a grandfathered use because now the zoning has actually changed. So I'm a little concerned as to how that may play out. I struggle with what the allowed uses are and how it will change, unquote. Well, Madam Mayor and Council Members, we believe Chairman Velto's comments and vote express both a very legitimate concern and cautionary foresight in this matter. And his concerns also represent our primary concern as longstanding neighbors and homeowners. Please know that uh, our opposition is not in regard to the school accommodating a 35-student private school. The overwhelming majority of the neighbors, including Stacy and I, support the school. And as you're aware, the school was given a conditional use permit last year to operate as a primary and secondary school, which is allowed under the current SF8 zoning. Today's zone change request is based upon the school's commendable desire to include a preschool contingent in their student population, which can only be approved if the zoning is changed to PF. 
it's unfortunate that the seeming hair splitting of the zoning regulations create this conflict, but they nonetheless do. However, changing the church's zoning will open the door for possible down the road changes that could adversely affect the character, simplicity and functionality of our entire neighborhood, just as Commission Chair Velto noted. Please, which has served us well for so many years, please vote to maintain the original design and purpose of our SF8 zoning, which has served us well for so many years and we hope for the years to come. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Susan Hastings and I live at 1070 Novelli Drive and I wish to comment for the proposed hearing on March 22nd for the City Council um, on the proposed zoning change for the First Congregational Church of Reno on Sunnyside Drive in order to create a Montessori school. I'm sure you have already heard comments stating that the residents of this neighborhood are very much opposed to this zoning change. We see it as opening the door for future unwanted development and destruction of this neighborhood. I could also address the many duplicitous, erroneous, and misleading facts presented in the proposal for this school. But instead, I would like to address the council directly. You have chosen for whatever reason to become a public servant. Public meaning you serve the people. Not negotium servant meaning you serve a business. Not corporatus servant meaning you serve a corporation. Not developer servant meaning you serve a developer. Public servant elected by the people. Not hired by the board. Elected by the people. The position of the leader is not an inherited position to be passed on to the chosen one of the current leader, but elected by the people. And the people of this neighborhood are not children who don't know what is good for them. And they have told you that they are opposed to this zoning change for this proposed school. We are asking you to vote against it. To the church, I would say, if you need to make money, find another way. Increase your ministry. That would be novel. To the Montessori school, I would say, if this is the only way you can have a place for your school, then find another place that is already properly zoned for your school but do not seek to impose upon the people of this neighborhood a change that they feel could result in the future destruction of the tenor and makeup of this neighborhood. Thank you. Madam Clerk, I think that's all the public comment at this time. So I'll close public comment and bring it back to the body. But let me also ask, will we have first a staff presentation and then is there an applicant presentation? Is that um, the order you've got, Madam Clerk? That is correct. That's our normal standard. We would do staff presentation to give you an update on the process um, and on the plan that went to Planning Commission. If you so choose to have an applicant presentation, we can do that as well, um, depending on the need of the body. Okay, no problem. I'm going to turn it back over to Madam Mayor. I just want to make sure I knew where we were in the process. That would normally be our process. But Madam Mayor, the chair is, of course, yours, as okay, it always thank is. thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, you ready? <laughs> I am. Hello, thank Ms. you. Brock. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. For the record, Leah Brock, Associate Planner with the City of Reno Development Services. This afternoon, I am presenting the application for the zoning map amendment for the first congregational church. This item was heard by the Planning Commission on March 1st of this year. The Planning Commission did vote to recommend approval with five in favor and one opposed. To orient you to the site, um, it is a 3.4 acre parcel located north of the I-80 and northwest of the Rayleighs located at the intersection of Keystone and 7th Street. 
Today's request is for a zoning map amendment to change the zoning from single family residential eight units per acre or SF8 to the public facility zoning district or PF. Key issues related to this request are the compatibility of that proposed zoning with the surrounding zoning districts and conformance with the current zoning code. Approval of this zoning map amendment would allow for the expanded public facility uses uh, like those granted to other religious assemblies in the public facility zoning. And those uses, like many of the other public facility zonings, are surrounded by single family residential, which means that that residential adjacency will trigger a requirement for either a site plan review or a conditional use permit. Either one of those processes would allow the opportunity for staff to review the proposed use of the property or the expansion on the property and mitigate any potential concerns. According to the assessor's records, the First Congregational Church of Reno has existed on this site since approximately 1959. Staff does have records of continuous use since that time. The site is developed with an assembly building, an office building, and a multi-purpose building. In the photo you see on the screen, that multi-purpose building is in the front right there, and the religious assembly building is in the back. Last year, in uh, about November of 2022, a conditional use permit was approved for a small Montessori school with 24 children to be located in that multi-purpose building. The PF zoning district is intended to provide for public and quasi-public facilities and services. Primary uses include public institutions, cultural centers, religious institutions, government centers, libraries, hospitals, schools, and utility installations. In contrast, the SF8 zoning district is intended primarily to accommodate single family residential uses. Here on the board, you can see a use, uh, a list of the uses that would be allowed in SF8 versus PF. Most notably, I want to point out that single family residential would be allowed in both of those districts. However, while multifamily residential is allowed in the SF8, it would not be allowed in the PF zoning district. Schools, primary and secondary, religious assemblies, and minor and major utilities would be allowed in both districts. And office and professional services, daycare centers, or hospitals that offer overnight care would not be allowed in the SF8, but could be allowed in that public facility zone. After the Planning Commission um, expressed concerns about the uses of that PF zone, uh, I went on and I kind of did an analysis on surrounding public facility zoning in this area. So here in the middle of the map, you can see that arrow with the circle. That is the subject site. And then what I did is I went on and I looked at all the public facility in this, the public facility zoning in this area, which you can see on the map in blue. And then I highlight what the use of that property is. And what I found is that most of the existing public facility zoning in this area is schools and religious assemblies. Uh, I also found there were a few minor utilities, several parks, a couple cemeteries, and one medical use. Uh, directly to the south there, you'll see the word church, and right above that is a small blue patch. That is also a religious assembly that was surrounded by single family residential um, that did apply for a zoning map amendment back a few years ago from SF6 to the PF, and they were granted that. So we can see that there have been religious facilities in the general area that have already made this conversion to PF. Um, also, I do want to point out that most of the PF zoning is surrounded by residential zoning. Uh, it is actually very common for PF to be completely surrounded by residential. Uh, again, what I read to you earlier about the public facility zoning districts and it allowing for public institutions and religious assemblies and schools, that's directly out of Reno Municipal Code. So the public facility zoning district is actually intended specifically for this kind of use and generally surrounded by single family residential. Also, 
Most of these PF zoning districts that are existing are accessed through single family residential neighborhoods and many of them do not have secondary access. Uh, that secondary access could be something that's going to be required for a use that might be explored down the way and if they cannot provide that secondary access um, then that use could not be approved. So I just want to point that out. Get back to that map, sorry. Um, on the board are the recommend the zoning map the zoning map amendment recommended findings. The planning commission did review these findings and did recommend approval of this zoning map because this request does conform to all the requirements listed in NRS and RMC, and it also conforms with the master plan. Uh, it conforms with that single family neighborhood. PF is allowed uh, and allowed under that land use designation, and this could be considered an underutilized property. It does allow for neighborhood connections, and it also does provide for a neighborhood gathering place. That concludes my presentation. The recommended motion is on the board, and I am available for questions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We are always a fantastic job. Thank you. Really appreciate your background and knowledge. Madam okay, I would love, and at this time, if we could have the applicant come up and give their presentation. So staff won't, isn't available for questions at this time, Madam yeah. Mayor? We will do it after this. So then we only get six minutes for all parties? I, I want to make sure everyone sees and hears the whole picture. So go ahead. Okay. Madam Mayor, City Council members, thank you very much. I am the hearing impaired person who has the microphone up there. So um, I am Rick Odinsky. I'm the council president of First Council Congregational Church. This is Paul Urban, a prior council president and currently the secretary. This is Tamara Hopkins, and sitting over there is Kelly Casey. They are the primaries behind the Montessori School. Um, our church was formed in 1871. We've been in existence for 152 years. Uh, we moved to the, we built the current building, the one that is housing the Montessori School now, in 1958. So we've been there for 65 years. The reason we moved there was um, we were under threat of condemnation um, to have our church facility um, uh, condemned, condemned through eminent domain um, because Sewell's um, uh, wanted to move their uh, Mayfair uh, store. You've been here for a long time, so you know what it, was, what it was. We were on the corner of Fifth and uh, Virginia. We moved out to where we are now because it was the outskirts of Reno in 1958. Okay, and that was the extent of it. Uh, most of the houses out there uh, were developed long after we moved there. Um, our congregation is comprised significant, of a significant portion of current or former educators. So our thrust in the community has typically been with education. We've supported both of the local elementary schools, Elmcrest and Grace Warner, uh, through direct support, through book drives, um, through um, um, holiday meals, different things like that. We've housed um, this current Montessori school. We had one in 1990 to 1996 uh, that outgrew our facility, so moved on out. And we've had a couple of um, co-op preschools um, in the um, our, what we call our Christian education building going along that, that way. Um, specifically, we need this um, we are working under a grant obtained by the Montessori School from the Children's Cabinet. They are the ones that are funding um, our application here uh, for this. Um, their grant is specific to just doing this. If it is not approved, then we lose the grant and we will not be able to move forward. So um, I ask you, please, um, uh, approve the recommendation of the uh, Planning Commission and um, I'll turn it over to Tamara, who will give you some background on the school itself and what its thrust is. All right. Hi, Tamara. Hi. Um, thank you for having me, uh, Tamara Hopkins, for the record. I feel like an expert at this now, and I've been <laughs> yeah. here a few times, not in front of city council. Um, but uh, there's a 30% deficit for early childhood here in northern Nevada. Yeah. Um, I have been a long time... Uh, early childhood advocate 
preschool students, uh, families who need preschool, they need a place like this. People have said, why not go to another place? Well, I looked for a year, and I couldn't find another place that wasn't a strip mall. And so um, the reason the Children's Cabinet is funding this is because there's nowhere for us to go. Another reason is because this facility is so beautiful. It was set up as a Montessori school in the past. I have no ill intention for the neighborhood. I live on Sunnyside Drive, uh, just down from the school, and there are neighbors that do support this. Um, I just want to open a preschool. <laughs> it shouldn't be this hard. So um, I'm open for questions. I know it isn't about the usage necessarily, but um, thank you for taking the time to listen to what the usage would be in this particular situation. I mean, I plan on retiring in this place, so it isn't going to be a short-term thing. We're going to stay there for as long as we can. So um, in essence, what we're expect uh, hoping to do is expand it from 24 to 32 students. Um, that should minimize the traffic impact, although we do have um, 27 different groups, 12-step um, groups, community crafting clubs, different business groups, um, Toastmasters, Girl Scouts, all meeting on the property of the church. So that brings traffic in and out on a seven day uh, basis. So, and that's what, I'll, and then sometime back, the Public Works Department reconfigured Keystone to put in two bike lanes. And when they did, they went from four lanes to two lanes and really caused traffic to back up. So now people are cutting through by um, Royal Drive down through Sunnyside um, to beat the traffic. And that's what's presented or uh, caused a lot of the traffic back up. Mm -hmm. So um, some of it is applicable to our uh, usage, but most of it is um, the reconfiguration process. So thank you. Okay. Do you have any, any, you. any specific okay. questions we can ask? Anything you would like to add? No? Yes. Oh, oh, no. Um, the thing I would add is we're, we're not asking for z rezoning to public facilities because we want to have different facilities. It's because we want to have this school, and according to city ordinances, it has to have public facility zoning. You know, if we could do it without the change, we would do it. Thank All right, you. thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, that being said, I'm gonna send it back to the body and I only see one hand up here, but I, I know other council members uh, want to dive in. I'm gonna send it to Councilman Dewar. Yeah, ahead. thank you. Um, first of all, shout out to Paul Urban. Great to see you. Um, worked with Paul for a long, long time in flooding. Great, great person. Um, here's, I'm gonna boil it down in a nutshell instead of going all over the place. I heard no one talk about traffic. What I did hear them uh, express concern about was the future of what comes after the church. You already mentioned that the Montessori, uh, first Montessori school was there for about six years and then moved on because they outgrew the site. I would expect, even though um, Tamara expects to retire there, that may not happen because you may be so successful that you too may outgrow the site. Mm -hmm. But let me just continue. I only got a few moments. Um, there, When I heard Paul say, uh, this is the way the staff have told us we have to do it, we have to change the zoning in order to do the school. And I beg to differ. There is another way. And that other way is SPD, a, a specific plan development, which um, puts the use, it marries up the use with the zoning, and it gives the people that are concerned about the future the comfort to be able to embrace what you're doing. I mean, that is the very, that's why we brought it back as a zoning category for exactly these kind of situations that are small sites, this is three and a half acres essentially, to, to 10 acres, that range, one to 10 acres, even a third acre, um, not the big ones which require PUD. So there is a way. And so I guess I have to ask our staff, when people come in, like here's, when people come in and they have this issue and you give them, here's what you have to do to get your issue addressed, do you talk to them about SPD, and did you in this case? Yes, the answer is yes, and I just want to clarify one thing. So the school is allowed in the SF-8 with approval of a minor conditional use permit. Right. So 
So it's not the school that's in question. It's it's the daycare center. Right. But yes, to answer your question, um, first we talked about what it would take to do the school and what it would take to do a daycare center. And this was probably over a year ago when I originally had this conversation, they decided that they wanted to go forward with only the school part of it. So we went through the conditional use permit process. And you did that. Yep. And we, and I did that. Got issued. Yep. And, and, and we discussed that, that should they want to expand that in the future, they would need to come forward with either a PF or an SPD. They looked at the the, the options and the SPD is quite a bit more expensive. In uh, what way? Just a price to apply? Price. What, price and how much? Um, I can get those numbers for well, you. Well, I mean, I'm just trying to understand quite a bit more. I, it's, it's almost double. It's about 8000 um, CFA quoted 30000 and so they did get a quote from uh, from one of the local uh, uh, developer, no, I'm sorry, not developers, consulting firms that said that they could help them with it on the SPD, and that quote was for 30000 So instead of moving forward with the SPD, they said, look, let's do the Public Facility Zoning District because Reno Municipal Code literally says that this is the appropriate use for this site. Um, well, I'm out of time, so I'll just say this. At my NAB last night, a similar project came forward where the church that's on SF3 wanted to go to public facility, and one of the reasons was they didn't want to get future building permits. They just want to be able to build by right, and I'd like to understand, you know, going forward if that's what the applicant is hoping for to build more buildings to without having to come through the permitting process. So. All right, thank you. Vice Mayor, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ms. Brock or Ms. Foos, whoever wants to address the question, I don't want to use planning speak. I, I want for a minute just to talk as people talk. There's some mystification in government that occurs, and we all start talking in code and language, and I feel like this is an example of that. I have lived in the Northwest Reno most of my adult life. I went to Clayton Middle School. My children attended Clayton Middle School. I know Sunnyside Drive. I know this church well. They are doing great things there. They're good people. They're wanting to be good neighbors. I want to understand how do we allow what they're trying to do, which it sounds like is to add six little humans to educational opportunities without all of the planning speak. And I, I realize that I am... Um, and I'm not being unkind to you, Ms. Brock. You are a phenomenally talented planner. Your team and Ms. Foos are doing exactly what we've set out for you to do. But at some point in time, there comes a moment where government and people kind of clash about this talk and also about why we cannot find a solution, right? Uh, our job, I think, as council members, especially when it gets to this level, which has been time, effort, energy, money, work on your behalf, is not to say no. I mean, we're trying to find the ways to say yes. Now, sometimes the yes is impossible to do, and we can also disagree on what the ultimate outcome is. Some people may line up on one side, others on another, but fundamentally, I'm just saying, is Ms. Dewar right that we could have gone down that route? Is there another route for us to allow the six additional um, little humans to be educated while also preserving the integrity and character of this neighborhood. This is a cute neighborhood. It has always been challenging. Sunnyside, I've had friends who lived on it over the years, and I always would like drive into the church parking lot to turn around as a, as a teenager. I, it's hard. The, the, the whole street is. It's unique that there's a church back there. Um, this whole neighborhood has a number of churches throughout it um, that are all in different strange little plots of land and next to each other. I think up on uh, Kings Row and Wyoming, we have like four or five of the world's major denominations that are represented. I mean, I, I want to find a yes, a happy medium that allows people to live in peace in their neighborhood, but also allow the little humans to be educated. Help us to do that. Okay. So thank you, Councilman Reese. Um, in non-planning speak, uh, I have been working with these applicants for 14 months. As a single mother that relocated to Reno with a three-year-old that lives in Northwest Reno, I, I understand the problem with finding childcare. And, and I have combed through our code in every way possible to try to find a loophole that would allow these people to do what they're trying to do. But there, there isn't. 
The only option is for them to do a rezoning. And like I said, we gave them the option of a public facility or an SPD, and the bottom line is that they opted for the, for the public facilities because the SPD was too expensive. Isn't that so true, Lee? I forgot. Yeah. I forgot. That yes. is why you came here. And you're yes. a single mom, and we had this conversation yes. about how crazy uh, expensive childcare is. It is. It is. Yes. And so um, I'm, I'm glad that they had to work with you because you could clearly understand and can be very sympathetic. Yes. I will just say one thing. Here's where I get frustrated, and I've seen it with business, and this is where I think we fail as a council and also at staff. Um, you guys actually are much smarter than we are. Uh, we, we're you know, just citizens off the street. We sit down, and then we're trying to learn about you know, what, what are these different um, codes and NRS. And I mean, like this is a whole other education that we get up here the years that we serve, um, quite on, honestly. It is remarkable because you guys actually have the background you go to school you're really the expert the experts in this so then we spend a lot of time trying to catch up and figure out what you're what you're talking about and how do we learn and really it's like it's a little painful as we go because we don't really get any training whatsoever the um, community sort of you know puts us in these seats and then away we go and we don't understand how to navigate. And that's where you guys have a lot of power at the staff level. And we feel like fish out of water, quite honestly. And it really helps us when you come to us and say, hey, we've got something right here in the code that really needs to change because I'm seeing a lot of people come in with these frustrations. I see it every day with business license. And um, God love them up there. I know they're doing great work, but it's very antiquated still. It's painful with small business. I'm still banging my head with the cell on that I can't register a business online. And it, I mean, it's a joke. It's a, it's a damn joke for small businesses, right? Like I get crazy and I don't want to go up there and scream and yell because it's really not their fault. It's just that um, sometimes the, you know, the tools that we have are antiquated and we're, you know, it, it, that's a whole other story, but and I'm going off on a tangent, but my point is when you guys see things that you know that this council can fix, because I think this is where we, we are broken, and we get this code book, and I, I've seen it many times before, where someone comes in my office from staff and they go, here it is. It's not in the code book, so we can't do it. Not in the code book, we can't do it. I hate that. I hate that more than anything. It drives me crazy because things change. We evolve. Situations are different. And so not one size fits all. And I think to Vice Mayor Reese's point, you know, these are just children that want to go to school and, and get an education. And, and thank goodness for the church, for all the work that you're doing in the community and opening up your hearts and, and um, your congregation to so many people. And we really appreciate that. Really appreciate that. Um, and you also have to feel sympathetic for the neighbors. Because I would be worried what happens to the future, as Mr. Renwick said. I think he made very valid arguments. And and I don't know, what, what was your name, sir? Jim Walker. Yeah, Jim, you made great points that I never even would have thought of. Um, so, I, you know, I think to your point, uh, you know, you should absolutely have concern. So I, I understand that. So my time is wrapping up. And, and Leah, don't take this personal at all. I just have you to look at, so I'm kind of... But um, really, I'm looking up at Doug and JW and everyone over here. But that's my frustration is the code books. But I hope um, from your, your guys' standpoint, when you th see things that are challenging or frustrating, I don't care if it's even in the city attorney's office. Come to us and say, hey, Madam Mayor or wh whoever on council, help us, help us make the government work better for people. So anyway, thanks so much. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Taylor, and then I'll go to Councilwoman Breckis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A couple questions. Thank you, Leah, for being here. This is a tough decision, but we're up here to make tough decisions. Um, thank you for all the work that you've done with this applicant. I did reach out to Chairman uh, Velto after I heard some of the comments, and his comment was to me was maybe he didn't get all the information that he needed. So I think um, that that was important to note. The questions that I have are based on what I heard. Um, can apartments be built here if it goes to PF? No. What is the protection to the neighbors based on residential adjacency if it is zoned PF? What happens? What, how do we alleviate some of their concerns? 
So as I stated before in the presentation, but I'll re I want to reiterate this again and again, they cannot expand any existing use nor start a new use. So Tamara cannot start the daycare portion of her, of her school until they apply for a site plan review, which is a 30-day administrative review process that would come to us in the planning department. We would send out public notices, a post, uh, a hearing, um, uh, we'll send out public notices, we would ask, we would solicit public comment, and then within 30 days we would make a decision and we can condition that approval. So again, if she so comes... let me ask you something, I, I'm yes. just trying to get... What if, what if the church sells and that is zoned PF and yes. office and professional services want to come in? Can they do that? They they can uh, based on based on just that that limited information an office or professional services could come in and um, uh, and they would uh, be allowed to develop but they have to go through that site plan review process for residential adjacency all of the residential adjacency standards would be applied if there were additional concerns from the neighbors or anybody else or staff at that time we can apply conditions at that time to mitigate those impacts unlike we can do we, we with a zoning map amendment we can't apply any conditions to mitigate any impacts because we don't have a use yet Correct. but when they come so forward I, for that use left, so I yes. want to ask Mr. Adensky a question please do you, sir, um, you, your church has been there for over 60 years, right? The, yeah, we've been on that site for 65 years. Do you have, based on some of the concerns we heard, do you have any intention or have, do you see any, any potential where you're going to be selling the church anytime soon? No, uh, um, we don't. We've only, in, in the 152 years we've been here, we've moved twice. And the, the second time when we moved to the current site was only because we were under threat of condemnation, eminent domain, um, for the downtown property. We had prime property downtown. When I met with the neighbors, they had a concern, a valid concern that maybe yeah, there was there, a development coming in, or if a developer came in, do you have you had those discussions, or do you see that? Yeah, there? and we did. We um, a week ago Friday, we uh, had a uh, open house. Uh, community forum with the neighbors explaining and what our purpose was. We have no intention of moving or going. We didn't have any intention of moving in 1957 um, until we were forced out of the property. Thank you um, very much. Pardon? Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Councilman Beckus, go ahead. Yeah, Ms. Brock. So I appreciate the staff history because um, I used to be staff here and I remember some hearings and some efforts by the church to go in different directions. And you know, one thing you brought up, the utilize, underutilized property master plan policy. And to me, um, while you use that as support for this zoning change, I use it in my mind, along with the history of, you know, from the 2022 you know, tenant that they just brought in, the much large building that's very unoccupied, then all the other history from the amphitheater to be suggestive that the property um, could be one influxed in the future when some of these other PF uses could come in. And hospital is one. My colleague just talked about offices. That gives me concern, particularly for a property that I count has shares a property line with 25 other mature single-family residential properties. Now, you state accurately, I think, that um, any development here goes through a site plan review for residential adjacency. That's a fairly recent shift, probably a shift when, you know, all the other public facilities you used to go look at, because those used to all, always be about a, uh, a, a, a planning commission special use permit on the uses. So if it's public facility and a use wants to come in a new one, like an office or the hospital or something maybe the church wants to bring in, the use would be analyzed by the planning commission. What I'm seeing you represent is a site plan review, which is really just looking at development standards. And so the use is off the table. And that doesn't give the protection 
that I think is required with this public facility zoning district. And uh, that's why I voted fairly recently, and I'll tell my colleagues that, for a church over on Booth Street in Idlewild because it looked like it was a runaround to let them do something that they could have done anyway. And that was problematic to me. And it's not like I did not spend a lot of time during the zoning code update, and that is something that we have to do because it's our code of ordinances, their laws we set, to say we needed a little more certainty on the professional facilities zoning district because anything could come in. You know, we could say we're going to put a police substation here or Washoe County or a charter school, a growth industry of charter school could, you know, make an offer the church can't refuse and and um, build a charter school there. We did not put those <coughs> procedures in the zoning code. And so what we have is, as my one colleague said, the SPD, we have this site plan review that to me does not give certainty because it doesn't get to changed uses, it only gives you know very limited jurisdiction of review. And um, we didn't decide, we got rid of the specialist permit. So I, I think your argument that it's underutilized suggests that, you know, I don't know, maybe their their clergy numbers are, are shrinking, suggests that this public facility is opening up a whole lot of a lot of opportunities, and maybe that's what Mr. Belto was getting at. You didn't have your planning commission minutes in here. Even if you have them ready for the day of a hearing, I'd like to see them on my desk. So um, I am struggling. One question was, why don't some of the MFs allow churches and daycare centers? Or the MRs, we call them now? Uh, multifamily zoning district? Yeah. Um, I'd have to double check, but I believe that I, I don't have the code in front of me. Okay. I well, don't wanna, I, I mean, you know, I don't if you don't have it on, I know it's new, you don't have it on top of your head, but I see between the single family and the very massive public facility some gradations that would allow child care centers. And I'm just wondering why you didn't look at some of those. You've explained why you didn't suggest that SPD, but it's always the applicant's responsibility to come through. We're not here to negotiate. We go up or down. You do an analysis. All right, Councilwoman Brecka, sorry to cut you off. It's over a minute. We always trying to give you a little extra time. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Councilwoman Dewar. So, so I want to understand, Leah, um, as quick as you can, what the difference is, where they met it. You said I keep hearing about six more children. Is there a limit? on a size is that what we're dealing with no there's no limit on the size no and basically washoe county is the one that permits the daycare facilities okay so based on washoe county they would allow there's a few different things but they would allow one child per 35 square feet so if we're going to rezone to a public facilities we have to look at it sort of from that but again we're not analyzing the use here the use would come up and at a later time but again what is tripping the threshold then if it's not the extra children Daycare centers are not permitted in the SFA. I thought there was already one, no? No. So that building was originally used as a daycare center at Montessori school, but they lost that use, which is why I call it an underutilized property. What do you mean we have, lost the use? What does that they, mean? They discontinued the use for over a year, which means they lost their non-conforming status. So it was like grandfathered in a use? It could have been had it been continued. Uh, okay. So in order to continue it? then they still qualify, but if it lapses, then they no longer get that and you can't bring it back. Exactly. What, let me ask you, what's the reason for that? Um, well, that's our policy for non-conforming uses. So we allow them to continue to operate. If they discontinue use for a period of one year, then they lose that essentially grandfathered pre-existing But clause. is the reason for doing that just so that, um, I'm trying to think, so that, that y y I, I guess I don't understand why you would, allow a continued use as long as it stays. And we have seen that before, like I think in other businesses, right? We, so people pick them up right away so they continue the use. Exactly. Okay. And and there can be some other triggers there in business licensing and things like that. So I don't want to say that that's all encompassing because it's not. Um, but in this particular case, had the Montessori and daycare continued in that 7,000 square foot building and not had a discontinued use, then they would still be allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's again why I say underutilized property because we've got an empty 7,000 square foot building that was originally built to be a daycare or a school. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to ask for my two minutes back if I may, back to the clerk. <laughs> and um, so here's to follow up on the mayor's questioning line, gaming. 
So they have to continue their use or they lose it. And so what they've been doing is setting up the trailer, doing the gaming the for 24 hours. Open the door. Right? Did you see that? Mm-hmm. I did. Continuing the use so they can keep their their license in play, so to speak, right? So do we allow that or not allow that with other uses? I, I think that 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 there is a planning policy for non-conforming uses, but I think keeping that gaming license might be a separate issue that's not a planning issue. Oh. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, anyway, I guess, you know, I'm holding my head because here's, just to the applicants, here's what, what I've been through. I've been through leaning in, hearing what the people say, being very sympathetic and supportive, proposing a zoning change, approving it, and then having them change their mind, whether they've got an eminent domain, a better offer, a charter school. We, we went round and round here about a charter school that was located on a very difficult site. And we just had to say, as much as we love children, arts, everything, we had to say no. Um, and they found another spot, okay? And we offered them many ways to go. But I guess my question to, to our staff, Let's say the applicant says, you know what, we've heard what the council said. And we would like to go that SPD route to give certainty to our neighbors, be good neighbors. Um, what would be involved in changing that? It would be the same process as what they've gone through for the zoning map change. So they would need to, they would need to have that SPD handbook written, submit for the zoning map change, for the SPD, uh, we would do review, send out courtesy notices, go to the Planning Commission for a recommendation, then back here to the council for the first reading and the second reading. Well, you're saying start again. Yes. So, but I guess I'm saying they're midway, and I'll use an example. It's up on the agenda next. A, a group came in with MF30. They they heard what the neighbors had to say. They, they themselves said, we're going to downzone to MF21. They heard more what the neighbors had to say after a public meeting, and they downzoned to MF14, still infill, still meeting the needs, still providing housing, and it's a great example of infill. Mm -hmm. But they listened, and they modified during the process. And I'm asking, can they not modify during the process? Why do they have to start back at the Monopoly board back at zero at go? Well, let me let me back up. So if a decision is made by this council today, then mm -hmm. they're gonna have to they're gonna have to start over. Um, had they changed their mind back a few weeks ago and wanted to do that, we probably could have tried to pick up the process. I'm gonna let Ms. Okay. Answer, answer. I'm looking for a path forward. Can yep. I just ask one thing? Why not whenever that use expired? Why couldn't it be of the discretion of the council to come back and say, hey, uh, that let's continue a, the use. Yeah, let's continue the use at the discretion of the city council. It did. <laughs> you know the history on that? That I would work. I, okay. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So, but we um, want to make it so hard in government. <laughs> <laughs> so actually the rules but we want to be flexible and I'm innovative so at the same time so actually <laughs> this happened in 1996 and they were operating a montessori school they had lost that use code enforcement got involved and um and tagged them for the use they appealed that the hearing officer found them to be in non-compliance and that that use was lost they appealed that loss brought forward all of their documentation, and during the appeal process, it was determined that the use had not been continued for the period that it needed to be continued, and they lost that appeal. Well, are you saying after 96, they, they stopped, but then they started again at some future date, so there was a gap? So they stopped in 1996 when they lost that appeal, and then that building has no, been... No, before the appeal, what was the process? They had a Montessori school for six years. Are you saying it wasn't a permitted or something? They had it on, they had it on and off. There were a few different ones there, and I, I the packet that I had from those previous uh, appeal hearings is about this thick with different, different, different schools and Montessori schools and daycares and different things that were all using that building, but they, they lost that use. All right, I'm going to okay. cut you off, sorry, because yeah, uh, I've been giving them, everyone extra time. Hold on, Councilman Breckis, I'm going to go to uh, Vice Mayor Reese. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ms. Brock, I, my question is actually for Mr. Hall or Mr. Shipman. 
So I want to sort of maybe focus my attention here. So I'm a lawyer by profession, so sometimes I think about the world as a lawyer does. And there is a, a principle in law that has to do with equity. And so sometimes there's not a square peg to deal with a legal issue. But there is an equitable way to deal with it. And so I'm trying to figure out, is there a place in our code that is like we reach down through all of the legalese and jargon and the minutia, and we just say, as a body, our decision is that this is a appropriate thing, like an equitable remedy. And that's really what I'm asking about. Is there any where in the code where we can be creative, where we can be thoughtful, but we can meet the needs of both groups that are in front of us. It's like a Solomonic tale, right? Right. And it sounds like what you want to do is condition a zone change, and we don't have the authority to condition a Correct. zone change. So Other than yeah. SPD. And then, um, Ms. Brock, maybe I can ask a question about the SPD process. Um, you said if they had made a different decision like three weeks ago. So could we continue this item let them go back to the moment where they could get in their time machine and change direction and then go? Or are you saying there's all these noticing requirements that have to be redone, yada, yada, yada? Because ultimately, um, it it does break my heart that the children's cabinet or a church would be uh, out some 30 grand number to do a thing which I think there's a fair amount of support for and which we are acknowledging that government is um, getting in the way of people's lives as opposed to helping them. And, and that's where I somewhat fall. I, I understand the reasons why these residents adjacent are here. I understand the reason why the church is here. And I would like us to find a path forward, but I am not yet seeing one. And if I had a magic wand, I would wave it and we would do the thing which I think is the right thing, which is to allow the humans, little humans, to be educated there without changing a whole lot of things which are would be upsetting to me if I were the neighbor. And so um, I, I'm still continue to struggle and and it's a it's a difficulty that we face. So if I may, just really quickly, is uh, if if this doesn't pass today, they can still add six humans to the to the um, no, they, can't. they can't do a daycare, is what you said. They cannot do a daycare. Yeah, but this what he's talking about is a preschool, right? Preschool doesn't fall under our definition of schools. So they can or can't? I don't. They, they cannot do the preschool period. I thought period. you period. I thought you said there were twenty four kids in a preschool today. It's a K through three. Okay, it's not a preschool. Madam Mayor. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Councilwoman Brackus, and then we're going to go to Councilwoman Taylor. Yeah. So, um, so the special use permit from 22 goes down to what age? Uh, it's it's kindergarten through third grade, I believe. Okay. Um, it's a primary school. Yeah, this has come up over the years. Kindergarten is not compulsory in the state of Nevada. Does everyone know that? So, to some degree, allowing K through whatever is actually allowing a preschool in because kids go to preschool for kindergarten. My daughter did it. Can <laughs> they go to kindergarten? They go to preschools for kindergarten. So, pretty sure there's an interpretation in the books somewhere in the community development department on that fact. I don't know if you've looked or not. Here's another solution is to and it's not um it's not, you know, per, you know, hopefully not precedent setting, but it does have some precedence and it should come from this table, is the code allows the planning commission and the city council to initiate zoning changes, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So here's the remedy that I would suggest is they stand up and say, we want to put this on hold for now. We want to continue the hearing to a date. We'll let you know. Bang. Someone, I don't know who, with authority, says, I want to initiate a zoning change to this property for SPD. They have to hire and do all the application materials for that. You know, shop around for whoever they want to prepare this SPD document, outline what they want. And, you know, the issue about, you know, the appeal and when they were not living up, you know, jogged a lot of my memory. They were not good players, okay? They were out of compliance years ago, and there's you know, so you got to you got to put that, you know, credence behind that because it's fact and I remember it. So this opportunity for them to do an SPD 
you know, to work with staff to outline the parameters of this property, which don't involve the opportunity, you know, for charter schools and hospitals and professional office, would be in the SPD. It could be amended over time, but it would be done. So that's how I would recommend it. I would tell the, I would not tell, I would ask the ward representative or a member of the planning commission is watching this because I think they meet next to put it on their agenda and initiate an SPD, but them knowing if they, you know, agree to the initiation, they have to provide the submittals on their time. That's how I would work this out. I've seen this happen here at the city in the past, you know, but the, you don't want to move into world where every city council member is initiating zone changes for people who don't want to pay for zone changes. You don't want to go there. So that's why I hesitate on saying that. So if that's a way, you know, you want to go, I would suggest someone say, I'm ready to make a motion for denial, but, uh, you know, I would receive them to say, you know, put it on hold and I will bring it back or suggest to a planning commissioner they do initiation. Madam Mayor, if, if we may, um, there's a lot of good thoughts right now. And I, I think that um, I would like to maybe take a break. Can we just put this item on hold for a little bit? You guys can move to your next item. We can come back to this at a later point today and see if we have maybe a different yeah. suggestion for the group. I like that. I, yes. Like I said, you are the experts. Go make it happen. Make everyone happy because okay. I understand both sides. It's okay. tough. But I, I understand the neighborhood. That's always so challenging. So, okay, make that happen. Okay. We're going to move on because we've got to get on with the rest of our day. Or Carl is not going to be happy with this. So, uh, Madam Clerk, I'm going to go to item E1, I think. I think it was That's E2. correct, Madam Mayor. We're oh, is that E2? Ahead. Nope. We're going to go ahead and open item E1, Edward okay. 1. All right. Uh, <clears throat> with that being said, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> and, um, Madam Clerk, E1... You made public comment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We do not have any public comment registered for this item. Oh, I lied. We do. They are both giving me very <laughs> eyes over here. We have Madam um, Dan. Clerk, before our folks who are here for this last hearing leave the room, please understand we've just taken a pause in the time that we are on council. The item will be trailed to a later point in time on our agenda. So I, I want you to make sure that if you are here to stay and be here, I don't leave, but we just don't know when we're going to come back. And I'm apologizing in advance for that. So could it be another day? No, it, 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 would, day? it will happen today during this hearing, unless a motion for continuance is made by the body and it is voted on. The matter is set for today. It was called as a public hearing. The ordinance was introduced. We've held our hearing. Madam Mayor has just said we're going to trail the decision on it until a later point. Yeah. I just and didn't want anyone who are leaving. We're, yeah, it's already been noticed for today. So something will happen today. Um, we'll see what that something is. Um, and we've got to hear an item and then we're going on break for an attorney-client privilege meeting. And for those of you who have been here with us since 10 a.m., you know, bless you. All right, Madam Mayor, our first public commenter today for item E1 is Dan Morgan, followed by Jeff Borkhart. All right. Good afternoon, Dan. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us. You know how this much I enjoy that. For you. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Uh, for the record, Dan Morgan on behalf of the Builders Association and our nearly 700 member companies. <clears throat> We'd like to take this opportunity today to thank the City of Reno staff, including the City Manager, the Director of Development, and specifically Mr. Flansburg and Ms. Garcia. The sewer connection fee structure that will be presented to you here shortly is a result of several months of collaboration and work between Mr. Flansburg, Ms. Garcia, the Builders Association, and numerous of our member builders and developers. We are grateful and appreciative for the city staff's willingness to work in collaboration with our association and the stakeholders. And we now look forward to addressing future issues and challenges in the same spirit of partnership and collaboration. We thank you very much. All right, thanks. Would you, Mr. Fortart, yeah, come Fortart. on up. It's always so nice to see you, a familiar face. And I'm going to imagine that that last conversation was very interesting for you. Yes. <laughs> yes. As a, as this is his expertise. Do you have any? It was fun watching uh, a public hearing. Do you have any thoughts hearing. of how to get there? Oh, no. <laughs> I, I will leave that outside of the uh, 
I, I'm not going to comment on something outside of a public hearing. Um, so uh, Jeff Borkhart, uh, for the record, um, here representing uh, Toll Brothers, um, in addition to the fact that I am the chair of the Infrastructure and Planning Committee for the Builders Association. Uh, I, I wanted to echo what Dan said. I'll keep my comments short just because I know you guys are all pretty hungry um, and waiting for that uh, attorney-client privilege meeting so you can all stuff your faces. <laughs> so um, we did work very closely with John Flansberg and his staff to, to come up with um, an ordinance that I think addresses um, most of the fixture units here, and it allows for... Um, changes over time as well. Um, by, by tying it to the uh, Uniform Plumbing Code, it allows for that flexibility for new innovative um, plumbing fixtures, changes over time to be incorporated in without having to come back and come back and come back. Um, so it allows that flexibility over time. So I, I really think this is great. Um, it also will force people like us at Toll Brothers to pay a little bit more for our big giant houses that we build um, while not um, unfairly penalizing those that build our standard and um, missing middle housing. So I think uh, it's a great balance and thanks to Mr. Flansberg and his staff. Appreciate it. All right, thank you so much. Good seeing you. Hello, Mr. Flansburg. Anyway, it's all you. All right. For the record, John Flansburg, uh, Regional Infrastructure Administrator. Um, in January, uh, we approved, uh, council approved, um, a, a change in the ordinance for sewer connections. Um, we did have a couple outstanding items that came up during those last uh, couple weeks, and so staff worked, uh, per council's direction, we worked with uh, Builder Association to uh, see if we could come up with uh, a way to uh, address those. Uh, specifically, we were looking at the standard home fixture unit count. Uh, when we came to you, we talked about a two and a half bath home being kind of the standard home. Um, and then we also, uh, there was a question on timing of sewer connection fee payments. We've addressed both of these in this ordinance change before you today. Uh, interestingly, we uh, went to, uh, and used the Washoe County Assessor's Database. Uh, from that database, uh, we pulled uh, specifically, we looked at the homes that have been built since 1980 coming forward, and during that time, um, we looked and say, okay, based on number of bathrooms, what does that look like? Because you can pull things like specific number of bathrooms. Um, we found that the standard we were using of, of two and a half baths really was a little less than 76%. So we were really excluding about 24% of the homes that had been built uh, since 1980. And we thought that was not what our intention uh, was when we brought this forward. So looking at the three bath standard, uh, that gets us over 10%. And we felt that was, a, that was much closer to um, what we would want to, to look at and uh, recommend to you today. So uh, interesting map, in interesting graphic, you can kind of see really, although we are seeing a few larger homes being built more recently, um, uh, really the mix hasn't changed that much uh, since 1980. So what does that mean? Uh, if we took a uh, three bath standard, uh, we have calculated those number of fixture units, um, allowing for an extra uh, separate bath or shower and an extra uh, lavatory sink. We came up with 31 uh, fixture units, which is what we had put in the ordinance previously. Why did it change? It changed because we're recommending to use the 20, 2018 Uniform Plumbing Code. And the more recent plumbing code shows um, that the specifically like a dishwasher um, is much less and us uh, and the uh, couple other items came in less as well. So with that, um, we're requesting for council adopt 2018 as uniform plumbing code. We have that in the draft ordinance before you today. Uh, we are also, we've updated that to show what the existing fixture units would be uh, specifically for residential uh, fixture units. Um, and as we look through uh, those items, uh, the, the other change that was requested of us is that we currently did allow for a, uh, um, the charge, uh, the connection fee charge to be deferred uh, for one year or until time of certificate occupancy based on the feedback from the industry uh, and from staff and development services on how they um, go about to enforce that. It was easier for us just to remove that piece and just make the change before you hear the connection fee for new connections to city facilities or change of occupancy. And that was important because those are the two things that would require a certificate of occupancy. Um, and so that would be the, the hammer, if you will, um, uh, that payment must be made before a certificate of occupancy will be issued. And so that is what we're um, 
uh, suggesting that we make that change today. And um, our recommendation is we refer this uh, to uh, uh, ordinance adoption for a second reading. Madam Mayor, before uh, a motion is taken, I think Mr. Think Hall has to read. Uh, and Mr. Then... Hall. Thank you. Go ahead, put it on the record, please. Alrighty, ordinance introduction, bill number 7235, ordinance amending Reno Municipal Code, Title 12, entitled Public Works and Utilities, Chapter 12.16, Sewer Service, Section 12.16.150, Weighted Fixture Unit Schedule, to adjust the fixture unit schedule per the 2018 Uniform Plumbing Code, Section 12.16.280, Connection Fee, as to timing of payment and Section 12.16.290, Dwelling Unit or Residential Unit, to refer to Section 12.16.150, Point one fifty as to the weighted fixture unit schedule, together with matters which pertain to or are necessarily connected thereto. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to send it to Madam Mayor. Sarah. I think I, I'm prepared to make a motion. But no, it looks I've, like my colleague well, has some yeah. questions. Go ahead, tell I, someone breakfast. Yeah, I do. I do. And I, I saw. I'm sorry. I know everyone's ready for lunch. I thought we were going to lunch and hearing this after lunch. So I apologize too. Must be trying to move someone off to a plane. So I support the timing, and you know I know you're following up on general direction we gave you. Um, and I might have even made the motion. I support the timing. I could see how problematic it was. At C of O, money changes hands. Those fees need to be in. I think everyone figures that out. Cost uh, change of occupancy, you still have that parameter because I think the vision in America of solving the housing crises is converting, you know, here and there, we need everything we can, non-res to res. And so you do a fixture calc, right? If they're going one way or the other. They, they still get credits for what they have, right? That is correct. Okay, that's good. I don't know if anyone's fault, you know, yeah. But I want to go back to your slide about the trend line of the three units. Um, and, and I've seen this before, and I, I think, you know, saying, well, this is how it's been done in the past, we want to carry it forward, is, okay, we have master plan policy, and here's actually an analysis that the trend line of housing production in the past was not what we need in the future. It's not what we need in the future for demographics. It's not what the future we need for infrastructure availability, uh, services efficiency, and um, most important, economics, okay? So let's just think about what we're doing. So if we put it up to three, it means less money going into the sewer fund where we got some big dollar. Do we have big price tags coming up on the sewer fund? Uh, yes, we uh, explained the capital improvement program, and that's yeah. what the whole purpose yeah. of the sewer connection fee. Yeah, essentially was. rebuilding Tom Wharf and you know doing what we need to do to take advantage of the four MGD, right? And then the collection system. So if we give it up to the three, you know the the three, um, and then after that you you have to pay more. It's a bleed off the connection fee cost, correct? Certainly having uh, the standard be two and a half bathrooms would cause more single family homes being built to uh, pay for the additional fixture units. Okay, okay. So so two and a half. And if we got two and a half, we'd be hitting 75% of what we built since the 80s. Right? Is that correct? It means 75% of the homes have two and a half baths or fewer. Yeah, yes. and wh at what juncture do you start paying more? Uh, currently, ba based on what we brought to you with 31 fixture units, that equated to a two and a half bath home. So okay. if okay. you go up to a three bath home, it would start to add those add fixture more. units. Okay, so, so, but look at the two and a half, okay? How many, how many bathrooms, because you brought down a, an aggregate, two and a half uh, bathrooms, okay? So how many infill projects that are reaching affordability are two and a half baths? That's two master baths, correct? And one half bath, correct? On a two and a half bath, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's not the price point that's affordability. And, you know, if you haven't read our housing needs assessment from, um, uh, I think it was 2016, it kind of lays that out. So the basis that, well, we want to, you know, just create it for going forward doesn't really help the sewer fund. It blooms money off the sewer fund. And it doesn't respond to the policy that we want to build smaller houses, infill houses. And you heard the public commenter talk about, you know, how much has been built in the tier two. 
We're not doing the incremental infill policies. This okay. is a this is a skip on that. All right. Thank you, Thank you. Councilwoman. Um, Thank you. If Go I ahead, may, John. though, I I do want to credit the council. One of the things that was approved in the in the ordinance change was the micro units, which address definitely addresses that and having a lower charge for micro units um, uh, for that type of as you talked about uh, converting properties from one use to multifamily. And then seven. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other questions? Councilwoman Dewar? No questions, no. I'm ready to vote. Okay, Councilwoman, uh, uh, Vice Mayor. Madam Mayor, I move to refer for the second reading and adoption. All right, I have a second. motion to refer, I have a second. I'm not going to, because oh, really, I, I, I appreciate a lot of work that has been done on this, but, you know, the, the and it's good, the number one thing is, the hookups, which have gotten a free ride since 2014, while rates have gone up maybe 50% at this point, you know, CPI, we just got took a 7% hit. You know, finally that free ride is gone. But, you know, the standard home building of big houses out on the fringe is perpetuated by bringing this up to the three. You know, which obviously was promoted by the folks who spoke earlier. You know, they're they're able to, but it's working. It's these incremental little choices that don't help us get where we need to get to in the infill and the housing product we need. And so that's that's sad because I think I think staff initially had it right at two and a half. Thank you. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. Opposed. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So we're breaking in. Uh, I think we are going to go to attorney client and to lunch, and then we'll yeah. come back and finish the item right. that we have on pause. All right. Thanks, everyone. Madam Mayor, do we have a time we're going to reconvene? Sure. In one hour? Okay, Two so let's come three, back at um, 10 after 3. We I mean, will reconvene at 3.15. 3.10, yeah. 3.15, let's go 3.15. Thank you. Okay.
We are going to All right, resume Madam with C2. We are going to call the meeting back to order at 317. And at this time, it looks like only Council Member Breckis is absent at this time. Um, and as you mentioned, Madam Mayor, we are going to reconvene our um, discussion on item C2. All right, Angela, come on up. Take it away. Or <laughs> Leah, Leah, go ahead. Take it away. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Leah Brock, for the record. Um, thank you for that break. That gave us an opportunity to look at some stuff. And after further review and discussion with the applicant, the applicant has agreed to withdraw their request for this zoning map amendment to change it to a public facility. We, as staff, will continue to work with the applicant to find a solution with the current zoning. Okay. <laughs> she goes, isn't there more? <laughs> okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, then I don't think we have to do anything further. You have that in writing. No, May we have right. the applicant come up and acknowledge that they agreed to withdraw their request? Yeah, um, we're in concurrence with what uh, Leah has mentioned. We'll withdraw our request and then work with the uh, planning department uh, to figure out how we can get the uh, preschool going. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Angela. Leah, great job. Thank you. Great job. Honestly, like you, you're so knowledgeable. So really appreciative. Yay, and much. applicants, thank you for figuring out a way. Cool. And I thank you too. Okay. Cool. Okay. Moving on, Madam Clerk, I'm going to send it right back to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If you are good with getting back in order, we would be looking to open item C1, the public hearing for LDC 23-00029. Okay. Give me just a one minute. Okay, we are at C1, and uh, let the record reflect that the City Council is now opening the public hearing. Madam Clerk, has proper notice been given and your correspondence received? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Proper notice was given, and we did receive correspondence as two comments um, just expressing concern for this item. Those have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are a part of the, the record. Additionally, we have one voicemail, which we'll go ahead and play at this time. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, yes, my name is Marcy Ross, and I'm calling about LDC 23-00029, and I live next door to this property, 3655 Warren Way, and I wanted to say that just in the last few years, I've gotten so many of these um, notices for changing all the properties around here, but I've yet to see a final picture of what you guys vision this block to look like. With the new swimming pool coming in, I really don't think that we should go big across the way. We should keep this more residential. You went three stories over there on um, Salem and Lakeside looks terrible. What about over on the hub by the hub on Riverside? Mount Rose looks terrible right there on Watt Street. So I just think you guys should put some thought into your final decision here. Also, I need to say that the traffic is just horrible Monday through Thursday. Friday, the doctor's offices are mostly closed, so there's no street parking. I love Saturdays and Sundays. It's my old street again. You can't make a left-hand turn on Moana anymore, so maybe you should think about making this a one-way street or putting a sign up or speed limits because sometimes people race through. And like I've said before, there is a school right across the way and a little kid's swim center. So really think about what you guys are going to decide on this. And I'm not against something going in there. I just think you should plan it nice, very nice. Okay, thank you. All right, Madam Mayor, with that, we have no additional public comment registered for this item. And we would be looking to the city attorney to read the bill. Yes, I'm going to send it right over to Carl. Go Thank ahead. Madam Mayor, <clears throat> ordinance introduction, bill number 7236, case number LDC 23-00029, 
3655 Warren Way rezoning, request for a zoning map amendment from single family residential, three units per acre, SF3 to multifamily residential, 14 units per acre, MF14. The plus or minus one acre project site is located on the west side of Warren Way, plus or minus 425 feet south of its intersection with West Milana Lane. Site has master plan land use designation of suburban mixed use, SMU <laughs> Ward 2. Mm. Thank you so much. Okay. You ready? Leah, come on back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm back. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Again, for the record, Leah Brock, Associate Planner with the City of Reno Development Services. Uh, this afternoon, my second case here is a zoning map amendment for 3655 Warren Way. This item was heard by the Planning Commission on March 1st of 2023, and the Planning Commission did recommend uh, unanimously to recommend approval. All right. Thank you. The subject's one-acre site is located on the west side of Warren Way between Moana and West Peckham Lane, east of Lakeside Drive. You can see on the map right there where the intersection of Lakeside and Moana is, where Moana Nursery is, in relation to this site. Today's request is a zoning map amendment from single-family residential, three units per acre, to multifamily residential, 14 units per acre. You will see on this map right here on the left-hand side that SF3 designation does not match any of the surrounding zoning. Uh, we do have neighborhood commercial to the north, a professional office to the west, MF14 to the south, and MF21 and uh, professional office and a more MF14 all there to the east across uh, Warren Way. Oh, I want to go back here for just a second. So the original request on this application was for MF21, and the applicant held a community meeting, and the community did express some concern regarding that 21 <laughs> designation. They were concerned about that density along with a building height of three stories, which would be allowed in the MF21. And the applicant went to the Planning Commission on January 18th and requested a continuance so that they would be able to attend that NAB meeting to get more community input on that. And after doing all of that outreach and attending the NAB meeting, the applicant did revise their request from the MF21 to the MF14. So you may see some public comment in the record here that's related to some opposition regarding that density and that height, but that was for the MF21. Um, since the MF14 uh, was, since it was revised to MF14, we have not received any public concern regarding this request. The key issue in this case is conformance with the master plan land use designation of suburban mixed use. You will see on the board here that this entire area has a land use designation of suburban mixed use and conforming base districts are listed there for you on the right. You will notice that there are no single family zoning districts conforming to that SMU. So the applicant has applied to change this to bring it into conformance with that suburban mixed use land use designation as you've seen on a few cases recently. To give you just a little bit of summary of uh, summary of uses that are allowed here, so we have that adjacent professional office, the MF21, the MF14, and the neighborhood commercial. Uh, the main difference uh, between the MF21 and that MF14 is going to be the density, the height, but also there's a couple of uses there. Most uh, notably would be a mini warehouse, which could be conditionally permitted in MF21, but would not be permitted at all in MF14. Here are the development standards for those same districts. Again, the MF21 designation would have allowed for 45 feet and three stories, whereas the MF14 is two and a half with 35 feet, which is consistent with the neighborhood commercial and the professional office on either side of it. On the board are the zoning map amendment recommended findings. The Planning Commission was able to make all these findings. They did find that it conforms to all the requirements listed in NRS and the current RMC zoning regulations. But most importantly, this zoning map amendment does bring the zoning district into conformance with that master plan land use designation of suburban mixed use. On the board is the recommended motion. That concludes my presentation. And as always, I'm available for questions. Thank you. All right, great job.
Okay, Councilwoman Dora, your yep. word. Thank you so much. And I'm prepared to make a motion. And before I do, I wanted to just put a few things on the record. Um, the first thing I want to do is say that I think this is a perfect example of infill done right. Um, they are matching the zoning, proposing to match the zoning of their neighbor, the same height, the same setbacks. It was driven um, by a public meeting. They came in, as you said, with an MF21 proposal. There was concern about three stories next to two stories, et cetera. Uh, parking was a big issue. And, and to the speaker who phoned in, Marcy Ross, she said, we should kind of work on Warren Way and figure it out. Well, um, if I haven't already, which I think I have, but if I haven't already, I'll be proposing into Reno Direct to um, actually stripe the street, um, add speed limit signs on the street. I've heard all kind of um, some crazy driving occurs because it's just a blacktop, right? It's not marked. Um, it's not signed. And um, so I think she'll be pleased with that. Um, also, I want to thank Lisa Nash, who's here in the room. She's with Christie Corp, and she was that facilitator that worked with the applicant, that, that helped them understand what the public was trying to say, came up with a thoughtful response, understood the issue about parking. This street is fully parked, so the apartments already have overflow parking there. The professional office already has overflow parking. That's what I think the speaker was trying to get at, is um, where, where do we park? How do we navigate this road? Should we make it a one-way, sort of a free-for-all? So I wanted to thank both the staff and um, Lisa for working with the applicant and coming out with a great answer, where we get more housing, we get something that's compatible, and uh, you hear no objections from the neighbors. Yay, right? We don't have to sit up here and figure it all out. So thank you to you all. Um, those are my <coughs> excuse me comments, and I'm ready to make a motion, but other people may have okay. comments. Okay, thank you. Any uh, council comments? <coughs> Any council comments? No? Okay, go ahead. All right. Well, with that, I would uh, move to approve item C1. All right. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Good job. Good job. I wish our life was like that. <laughs> like, in other words, all the stuff happens before it comes here. You know? Good job. D4. Here we go. Yeah, I did. Yeah, okay. Good. Nevertheless. Thank you, Leah. Good job. Madam Mayor, as we're exiting this item, I just want to acknowledge Councilmember Dewar's work on the project as well. The projects don't happen in a vacuum. It's not just the right applicant or their willingness to do it, but it's also when a council member really digs deep into the projects and meets with the residents to make those things happen. So it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Thank you, Councilmember Dewar. Great to work with. That's what I know. <laughs> okay. Kelly, take it away. This is going to be a staff presentation uh, and discussion of the, we're on D4, right? The City of Reno's Federal Legislative Platform. Yes. Nice to see you, because you've been spending a lot of time in Carson. Am nice I right? to see you. Nick is holding down the fort in Carson City, He's and we are in touch job. all the time. He's great. Wonderful. <laughs> Super proud of him. So I hope he's making you proud. He is. Well, Madam Mayor and members of the Council for the Record, Callie Wilsey, Director of Policy and Strategy for the City of Reno. Today I'm here to present the next version of the City's federal platform to you, which this document guides our advocacy efforts and pursuit of federal funding opportunities. This document was created after uh, our federal lobbyist, Chris Giglio, met with each of you uh, in the last few months, as well as our departments, to talk about what is happening at the federal level and um, what the priorities are um, here for the City of Reno. Um, and what is prepared for you is a draft for your review today. Um, after the conversations with this body and staff, most of the platform is really recommended to, uh, to be carried forward. It remains relevant today. Uh, what you're going to see in this document is support for vital programs for our community, like CDBG, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, and funding for continued support for rental support. It also encourages federal investment in economic development needs, such as expanded wireless broadband internet, renewable energy sources, and the new market tax credit program. Our platform also highlights major infrastructure needs for our entire capital improvement program, but it also highlights specific infrastructure needs, such as expansion um, and improvements around the sp spaghetti bowl and uh, associated uh, impacts with that, multimodal and micromobility opportunities, 
improvements at both of our sewer plants, plants, stormwater and drought resiliency efforts, and cybersecurity. The platform encourages efforts to mitigate climate change and fund the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant, block grant program on an annual basis. It highlights the work of our public safety divisions, police, fire, and dispatch. It encourages staffing and programmatic support, while also encouraging funding for wellness programs that increase behavioral health for our team, as well as the community at large. It highlights the importance of parks and recreation to Reno residents and highlights the needs along the Truckee River. Support uh, for continued art investment in our community with the National Endowment for the Arts. The platform also discusses concerns about preemption, particularly, particularly related to telecommunications, unmanned aircraft systems, and autonomous vehicles. Um, while most of the platform is recommended to carry forward, there are a couple of changes that I just want to highlight for you. So there are some cleanup changes in the document just related on timing, uh, but there are several in here that I wanted, wanted to point out to you. One, it recognizes the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and encourages tax credit programs for industries that lower greenhouse gas emissions. The platform also proposes to support waivers to the federal Buy America uh, requirements. Um, it, it says we generally work hard to comply here, but in very limited instances where domestic materials are not available at all, or they're not available in a timely manner that would cost significant increases, we're hoping waivers are made available for those limited instances. Finally, we're suggesting to make the platform a two-year document, um, and uh, what that would mean is we would still continue our annual briefings, meeting with Chris, talking about that, and if at that point those issues are major, and we would still bring forward an interim update, but we would move to a standard two-year document. For instances like this year where there aren't many changes, we would just continue that platform forward. Looking at this year, there are a couple of key opportunities uh, that I think we um, should all be looking forward to. Earlier this month, this body uh, uh, approved a major allocation package for, for our, the ARPA dollars that we received, and that package we are moving into implementation. We're going to have a, and that package has a significant generational level impact on this community, whether it comes from access to healthcare, affordable housing, parks and recreation, public safety, small business support, and downtown improvements. In regards to the lands bill, with which our uh, platform does discuss, um, looking forward based on my conversations with uh, the delegation, we are expecting uh, in the near future what would be called a discussion draft. That would be draft language related to the bill as well as an updated map. Um, and so we would start to understand what those changes are based on feedback over the past few years, what is in that. Um, and then we will also be working to schedule briefings uh, with this body and the delegation to understand that bill, get your feedback, and uh, we will figure out what that looks like going forward from there. In regards to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also referred to as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, we're continuing to look at all grant opportunities, but I wanted to highlight a few that we have really um, highlighted that we are uh, identified going after this year. Um, one is for the Safe Streets for All grant, working with RTC on downtown connectivity. We also have the Water Smart grant with the EPA and working on, for funding on our advanced purified water facility, and two different bridge opportunities for Keystone and Sierra Street bridges. We often work with our regional partners like RTC and Tumwa on these applications. That just gives you kind of a highlight of the major things that we can look forward to on the federal level this year. With that, the proposed, proposed motion is on your screen and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you and fantastic job. I was just thinking, I remember like when you first started and now like look at you, so you're this big wig and you're doing such great work and everyone loves working with you. Everyone. Thank you. I can't begin to tell you um, that I think you are probably the most favorite person in this building. It really is serious. JW may be second. <laughs> but uh, great job, and I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm going to start with Councilwoman Breckus. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say that this two-year concept is not a bad one, but Congress is a political body, this is a political body. Um, I think that it should be synced up with your with the election cycle of this body, because I know if I had come on this body and I had to sit around for two years with 
the existing platform being my message to the federal delegation, I would have been writing my own federal platform and bringing it to them personally. A lot of work was done, and I, I took the leadership on that um, the first two years because it didn't necessarily reflect um, my policy views on how our federal government should respond to our needs. So I'll leave that at that. What's this language? Where's the language about the, this concept for the lands bill? Because I have um, consistently opposed the land bill based upon my understanding of our um, uh, master plan and regional plan. I think it's just a, a mode to privatize a lot of land, build more warehouses, um, and private real estate development. Clark County got a national monument we get more warehouses and private real estate development and a lot more infrastructure demands if we are the ones who annex that land with our deteriorating infrastructure. So can you bring up the language? Absolutely. Could I have the overhead? Thank you. The city is prepared to engage in comprehensive legislation. Yeah, no, I'm not supporting that language. It's new introduced language. And, um, you know, maybe the body's there in wanting a lands bill and disposing of federal land that belongs to all of us for private real estate endeavors. I don't. Uh, I think we have issues now with maintaining our infrastructure, and we think now we have an expanding um, sprawling region. Just wait till we build double down on warehousing. Thank you. It, uh, uh, I would like to address both comments, but Council Member Dewar, it is in your packet. There's a red line version and a, a clean version. Uh, this is the red line version. Uh, it's on page seven um, of that document. Um, so I will point out that there are no changes uh, uh, in the public lands legislation section proposed. This is language that was carried forward from previous years. I might have voted for the last time, but I do not believe that the city should be prepared to engage in public lands legislation. I think that is not good for our region, it's not good for our city, and it's not supported in our regional plans. And then Council Member Brekus, to your point about the timing of the two-year plan, it's set up to do that. So uh, go through this year and next year for the election in 2024. So the elected officials in 2024, we would then sit down and adopt in 2025 for two years. Yeah, I only theory. wish our annual um, workshop and strategic plan could sync up because we haven't been in workshop since August of 2019 as a body to give our city manager direction. Thank you. Madam Mayor, um, for my part, um, I'm disturbed that any one member would imagine that their um, singular voice on a particular issue would be the representative document for this body. Obviously, when we carry forward a federal platform uh, delegation. It, it is what the majority of this body has de decided to do based on its um, development of that plan. So um, that it might not align with something I'm interested in particular doesn't mean I'm going to go out and try to create my own thing or show up at the legislature and skulk around the halls and make my own opinion known. We have rules at this body that say that when the body has taken a vote or when it's pronounced a policy, that is the policy of this body. So that's the first thing, the starting point. The second thing is, um, I look, um, as to the public lands bill, I, I'm not someone who's in favor of the public lands bill as it currently has been explained or iterated to me either. But I also think we don't get to stick our head in the sand and say, we just won't show up or we won't have a conversation. I mean, I think that the public lands legislation portion here is designed to allow us a seat at the table, right? Our, our former colleague used to say, oftentimes Council Member Delgado would say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so I think that's what this is. It's a recognition that we, if called upon to have an opinion, and perhaps at some point in time we may, uh, I've never heard this body express particularized attention to it in a more a recent fashion. So it's sort of a generic -y statement that we're interested in being engaged. And to the extent that that's true, I believe that's the appropriate approach. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is just, Ms. Wilsey, you and Mr. Giulio 
I don't think the public can quite um, see all the work that goes into this kind of a presentation and the thought that goes into it and the, the meetings and the conversations with our delegation and our partners. Mr. Giglio has been responsible for directing hundreds of millions of dollars, I think, potentially to the region over the course of his representation of us as a city. And, and maybe I'm off by some dollar amount. I, I'm not suggesting um, that there isn't a different dollar amount that could attach it. But my point is just to say we are well represented in Washington. Um, we're well represented here at the city with your work. We're well represented, obviously, in the halls of our legislature with Mr. Mr. Ciccone. And we continue to, I think, push forward what we can in the federal delegation. Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting with our federal delegation, I think, three or four times over the last year. And always, they're very robust conversations. And they run the gamut of things that concern transportation. Sometimes we're talking about mental health. Sometimes it's about federal dollars for infrastructure. Uh, these are big and weighty things. And to the extent that we are represented in Washington, I think we have been well served. And I appreciate your leaning into this area and leading these discussions uh, along with Mr. Giglio. So thank you for that. All right, Council and Doer. Yeah, thank you. Um, very well done. Ninety-five percent of it's the same. So I mean, we've we've seen this before, and we're. I like the incremental approach that we haven't thrown the baby out with bathwater. Rewrote, rewrote the whole document. Um, I'll just make a, a comment on public lands legislation too. I've always remained open to talk and hear um, what some of the advocates want to say. Um, the proposals we've received so far haven't been persuasive to either our, our general public, um, our seg stakeholder portions of the general public, or ourselves. And that is why we say we remain neutral on the legislation until they give us specific details about what they're thinking about. And, that, um, and it lists in here that we're looking for important conservation goals also not just economic development, but just as they are doing in Clark County or wherever, that they're considering lands bills. There's always, it's always got to be a win, right? We, we're giving up a major something, public ownership of lands, and we need to make sure we get a major something. So, um, so I'm comfortable with the approach you've outlined. So thank you. All right. Any other comments? First of all, thank you for all your hard work, and I would agree, Mr. Giglio is the best in the business. We are so fortunate to have him, and he just does a tremendous job. I don't think we could ask for a better representative in Washington. Uh, he gets us all right in the door, and uh, he just does a phenomenal job. So I also trust any recommendation that he brings forward. So please thank him uh, for all his hard work and what you guys have brought to us. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Okay, that being said, I'm going to ask uh, Vice Mayor, please give me a motion. Yeah, I would move to uh, approve the recommended changes and staff recommendations. All right, thank you. I have, a, I have a motion. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Okay, thank you. Okay, here we go. Madam Clerk, D5. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yep, item D5. Right. And I don't know, before we start this item, um, Mr. Hall, do you want to, or Mr. Shipman, do either of you want to make a statement about the voting requirements? Please and thank you. Right. The item indicates that a two-thirds majority voting requirement is um, required for this item, but that's not the case. So it's just a regular majority of the council. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, at this time. It is a presentation, discussion, and potential direction, activation cord coordinator position, and possible amendment to the sponsorship all allocation process. Thank you so much, Mr. Eidelstein, for being here. I am super excited uh, for this because I think uh, special events have been like top of mind and we're ready to go now that we're putting COVID behind us. It's ready to make it happen. So I'm super excited to see this. Can't wait to see what you have. So the floor is yours. Take it away. But one more thing. Madam Clerk, do you have public comment? Madam Mayor, we have no commenters registered in the audience. Additionally, we did not receive any correspondence on this item. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Eilstein, all you. 
All right. Good afternoon uh, for the third time. Eric Edelstein, Assistant <laughs> City Manager here with the City of Reno. Uh, excited to be here today to, uh, to present to you uh, a couple of items related to special events and uh, looking for, uh, for direction and discussion. You know, Reno is a lot of things, but one of the many things that it is is a special events town. And particularly in the months of May to September, we host a lot of special events throughout the city, and special events are a part of the DNA of what Reno is. With that being said, Reno has sponsored city events for many, many years using a portion of room tax funds. This group has, or this council has allocated these, these room tax funds again to support special events. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how we do that and how we think we can do that a little bit differently. Um, when we talk about sponsoring special events, there's a why behind it. And there's a lot of whys, but particularly, we do this for economic impact, we do this for cultural impact. We make an impact in our community by gathering people together to enjoy themselves together, learn about each other, and become more of a community together. With that, I come to you um, for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is this council, as recently as December 7th, which was just prior to me arriving at the city, but after I knew I was coming to join the city, um, council had asked at the December 7th meeting to take a relook at how these sponsorship funds are utilized and allocated. Um, you expressed a vision for a vibrant downtown, and I'm here today to talk about how we can take this in a new direction. To couch this discussion, I think it's important to understand the numbers that are going behind it. Uh, council has allocated $350,000 in the current fiscal year budget to sponsor special events. I am here to ask that we take $150,000 of that already allocated money to create a new activation coordinator from that fund. So that is ask number one. Number two is to discuss and potentially amend the process by which we allocate sponsorships to our, to our events that are out there. As we back up and talk about where we are in the special events landscape, um, last year we issued 123 total event permits um, throughout the city of Reno, throughout the event season. We've surpassed that as of March 15th. So we are, on a, we are on a trajectory without any sponsorship allocated um, to have more events in the city of Reno than, than we have uh, since prior to COVID. With that, I'm gonna to move to the activation coordinator position. So item number one, asking to create an, an activation coordinator. This is unlike any position that the city's had before. We have had people who have done special events execution and that's happening in various places within the organization. We'd like to house that in one place. We've had someone who's managed the sponsorship committee as a liaison and done the permitting. We still have that permitting functioning happening in licensing. What we haven't done is everything in the middle. Um, we wanna look at focusing on public, public space activation. We wanna grow and build our business partnerships. Um, we wanna make sure that we understand what's working, what's not, and that we can explain how that is so that we can seed and grow the right events in the long term. And also, this is a value add position. This position is going to look around to determine what do events need to be successful, and we're gonna create the guide, we're gonna pre-negotiate, we're gonna work with our vendors so that when someone wants to create an event, we can help give them the resources, the timing, and the contacts to be successful. So that is the activation coordinator. That is, in as short a way as I can explain it, what the, the bones of this position is going to be. Um, but this position uh, potentially can be a game changer and another step in the economic development process um, that we'll, we are seeking to undertake. Moving to the sponsorship process. Uh, resolution 7931 passed in January of 2014 is the last time that we've discussed this uh, at council. At that time, a three-step process was prescribed um, to decide who receives what sponsorship funds. There was a sponsorship committee um, that was made up of uh, boards and commission uh, representatives that then went to a special event subcommittee, which was a subcommittee of this body, um, which then brought their recommendations to the council for final approval. Um, events are a fast-paced, um, at times needing to be opportunistic in, uh, in taking advantage of, of what is in front of us. And so this old process um, created up to a three month lag from ideation to being able to know if sponsorship could be allocated. Um, 
I would like to propose or open for discussion um, a creation of a, of a new sponsorship committee that could bring those recommendations directly to council. So the final approval would still be at council, um, but we'd like to be able to move a little bit more nimbly um, as we go forward. And the gremlins are getting my presentation. <laughs> uh, on the second part of that, resolution 7931 um, does not specifically state how special events align with which priorities. It prescribes some historics of different types of events, um, but I think it's important as, as we create a new resolution, and to be clear, I'm asking for direction today. I do not have a resolution, but asking for direction to create a new resolution and want to include in that resolution that we would sponsor special events that would specifically align um, with council goals and council direction um, as we go forward. Those are my two items. I have my, my recommended motions uh, here and I'm happy to discuss uh, or answer any questions. All right, thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna put you on the spot here because I think I keep pronouncing your name wrong. It's Edel. Ed I, it, I don't. How do I? It's uh, Edelstein, Edelstein is I, the is the family name, but I don't correct people if you say my name. I'm happy well, to hear it. Well, gets my wrong too, but I'm like, I know what you <laughs> <Yeah>. meant. <laughs> Thank you. But just say it again. Like, yeah. how did you tell everyone to pronounce it? Uh, Edelstein. So soft, soft E, and then a Steen. Okay. Edelstein. Yes. Edelstein. Okay. Edelstein. Edel. Edelstein. 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 Okay. Edelstein. 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 <laughs> whatever, <Okay>. whatever triggers <laughs> it. Anyway, um, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, and I've known you long enough, but I, I think we've all been probably not pronouncing it correctly, and you have not corrected us. So you, nope. can, you can correct us anytime. Um, okay, I'm going to open it up to the body and uh, for questions, comments. Go ahead, Councilman Breckis. So we get our budget books tomorrow. And that's a chance for us to understand the resources we're going to give the city manager over the next year. And I have had a lot of concern about how the resources, which corresponds to staff and complement, have gone this year. Your position wasn't in the budget. It, you got hired. I don't even think there was an announcement or a recruitment. I think we have a mayoral relations position here. Um, I don't think that was either a position. I think we have maybe three or four assistant director positions that got upgraded or augmented. I just want to share with the body that budget is hard. And I have heard at the FAB that we're going to be doing a flat budget. That means no more positions, just flat. And I'm a little concerned about the equal treatment of all departments, all asks, because the asks are there, I understand, and the budget is there. And putting one on the table the week before we go to, into budget is problematic for me. I'm not saying I don't think it's, um, you know, not a good idea, but I just don't think it's good process to our budgeting exercises to put a position here. You didn't say what department it's going to be in. I don't even know um, how, you know, it subs into whatever department it is in. I presume it's the manager's office, and that's the one that's seen the most growth. When you see the year over year, you'll, you'll observe that, my colleagues. Um, so I think it's a little pre premature. Not only that, um, we're talking about a special fund, the room tax fund. Um, and I understand that we budgeted $300,000, but none of that was spent this year, correct? None has been allocated as of this year. So, so in July 1, we gave $300,000 for special events, and it's never been tapped. And to me, I never got an explanation for, of that. <laughs> you know, I've been asking about it because I was one of the special event subcommittee members. And so I'd really like to know how we were able to sit on $300,000 you know, all year, but the, as I understand, the incorporation is to take that 150000 from this year, roll it over to next year for that FTE, so we don't have to throw it in the budget, but then it would be an ongoing, you know, issue. I just, you know, want to stand on good budgeting principles, and I don't believe this is a good budgeting principle because, one, we're so close to doing budget, understanding, you know, the position, the compliments and everything, the department layout, <laughs> And two, um, you got to look at everything in, in totality, in my view. So I am not um, comfortable creating a position 
the day, you know, three days, five days before you go into budgeting. My next one will be on the subcommittee uh, sponsorship allocation process. But um, those are my thoughts to share with my colleagues, particularly those who haven't sat through budgeting before. And I, I really, I just can't understand, I'm just, I can't understand why we're um, having this separate and apart from budgeting. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, Councilwoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Eric. Let's back over. I mean, let's back up for a second. And I'd like to understand where this funding comes from and what it can be used for, because I thought I understood it could only be used. The funding source could only be used for something like this. Thank you for your question. You're correct that room tax funds does have a, a limited space for allocation. Um, not have anyone from finance here so uh, to the best of, of my my knowledge that would be limited to parks and recreation arts and culture and special events um and that is how and i would be remiss in saying that i know that 100 percent um but i do know that that is how this this body has allocated it previously okay thank you i just wanted to make sure we we can't get a cop for this right i mean as much as we all want more law enforcement we can't okay. we can't take this budget and move it someplace else we can't get a road worker or another maintenance operator it has to be used for something specific am i understanding that right you are that that is correct and i'm 100 percent confident in saying that is accurate okay thank you so much Hi. Council Dork. yeah thanks um thanks eric great presentation um, I had a chance to go over this with Eric in some detail because I was interested in all the moving parts and I also called the manager. And so to the question about, I asked the same question about why aren't we just including this in the budget? And the reason I said that is that it's going to take us some time, some months to find that person. And I wasn't sure if that was the reason that you wanted to get an early jump on it um, in the recruitment process. He answered that, well, we one, um, you weren't here to participate in the preliminary budget process. So it, the train left, you weren't on that train um, with your departments. And number two, it sounds like he thought that it would a position would be hired sooner than, rather than later. I don't know that that's true. I don't think we can count on that. So I think an argument could be made. I think a best practice is to join the budget process wherever possible, like not do special ads. Um, but that being said, I am very supportive of doing this. My, my biggest concern is making sure that the amount of money we have left, the now 200,000, and it, it wasn't 300,000, it was 350, to my knowledge, yes. the remaining 200,000 is enough to fund the special events. Now you provided um, or went over with me some of our past year expenditures, and it, they seem to be um, running about 220 to 265. We weren't allocating the full 350, but as I dug in, I realized that we were maybe allocating the 350, but we weren't spending it all. In other words, some events were coming in cheaper, some events just didn't happen, maybe they planned them, they didn't work out. And then, um, so what I'm mostly worried about is I want to make sure that we do at least spend 220 or, or the 200 that you're saying. And in order to do that, it almost sounds like we have to out over allocate it, knowing that some things are going to fall by the wayside. Now, it's not essential that we spend all 350, but it is a mark. And I don't want to go backwards. Like, I do really want to sponsor the events. And I have more to say sort of about how we do that process. But um, so, so I'm supportive of where we're going. I would have liked to have it in the budget, too, but I understand why we're here. Um, I think as a best practice, and this would be for everyone in the organization, that you should, when you're adding a position, bring an org chart and show us where that position is going to live. Um, because you've just stood up your unit. We don't know all the parts. We don't know as parks come over, arts and culture, uh, revitalization, it sounds like, historic resources, it sounds like. And so then this, we're wondering, where does this fit? Does it report to you or someone under you? Um, that's in, of interest to us. You know, reporting relationships are important. One of the biggest things we do is we allocate how money is to be spent and what positions are to be hired. 85% of the budget is positions. So that's kind of critical to us, you know, understanding the moving pieces. Now, I dug a little further. It sounds like this is a new position that the original one some years ago that dealt with special events has been sunsetted, so to speak, or dissolved. So you do have to sort of start fresh. So um, I would like to see going forward, though, that org chart. Um, that would I think it would be of use to you to understand what's in your world, what's not in other people's world. 
and um, um, you know how how you want to move forward with this entire operation of outward facing you know groups that have been assigned to you. Um, and I'll come back with some thoughts about how to do this allocation. Okay, thank you. All right, Madam. anyone before Councilman Breckis? Okay, yes, go ahead. Uh, Vice Mayor. Mr. Edelstein. Um, first of all, what happened to your ring that I saw earlier? Uh -huh. That's pretty exciting. Um, we have obviously a national championship caliber, you know, aces who are part of this community and their opening day, I think is Friday. Um, week from, yeah, week, week from, from Friday. Friday. So that's exciting, but that's really sort of a tie-in, right? Yeah, I want to see the bling because it's pretty impressive. <laughs> I saw it earlier, so I thought it embarrassed you a little bit. Um, I think for my part, I like to start at the beginning. And so the stories usually have a beginning, middle, and end for me. And my starting point for this particular thing is a discussion about the city manager's office. And so some years ago when we hired Mr. Thornley, um, we, I think, said maybe in not so many words, but we said, hey, take six months, figure out where you are, what floor you're on, who the moving parts are, and then be a bull in a china shop. Go fix and repair and change the organization and craft it in a way that you think will lead us into the future. And I think we're starting to see a lot of that, right? And so whether that's Ms. Turney's efforts, uh, your efforts, Mr. McArdle's, uh, the remaking of a number of different positions, adding uh, assistant managers, this is a part of all that. I think it is about how do we become the city we want to be? How do we grow as a city? Who are we going to be when we get to where we want to go? And we have made a commitment, I think, at various points in time to say that um, economic development, arts, parks, and events are all related, and they're this driving force. That is a different um, frame of mind that really has been driven uh, both by this council, but to give some rein to our city manager's office to undertake this organizational changes. And I will say kudos for that. I believe that uh, if we are to act like a big city, we have to be at times more nimble than the typical government speak. Uh, we have to accept the fact that there are some times when we're going to do things that are a little bit out of order of what might be the best practices. All of us do wish to engage in best practices, I think, from the organizational level, from the top down. You spend a lot of time learning what they are. You all get school and educational backgrounds and training that lead you to that place. But again... Uh, a city that's not willing to change or pivot or move quickly, I think, is the city that's dying. Um, and we don't want to be that city. We want to be the city that is um, being looked at by other cities as being a, a beacon of how we can do things better, differently. Uh, and so for my part, I just want to sort of start as that beginning. In my second round, I may have other questions that are more specific about this activation coordinator, but I do think it starts at the top. And if we allow that to be a part of what we do in terms of our direction as the council, I think it'll be a, a very um, beneficial process for the entirety of our community who does on a routine basis ask, like, where are the special events? Are they coming back? What is the support for things like the air races or the hot August nights or the, you know, roller skating on the plaza? Special events are top of mind for the constituents that I'm communicating with because it's the thing that they have grown to love about being here. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for all the work that's gone into this point. I'll be back with you on a second time. All right. Councilman Butkus. <clears throat> I want to elaborate upon Ms. Um, Taylor's questions about the eligible use for the room tax because I think that it was our fundamental knowledges, knowledge that we should all, you know, I need to remember every now and then and we should all have, but actually the room tax can be used for public safety, okay? So let's remember that additional public safety personal equipment not to exceed one third of the revenue generated. And we've had discussions here before about using it for homelessness and housing. Now this is one half of the percent and one other half of the percent. But you know, it is good to with with these special funds, and this is one we have big discretion over, set it into budget. I think her line of question, you know, you not being sure substantiates that. Now about the allocation um you know, getting rid of the subcommittee. And this was never a uh, area of operations that was of high priority to me until a lot of things started call, falling through the cracks. And I heard routinely from churches of Sunday special events, you know, which were not accommodating churches, 
and church service with road closures, also Ward 1 neighborhoods who were not getting um, the right closures. So it, it had a lot of impacts in neighborhoods when it's downtown and, uh, you know, in, in the river area. And I think that there was also a good policy discussion on the council to let every neighborhood spe special events. But my concern is that you'll go off autopilot and have some meetings with maybe a few of us or other people, and the thing will come back, and it's going to be, you know, a committee of seven appointed by the manager or the council even, all who have some fingers in special events. And that's going to be a risk. And I'll tell you one thing. I was here in 2004, 2000, no, yeah, maybe 2004, 2005, when Kate Thomas, who's now a county manager over there, wrote the initial special events allocation process. And it has always been controversial and has carried far more, um, uh, you know, focus and controversy for relevant to the small amount of dollars that it represents. Because there's people who who really do want it to be money that goes to their organization. So it brings a lot of headaches. And so I would tread very carefully on this um, and think about it very carefully, just to let you, let you know. Those are my thoughts. And I also think that the special events trend, and we heard this from, I think, the Roe people recently or someone else, is to privatize special events. Sparks has a new amphitheater in downtown, private owned. And Jacobs with the Glow Plaza, which, you know, I have not supported any of, of their work, a lot of demolition to displacement, but they have a private special event facility. And that may be the trend where it's going. So um, I, I don't know. I would keep the discussions that this body. I would come back for a 15 minute, 10 minute presentation on how we work now, what you think are the identified, uh, you know, flaws to that, and then ask for the body's direction a little bit more. Okay. Um, I don't want this part of my turn. I would like him to suggest how would you see changing the process? Uh, thank you, uh, well, Council Member. my turn. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's not your turn? No. <laughs> it's his turn. <laughs> to just tell us what are you thinking. Well, so. um, and I just want to yeah. weigh in. Listen, I think special events are so critical, and it does create a sense of community. We are known for special events. I mean, that's one right. of the reasons that attract a lot of tourism to Reno. And I also think it's important as a city that we support those events that have been good to us, that have brought people right in downtown Reno, supported our businesses. Uh, that is very, very critical. I actually have always thought that um, it was incredibly broken here at the city and treated like a stepchild, to be honest with you. I, it was, it's always been um, one of my heartburns. And, and especially the people that put them on, they have to put their blood, sweat, and tears into those events and a lot of times spend their own money. Madam Clerk, will you time me, <laughs> please? <laughs> um, and so I am all for, like, revitalizing this. You absolutely have to have an activation coordinator. Who is, like, doing it now? because we had someone in charge of special events. So who's doing it now? Because I'm hearing out in the community that we don't care about special events. And to your point, I mean, you may, you know, it's for community and culture and so many other reasons in our businesses, economic development. But a lot of people put together their own special events. Like there was the GLOW, what was the event that we, we did at Christmas that Pineapple Pedicabs put on. Yeah. And I mean, I think that she probably spent months and months not sleeping a wink because she put every dollar, dime, and heart and soul into that event. And we've got to be supportive. These are people working right here in our community. So you tell us what you want to see. I think we should have flexibility. We absolutely have to have this position or else we're, we're going to continue to um, sort of pass the buck, I think, internally. And I don't think that looks good, and I don't think it's going to be helpful. And I think eventually that gets out in the community, and people are going to continue to talk. They're talking now, saying that we don't care about special events. I care about them. I want to support them. It's the right thing to do for your community. So tell us how we get there. What, what can we help you with? Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, a few, point, few different points of reference here. Uh, right now, special events uh, is essentially a permitting function 
within the city. So Casey Matheson and Business Licensing is handling the permitting of special events. That's the regulatory, fill out the paperwork, does it or doesn't it. Um, when the city puts on special events, those special events are being handled in different places. So um, historically, from my understanding, Ashley's explained that, you know, Jenica led the Veterans Day Parade and really brought that to life. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's an individual with many, many things on her plate that then put on special events. Um, we're talking about e-waste events uh, and, and how important those are. And the, at last note, Monica Cochran with Housing and Neighborhood Development has that in her area. And she has other big things she needs to, to be doing. As well as this activation coordinator, this is a, this is a force multiplier of, um, of resources. So it is it, spending my entire career in events. Um, they do take a long time. They're very nuanced. They're also uh, very specific in how you coordinate them. An activation coordinator is going to be able to help people like the pineapple pedicabs be able to be more efficient and effective in launching their events quicker to market, more, more effective, better wins, and ultimately we're going to grow those events. Um, as it relates to a recommendation for the committee. Um, my, my own recommendation, which um, I'm very open to direction thoughts, looking at our boards and commissions, um, my thought was that we would potentially look at a member of the Parks and Recreation um, Commission, a member from Arts and Culture, uh, a member from Financial Advisory Board, and then one city council member, and potentially use that as a group of four um, that would then bring their recommendations to the council. Okay. All right. Council okay. Mondor, go Yeah, ahead. sure. Um, so I, I love your thinking on this. I really do. And I totally agree with you. I like your term force multiplier because you, um, unless you assign this job to somebody, it's not getting done. It is floating all over the city and it's one of these. And um, it does squarely fit, I think, in your world, right? Mm -hmm. So... In thinking about special events, when I looked at that past policy you included in the in the backup, um, you had legacy events, and I'm assuming those are hot August nights and balloon festival and things like that. Um, then you had some other ones, and so what I want to do is give a pitch to focusing on smaller nonprofits, uh, cultural events that would highlight different segments of our community. Help, maybe it's already nation. Be, beginning but it needs a push um community events you've said that we only sponsor f three events so far um the christmas tree lighting the hanukkah uh, menorah lighting and the veterans day parade so i could see other events that we would sponsor it might be a second veterans event i could think of one there's a pancake breakfast that sort of shifted support and i don't it's like it went to the honor flight people but Anyway, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to have a different kind of event, not a parade, but more of a visit, right? Visit with vets. Um, there's other things that have come up, such as Earth Day. Earth Day was being handled by a nonprofit that for the last five years, that nonprofit went out of business, so to speak. Um, there was a big gap on who's going to take this over. I think it's very identified with the city. It's key to our um, one of our strategic objectives, is sustainability. And... Um, I would hate to think that for lack of a nonprofit, we're not having Earth Day. You know, we are. A, a, mm -hmm. a promoter came to the fore that does the Great American Crafts, as I understand, is working with the community. But again, they're having to rebuild that from ground zero. I'd love to see the city take that on. Another example are things like farmer's markets. I've had requests. Uh, for example, there's one nonprofit that does a farmer's market, the Riverside Farmer's Market. Um, they could really benefit from our support. It, it speaks right to our local foods, uh, sustainability, the honey thing that we just did with the bees, you know, the trees, um, et cetera. So maybe we should be considering sponsoring a few more events that are sort of unique and in different seasons for the city. Um, so I'd love to see whatever this committee looks like, them come forward and give some priorities that way. Then maybe after a legacy event is, is launched or established over a certain period of time, they're sort of flying on their own. And then we're focusing on newer events, niche events um, that haven't come to the fore yet and giving some more support to them. And then in, finally, in terms of the support, my understanding is it's primarily road closures, potentially police presence, 
Could you just speak to that? What is our support? Yes, th thank you. I, I appreciate it as, as I was taking these notes that I didn't relay that earlier, is that city sponsorship of special events is a reduction in bill for city services. So we are not actually writing checks. Um, we, are, we are putting uh, these special events through police, fire, maintenance and ops for road closures, trash cleanup, and we're, we're putting a bill together for what that special event is going to be. The sponsorship is a reduction of that bill. So by order of magnitude, a smaller event couldn't be sponsored more than the magnitude of services that, yeah. um, that they're utilizing. So bottom line, would you take the money, whatever you have left, the 200000 and you would go pay that police street closure or the public works doing the street closure? I mean, there is a transfer of money here. Could, or does the money go to something else? I just want to make sure I'm clear. We, we would pay the bill generated by special events for the services of the we city. We would offset a portion of it. Yes, that. offset is the right word. Thank you. Okay. All right, go ahead, uh, Vice Mayor. Madam Mayor, thank you so much, Mr. Edelstein. The, I think I want to echo some of the very similar comments to Councilmember Dewar, and that is sort of my own personal thoughts about some of our legacy events relative to some of the, what I would call the um, new or up and coming events. Uh, I like council member Dewar think that things like our farmer's market that occurs at the McKinley Arts Center um, and has a Mother's Day component, I think uh, that I have sponsored in the past and uh, the Earth Day celebrations that have come and gone as people have uh, moved or, or changed their ability to, to host those. Uh, those are important, I think. Reno Food Systems is doing just incredible work in our community and connecting people with food resources. They have a farm stand over at the corner of uh, McCarran and Mayberry, and, and they are someone who I could see us saying, hey, we want to make sure that people have access to fresh food resources because they, through their farm stand, and, and they take even EBT, they are just doing incredible educational outreach. And so to the extent that we can, I mean, I would like to see some of our sustainability initiatives make their way into our special events planning. So that could be, as Councilmember Dewar has helped and made, made possible some e-waste uh, related projects, but making them bigger and, and right. sort of an event surrounding them. Composting is another example. So I see a lot of opportunity for us to not just have special events um, like the Fiesta on Wells, which I think this council supported uh, some time ago, um, but some of those uh, smaller events that are, are really focused on sustainability, food scarcity, um, and feeding people, you know, the gleaning process, I think. So council member doers hit the nail on the head in, in terms of those things. Uh, in terms of any direction I would give staff, um, I, don't, I, I don't have very strong feelings about whether a committee should be made of four persons and they should meet once a week. What I am hoping for is that um, sort of uh, getting out of the way of your success, and I don't mean it to sound uh, negative towards us, but I, I don't know events programming activation as well as your team does, right? And I think um, one of the things that Councilmember Dewar also mentioned was related to the way in which we sort of, the charge is related to closing of streets and public safety things. So in some way, we're just paying ourselves back for the services that we render. Um, and sometimes that's, the events need that obviously, but they may need a little bit more, right? They may need help in the advertising way. And our comms team has been very good about pushing out really cool events and uh, whether it's, you know, baby goat yoga or something like that. But the point being is that all of our departments should be supportive and we got to figure out a way for those things to happen together. I have, of course, for years been talking about, you know, a downtown Christmas market uh, like they have in other communities that are very impressive. Uh, when the mayor and I were in D.C., I think in December, we saw one that was very impressive uh, and had a lot of activation, street level activation. Um, so there's no shortage of good ideas just go forth and be successful with your team, and, and we'll be here to support you. Madam Mayor, may I say Thank one you. more thing? Councilman Taylor, and then oh, I'll go sorry. to uh, okay. Councilman I'm, Martinez. Yeah, and the reason I ask me. is because it doesn't reset after you speak, so yeah. that's why oh, okay. you know, I can do this, okay. too. All right, I'll get to you. So go ahead, Councilman Taylor, and then we'll go. Thank Councilman you, Madam Mayor. Martinez I'll be, I'll be really Brackett. quick. Um, if, if we're getting into some of the details here, I just want to, um, in my opinion, anything that you can bring to Westbrook 
is going to make me jump up and down <laughs> for joy. Um, anything we can do to activate that space is Which space? West Brick Plaza um, is is huge for downtown. Um, we've done a in the last couple of weeks, we've done a really good job of keeping it clean and um, safe. Thank you, uh, Chief Nance. The other thing is um, the ambassadors or the DRP was here earlier this morning and you introduced them. They talked about some of the special events that they're going to be doing. So I think it might be important for us to work with them and collaborate in this space. Um, I think we can work off of each other. Um, general thought for downtown when we do have special events down there. I think it's important that we make sure that um, the city is is being paid back for all of the things that they do are getting um, paid for the costs that we incur, like you just said, specifically with trash cans and cleanup, because a lot of the special events that I've seen, um, not the not like the Italian Fest, but maybe some of the smaller ones, mm -hmm. um, the next day it's like, you know, what happened down here sometimes. So um, just a couple of things for consideration, but I'm super excited that um, for you and your team to, to be working towards this. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Martinez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Eric, for the presentation and for um, giving us all that great information and for meeting with us as well earlier in the week and giving us some of the updates. I know part of your ask um, for this agenda item was potential direction, so that's where I'll focus my comments on. Um, and I just want to echo some of the things that were already said by my colleagues um, and making sure that we um, give some priority to some cultural um, events or events that are happening um, in our neighborhoods. Anything that we've done to activate spaces um, where the city has already made um, investments. Um, so just in particular and recently, some of the things that we've done at Paradise Park. So if there are any ways that this... Um, Activation coordinator can look at um, doing more things out there. I think that would help um, us keep the investments that we've been doing in our community moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to mention that for the record. Thank you. Councilman Breckis. Yeah, and I just want to say, you know, as we move forward, the manager has prevented me from having briefings from staff. So the items are coming up where I don't have the background and the conversations that you all may have. He's and if anyone wants any documentation of why he's done that and why I believe he's done that I can provide that to him But there may be conversations that you had with others and so I'm behind but also as one of the senior members I have a little you know advantage with history one reason I want to tell the body that I would have the conversations here is there is a huge tug pull from public safety on this okay right. following 10 one following the rib you know cook off is you know, and, and the officers, and it's, they bargain for it legitimately. There's some special pays associated with that. So the, the repay is a little more costly. And if we're pulling out 150 to from what we did for the sponsorship, that's less for the sponsorship. But also, you know, keep the eye on what do these events mean about patrols? Because if a chief our new chief is pulling folks off of patrols to staff events. You're thin up in your neighborhoods, and you could hear about it. You know, I'm pretty close in, but out in Birdeye, up instead, down in Southeast Reno, if in any parameter, you know, and I would give them some very specific metrics to follow this, any parameter of a special event that the city's hosting means I'm thin out here, no go. You, we, you know, at, this isn't all about fun. It's about making hard decisions. And I heard that a lot from our former chief, his concerns about special events running us thin out in the neighborhoods with patrols to respond to burglaries, to respond to um, crashes. And so that's why I think this body needs to really keep an eye on it um, for what, what the take could be from patrols. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Go ahead, Count, uh, Vice Mayor. Well, just briefly, Madam Mayor, I think, number one, I'm, I'm going to trust Chief Nance's d direction on the question of safety. I've never seen a police presence at the Mother's Day farmer's market. So I, I, creating boogie people where there are none is not helpful, I don't think, to the body. And so um, I will trust that our police folks will continue to keep us safe as they do. And again, I all of the decisions that we make from a budgetary standpoint impact various levels of the organization. It may impact comms, it may impact public works, it may impact public safety. 
All of those things have to be taken into account when you all begin to roll out what it is that we're going to do in this space. If you start the next big, you know, electric daisy carnival downtown, we got a problem. We got to talk about the public safety impacts. We got to talk about street closures. But I don't think that's what's being suggested by anyone uh, here today, other than in an effort to sort of tear down the work that you're doing. I want us to have robust public events in all of the wards, many of which will be related to cultural events to create a sense of place and community and to drive engagement and activity within those wards. I think about Paradise Park where there is great and large open space that could be made available for various of different cultural events that might impact very much our Spanish speaking population here. I think about the, as I said, the Reno food systems who have an incredible farm stand that could really benefit from our helping them to be able to support their events. Um, I think um, Earth Day has moved around a couple of times yeah, over the years. Yeah, it's been out at Verdi, uh, um, near, Mary near Pac, Pac, um, Patagonia. Yeah. It's been in Idlewild. Um, I just heard they're having a separate one in Midtown. I just got an invite to that. Yeah, and, and again... And also at the summit, they're planning a separate Earth Day. <laughs> so. Earth Day everywhere. Um, but, but again, I think um, so that the team hears us, we have for probably the last four or five years kind of with duct tape and bubble gum kind of pushed the events world along. And it has been upsetting to the people who are running the events. They haven't been as successful as I think they might have otherwise been because we have been struggling to get through a pandemic, some turnover in staffing changes, some difference in opinion about the direction of the events, our budgetary process. At the end, let us get past a lot of those things which have been barriers to successful events and, and not use government speak to block the opportunity for our, our community to engage meaningfully in the things that they want to do, which is be outside, be enjoying food and drink with their loved ones, go to and buy beeswax candles and, you know, farm stand honey. I mean, all of those things are possible. Um, and some of the larger events, right? I, I, I the uh, El Dorado Italian Festival this year was enormously successful. Um, it was incredibly impressive to see. And it was clearly something that the community was calling for. Uh, it, whether it's a legacy event or new events or just establishing events, let us go forth and do them as a means of connecting this community with the things we want to do. All right. The other thing I would say, activation is so important. When we're talking about safety and quality of life and giving our community other opportunities to do things, when we don't activate spaces is actually whenever we see the biggest challenges when it comes to... Uh, you know, public safety issues, quite honestly. Um, I know that Councilman Taylor, you could really attest to that. We've had a lot of conversations as you look out your window, and that's because it's not activated. There's quite frankly a lot that's not activated. And I know we've talked about a lot as a city. We've never made it a priority, and it's something that's always frustrated me. So you can look at it over here like that, or you can really look mm -hmm. at it over here like let's finally get off our you know what to do something about it and that's one of the biggest reasons I was so excited that you were coming on you know special events you know activation you know what public engagement looks like but you also know the community and um, how to rally a community like no other that I've seen you do so you just let us know um, what exactly you need for us to make you successful thank you very much if I could say having worked in downtown and activated space in downtown the difference between an active space and a non-active space is night and day. And um, our revitalization manager, Brian McArdle, said to me 10 years ago, and I've repeated it many times, the best way to fix a blighted space is to use it. Mm -hmm. And so, so we true. need to use our spaces. Yeah, it's so true. And we should because they're great spaces. But we have not made the investment. It just has never, ever been a priority. So I commend you and I commend the entire team um, for finally bringing this forward. Long overdue. So, anyway, Thank great job. You. Okay, I'm going to send it to you, Vice Mayor. You know, I'd like uh, Madam, uh, my colleague from uh, my left. Madam Ward 2. Me? Ward okay. 2, Ms. Madam Ward 2. Madam Ward 2, you got it. Um, so, thank you. Um, we're on item D5. Um, and I would like, there's uh, some recommendations if you want to put that back up. 
but I believe I would like to make a motion to approve um, allocating $150,000 out of the room tax fund to uh, support an activation coordinator position. Um, and then number two, to direct staff to modify the special event sponsorship allocation process and come back to us with a proposal that we can uh, discuss and possibly approve. All right, so I have a motion from Councilwoman Dewar. I have a second. I have a second from Councilwoman Taylor. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed, opposed. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations, by the way. Great job. Thank All day you. long you've been doing a great job. It's like you you like have been doing this for 10 years here. Good coaching. <laughs> great job. Okay, Madam Clerk, I'm going to send it right back to you. Thanks, Madam Mayor. We're moving on to item F1 in ordinance adoption to be read by the city attorney. Okay, Carl, take it away. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ordinance adoption, ordinance number 6648, ordinance of the city council of the city of Reno, Nevada, repealing ordinance number 6 6596 and dissolving city of Reno, Nevada, 2021 special assessment district number two, Stonegate one, created for the purpose of acquiring and improving a sanitary sewer project and a water project and matters which pertain to or are necessarily connected there to Ward four. All right, thank you so much. Madam Clerk, at this time, do you have any public comment on this item? Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have no public comment registered. Additionally, we have not received any correspondence. Okay, thank you so much. Move to adopt. I have a motion from second. Vice Mayor to adopt. A second from Madam Dewar. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. <laughs> motion carries. Okay, item F2. I'm going to send it right back to you, our Thank city attorney, Carl Hall. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ordinance adoption, ordinance number 6649. Ordinance of the City Council, the City of Reno, Nevada, repealing ordinance number 6598 and revoking authority to levy assessments in connection with the City of Reno, Nevada 2021 Special Assessment District Number 2, Stonegate 1, and matters which pertain to or are necessarily connected there to Ward 4. Okay, thank you so much. Madam Clerk, do you have any public comment on this item? We have none registered and have not received any correspondence. All right, thank you so much. At this time, may I uh, get a motion? Move to adopt. I have a motion second. to adopt. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Motion carries. Item F3, ordinance adoption, ordinance number 6650, ordinance of the city council, the city of Reno, Nevada, repealing ordinance number 6600 and revoking authority to issue city of Reno, Nevada, 2021 special assessment district number two, Stonegate number one, local improvement bomb series 2021 in the aggregate principal amount of not to exceed 36,860,000 and matters which pertain to or are necessarily connected there to word four. All right, Madam Clerk, do you have any public comment on this item? We have none registered and have not received any correspondence. All right, thank you. May I receive a motion? Move to adopt. Second. I have a motion to adopt. I have a second by Madam Dewar. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> motion carries. We should have a little levity at our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, city Clerk, Mayor, and Council, do Council uh, members have any comments, including announcements? regarding city boards and commissions, activities of local charitable organizations, and upcoming local community events. Anything that council would like to update us on? Go ahead, council Two things. Um, Madam Dewar. <laughs> <laughs> Two things, um, and I mentioned already that Miguel uh, Martinez and I were able to um, cut the ribbon on the newest Portland Lou. Um, it seems that public opinion has really changed for the most part. Uh, about the utility of these. Um, looking forward to uh, another one in City Plaza. Understand that there might be delays, and so I recommended to One Truckee River they might want to go to the fourth one because it sounds like City Plaza may be under construction for a year or something, so we don't want to wait. Um, so there's that. Um, and so the second thing I wanted to mention was something special for my ward, which was we adopted a first-ever uh, dual speed um, limit in one road in Reno on Veterans Parkway, south of South uh, Meadows Parkway. The idea is um, to, to lower the speed during the night to reduce the amount of vehicle horse collisions. Um, it is a trial, um, but it is well supported by our police and our public works team. And so we'll see how that all works if it does. Um, just we calculated how many horse hits have been on Veterans Parkway. 
I believe there have been 14. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a real point of impact. So we want to do something. Um, usually these are adopted in rural areas where animals are going to come across a road. It's rare that it's adopted in a city, but we have a city with animals coming across the road. So we're going to give it a shot. Anyway, it was also well received. Um, and so we're excited. Co just a couple things. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah, and thank you for leading yeah. the charge on that. You bet. You know how important it is out there. One more possible good step. Yeah. Great. All right. Anyone else? No? All right. I should just mention that I did go down and I testified at the legislature against uh, creating a six board. I actually believe that we should have more representation than less. I think that that is actually a good thing to give your community more options. Um, and I really um, sort of stress that I feel that, you know, we should all be rooting for Reno. There's always this not my ward, not my problem uh, mentality. And some of you have, are much better than others, but I think we all live here together and want, we should all want the best for our city. I also think the fact that you can vote in, your, uh, in, in everyone else's ward but you can't get elected by everyone else's word makes no sense to me um, because the consequences could be damaging how you vote in someone else's word. And it doesn't matter because you're elected in your own word. And I think that is incredibly damaging. So I, I also um, wanted everyone to know that I did speak uh, against that because I, I really believe in the at-large position. Whenever I first got here, I was the at-large position. I could not work, a lot of people couldn't work with the council member in a certain ward, and I was that person because we um, had probably different political views that more people in that ward had the similar views, so I thought that was also important. But I also don't think that Reno is big enough to where we should be divided. We should all care about our downtown. We should all care about the horses in South Meadows and, um, and the flooding in Megan's ward. Um, all those things that are super, super important, but it's hard. You're out there on your own, and I hate to use this, but island, in a sense, whenever you're wanting everyone to hear you, but also they can vote, and it might have significant impact in your ward, or Councilwoman Dewar wants affordable housing in her ward, but everyone else on the body uh, does not support that. So I'm not, a, I'm not a fan, but I did want everyone to know that um, I did testify in opposing another six ward because I think it only divides us even further. I think we should have more representation and that's why I felt very, very compelled to do it. So I would just ask um, that you continue to be supportive of other council members and their wards and uh, certainly downtown and, and all the other wards that we yeah. represent. So thank you. I did. Okay, did that you... moving on. Oh, you go ahead. Yeah. And Councilwoman Ebert. I just want to kind of piggyback off of that um, in regards to um, item C2 today with regard to the um, zoning request that came through for that school that didn't go through and staff was able to um, work with the applicant to come up with a better solution. Um, I just want to say you're absolutely right, Mayor Sheevy, that we all need to work together with these wards and um, it was really great to see this board come together and ask all those important questions about how that zoning change would affect the surrounding neighborhood. Um, I know it was a very small change to add, what was it, six students? And I heard questions brought up about traffic, impact to neighborhoods. Um, I have a lot of questions that I wrote down that I didn't get to ask. Um, you know, the, the church was actually built before the homes. Um, I would just like to ask that going forward when we have development happening in my ward that the same consideration would be given to my residents when a zoning change is being brought forward to change an area into industrial where they are allowed to operate 24-7 next to a residential area, that those same considerations are made for my residents. That traffic is also considered when we look at routes going in and out of the north valleys and consider how many thousands of people go in and out of those areas that we all consider that as a board as well um, like i said i was very proud of how everyone kind of came together and considered the impact to those neighbors in that area and the public comment that came out and i would just ask that that body use those same questions when those zoning changes come forward for ward four 
and then I get that same support for the residents in Ward 4. So that yeah. was my, my comment. Councilwoman um, Eber, I really appreciate that. I think you just made my my case for me. And the only question I would ask you, and you don't, and I'm you don't have to respond, but I would imagine if every single one of us on this body ran at large, would we have different outcomes? And I'm gonna say yes. That's I'm I'm gonna leave you with. So anyway, okay, moving on. Uh, Madam Mayor, one more thing. Um, since you since you mentioned uh, legislation, I wanted to let the body know that um, in furtherance of a resolution that we adopted, which was the No Wildlife Killing Contest, and we sent a resolution um, to the Wildlife Commission, uh, they were not able to come to closure, and so the legislature proposed a bill, SB 102, uh, to achieve that and make us the ninth state in America to do it. Um, we're surrounded by states that have done it, such as Arizona and California, um, also Washington State, um, and it's under consideration in Oregon and Nevada right now. So I went down and basically read the key principles out of our resolution into the record. Um, so I was really pleased to, to do that, and the council had already taken a position, so it was, a, it was an easy one showing up and representing. Yeah, thank um, you for um, updating us. That was important. Yeah. So there was a fair amount of opposition from various communities, hunting related, other related. Um, we will see where it goes. Okay. All right. Anyone Madam, else? Yeah, Madam Mayor, I wanted to just update the body on the RTC. Uh, Madam Mayor and I were at the RTC's retreat on Friday, and um, I encourage anyone who wants to listen to what I thought was some very great deliberate process and a really great uh, lead. It was led by Erica Olson and her team did a very good job. Uh, she especially of kind of highlighting the importance. One of the things that I think was uh, key to that and the takeaway from uh, my thoughts about the RTC is our shared vision of the mayor and mine for um, improvements in the North Valleys. So there was a, a concerted effort by both the mayor and I and our staff to say whatever we have to do to make it so that people are not so congested in the North Valleys, um, we've got to do that. So RTC uh, has a lot of work ahead of it, and it was a, a good um, way to spend the day talking about it. And I think there's lots of good vision and, and sort of vision casting going on at that organization. So if anyone has RTC-related issues, I'm happy to chat with you offline about them. And I, you'll be happy to know we talked a lot about micromobility, a lot. And the river, so it was uh, it was very very good. Okay, moving along, Madam Clerk. All right, Madam Mayor, I'm going to go ahead and open the redevelopment agency board so we can approve some minutes today. We're going to move on to item L1. I'm going to take roll call. Councilmember Breckis, Doer, here. Martinez, here. Ebert, here. Taylor, here. Reese, here. Sheevy, here. Madam Mayor, you do have a quorum of the redevelopment agency board. We're moving on to item L2, to which I have none. All Public right. comment. Item L3, approval of the agenda. Move May to I get approve. a motion? I second. have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item L4, approval of the minutes from February 22nd. May I get a motion? Second. I have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. So we're going to move on to item L7, which is closing public comments. Again, I have none. So I'm just looking for a motion to adjourn. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. All right. Okay, thank so you. we're going to go into J1 of our regular agenda. So, closing public comment. We did have an individual registered, but it doesn't appear that he has returned to chambers. So, we're going to close live public comment. Um, and just for the record, I would like to state that we did receive closing public comments today that were either received after 4 p.m. yesterday um, or were general in nature. We received three letters of support, one letter of opposition. Those have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are a part of the record. And we have one final voicemail to play today. Hi, my name is Garrett, and I'm calling in regards to the airport authority's decision to uh, no longer have the air races out of that airfield. Um, I've been out there 39 years in a row, and that's the high point of my year. I just love the air races. and. You know, I know we do have crashes out there, but it's part of the sport. Like, people like to watch NASCAR. They like watching the crashes. But, um, um, you know, I've been told that 
by the airport authority that it's because of all the growth we've got in this town. You know, I understand that too, but, um, you know, if they need to maybe make the race races a little tighter or maybe keep them over, you know, empty land, that, that's fine too. But this event brings in about $100 million a year to the city, or, or not the city, but, you know, the residents of Reno. And I've seen on Facebook that there's at least a thousand people that are not happy about this decision. And I just thought I'd reach out and see if there's something we can do to maybe change the airport authority's decision on this. And honestly, I don't even know if anybody from the airport authority's even been to the areas, but I know, I know it's an awesome event and there's a lot of people that just love it out there. So anyway, that's just my two cents. You need to call me back. My phone number is 775 378 Five seven seven eight. That's seven seven five three seven eight five seven seven eight. Thank you. All right. All right. There's no additional public comment, so I am looking for a motion to adjourn. All right. Give me a motion to adjourn, Madam. Do it. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you.